So it's 10 o'clock, the important minute when we start our international mm -hmm. conference today, this morning. Dear colleagues, professors and researchers, good morning. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us today. It is my great pleasure on behalf of Faculty of Economic Sciences, Spiru Haret University of Bucharest, to welcome you to the International Conference CESBA 2021, Big Data Driven Smart Urban Economy. And we are very fortunate to have the support of the great professor from many countries for this international conference, whom I hope you will get to meet online during the conference today and tomorrow. I would like to thank to my dear colleagues, two great people, Professor George Lazaroyu and the Professor Elena Gugu for their effort to organize this international conference and their dedication. May you have a very successful conference today and tomorrow we shall see more presentation for the four panels that uh, are already posted on international website. I congratulate all of you and wish you good luck today. I'm very happy to see so many people involved in this conference and interesting about uh, this topic. All the best to all of you. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> uh, th thank you, Professor Luminitsa Ionescu. Uh, we will go on with our conference by uh, presenting um, our partners and the keynote speakers in a few words. Uh, of course, we'll uh, repeat the, the presentation uh, before each uh, each paper um, is displayed. Uh, well, uh, I uh, have discussed with Elena that we will share um, the, 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 the words, uh, the descriptions of partners uh, and keynote speakers. So I'll start with, with some of them and then Elena, please uh, go with others. George, uh, um, do we have some words of opening ceremonies from our parts also? Because I wanted to say a few words. I, I think you also. Okay. Begin. <laughs> you begin first. Okay. You so um, I'll um, present some uh, of our uh, uh, partners and the keynote speakers, as I said. Um, uh, first of all, uh, there is the American Association for Economic Research uh, from New York City, USA, uh, that uh, carries out research on uh, cognitive technology-driven automation. Its uh, president is Michael A. Peters, Emeritus Professor, University of Illinois. Uh, Top-ranking universities where the authors are located, the Harvard University, University of Oxford, Yale University, Princeton University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, University of Cambridge, Stanford University, Boston University, etc. Uh, another partner is uh, the University of Žilina uh, from uh, Slovakia. It has a very high research output according to the QS World University Rankings. Over the last uh, um, 57 years, more than uh, Five, uh, 52,000 students have graduated from the university and the more than uh, 1,500 of them have been awarded the PhD degree. Another partner is the Silesian University in Opava, the Czech Republic. Uh, it has a high research output according to the QS World University Rankings and has three faculties, philosophy and science, public policies and mathematics. All of the faculties of our courses at undergraduate, postgraduate, and doctoral levels. Among the, um, the keynote speakers uh, today, I would like to mention Tomasz Klistik, full professor and the head of the Department of Economics, Faculty of Operation and Economics of Transport and Communications, University of Gilina. He has more than uh, uh, 1,500 citations in Web of Science and Scopus. He is the coordinator of an international conference with a good history in the web of science. Another keynote speaker is Adam Balczurzak, who teaches at the University of Warmia and Mazuri in Olzi in Poland. He has more than 
500 citations in uh, Web of Science and Scopus. He is the, he is the editor in chief of the journal of Economia Copernicana, indexed in the Web of Science, with an impact factor of uh, 4.274 and an article influence score of uh, 0 0.305. Um, it is in the first uh, uh, quartile in category economics in the web of science. Another um, like, you know, speaker will be Roman Sperka, teaches at the Silesian University in Opava, the Czech Republic. He has more than um, 150 citations in the web of science, in the web of science and Scopus. He is the coordinator of an international conference with a good history in the web of science. Also, uh, Maria Kovakova teaches at the Faculty of Operation and Economics of uh, Transport and Communications, University of Julina. She has more than uh, 700 citations in the Web of Science and Scopus. She is the Associate Coordinator of an international conference with a good history in the Web of Science. Um, also, Katarina uh, Valaskova, who teaches at the Faculty of Operation and Economics of Transport and Communications, University of Julina. She has more than uh, 1,000 citations in the Web of Science and Scopus. She is the Associate Coordinator of an international conference with a good history in the Web of Science. Uh, well, um, Elena, before you go on with uh, um, your uh, partners and keynote speakers, um, I think I... Uh, uh, so the vice rector Costin Liano, and he might like to, to say some words. Professor Liano, can you hear us? Morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Um, let me uh, greet you for uh, this participation and the conference and the sixth uh, edition of the conference. Uh, we are very glad to have you uh, with us in this um, event, a uh, very important event with the very uh, uh, important topics, uh, very, very hot topics related to what will, go in, what will be happening in the future uh, with uh, the, in the economic science, but also in uh, other fields of activity. So uh, let me also convey the warm uh, greetings uh, from uh, our rector, Mr. Aurelian Bondra. Um, as a vice rector of uh, the university uh, interest in uh, international relations we are also uh, greeting you and uh, we hope that uh, through this event we can um, work together in a closer uh, position in order to uh, develop uh, good projects uh, of cooperation so therefore um, Besides my greetings and uh, uh, also a congratulations for the event and for your participation, I would like to uh, share something uh, I, uh, uh, which, on my opinion, uh, should be um, uh, um, something which uh, we have to look into in the future uh, as, a, as a, let's say, a challenge for uh, for. Uh, uh, big data and um, uh, smart cities and um, therefore I will share my presentation if I if you don't mind this is the right time or uh, should I uh... yes uh, please do that Yes, we can see it. But we cannot hear you, Professor Liano. Please uh, activate your mic. Uh, turn your mic on. Okay, sorry for uh, inconvenience. Now I'm. Uh, uh, you can see my. Uh, you can see my screen. Yes. So uh, the basic idea of uh, our contribution, uh, uh, we have um, 
common approach uh, related to uh, this um, uh, big data driven smart ur urban economy so uh, our um, our paper is uh, related to the role of the digital innovation hubs but it's based on, on smart e-hub and valakia e-hub study case so we are a group of uh, professors and uh, students phd students working uh, um, actively in the last two years uh, in uh, relation with this uh, with this uh, smart e-hubs uh, and the valakia e-hub which are uh, digital innovation hubs um, I don't know if you are aware of the fact that uh, in the last two years in uh, Europe, uh, digital innovation hubs developed a body of experience at regional and national levels in a wide range of development patterns. Setting up a digital innovation hub or reinforcing existing ones will benefit from available funds in the years to come, both at European and national levels. Policymakers are arguing that given the urgent need of the SMEs and the public administration to rapidly deploy advanced digital technologies in the role of the digital innovation hubs will be crucial. So our paper is looking uh, of the case of a newly born university led digital hubs in the southern part of Romania and trying to investigate them in boosting big data driven smart urban economy. So our conclusion uh, to be further researched is that even big data is not a mega technology envisaged in the architecture of the hubs. The all pillar technologies, high performing computers, cyber, artificial intelligence, and advanced skills, interoperability, and digital solutions are implicitly embedded in big data technologies. So, um, just uh, to give you for uh, uh, to to make a review of the services which a digital innovation hub has to has to deliver for the regional development digitalization of uh, of the regions, um, uh, the digital uh, re innovation hubs are conceived to deliver innovation ecosystem networks, skills and training, test before invest, and support to find investment. So these are, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, the, um, the services which uh, a hub uh, can provide. So uh, it's obvious from this uh, perspective that uh, universities are uh, very much entitled to contribute with their knowledge uh, in uh, education and, and skills. Also, there are uh, other, uh, other support services a hub have, has to deliver like support to find investments, like test before invest. But uh, what uh, is very important for, uh, for universities is to, uh, to, in, uh, to uh, be part of this uh, digital innovation hubs uh, in train the trainer programs, in boot camps, in uh, traineeship, in uh, exchange of curricula and training material. So this is a challenging time for universities because uh, we have to adapt our educational system to the new digitalization uh, digitalization skills required by the new economy so now uh, i will explain to you a little bit of what uh, we have here in the southern part of romania actually we are part of the two hubs uh, university spiru haret with other universities are part of the two hubs smarty hub for uh, the region Bucharest and the surrounding area, which by itself is a development region of uh, Romania, and South Montania, which is another region surrounding Bucharest. So our mandate is to uh, provide services for digital transformation for, this, uh, for these uh, areas. You can see here um, uh, that uh, the composition of the hub is uh, very, uh, very wide. So uh, we have uh, clusters. We have uh, our university, USH Pro Business, which is the entrepreneurial center of the university, Spiru Haret, which is in the middle of this uh, uh, process, and other uh, clusters in different areas, which, uh, which are co-founders of the Valachia e-hub. Uh, you can see also a history of the development of the hub. Uh, it has been uh, uh, going uh, from uh, back to uh, six years ago when we created this uh, USH Pro Business and then we moved to create of creation together with the businesses of clusters and then uh, not uh, by, by in the last two years we entered into this digital innovation hub 
uh, activities. Uh, then uh, you see here that Valachia e Hub, besides uh, besides uh, us, uh, it uh, it comprises a lot of uh, participants, uh, public uh, uh, public uh, authorities uh, like Mary's, uh, also other universities like uh, University uh, of uh, Gas and Petroleum from Proest. Uh, which is a con contributor to this uh, paper also, and uh, through uh, Professor Radulescu. And um, also uh, we have uh, clusters and we have a lot of SMEs and uh, other implied uh, um, uh, participants, actors. Uh, you can see here in the philosophy of these uh, digital innovation hubs, there are also technological providers and universities, but also companies interested to go digital or uh, local authorities. So uh, we have a profile uh, which uh, goes uh, back into some areas of expertise uh, in uh, digital solutions, as I said, digital engineering, drones, blockchain, cyber, smart city, interoperability, and we uh, try to target clients from the region. So uh, what, one uh, major uh, role of the hub is to network with other hubs in other uh, parts of, uh, of uh, Romania, or, but also in other parts of the world. And we are open uh, through our university to participate in collaboration with other hubs uh, in uh, your regions. Uh, as um, academics, I think, or you will be in the future embedded in this experience of uh, digital innovation hubs. So some of the activities which we are organizing is a transfer of technology and the transfer of uh, knowledge. So we bring together different stakeholders to discuss about uh, interoperability, for example, or uh, to discuss about the uh, digital solution uh, or, or in uh, the local authority level, uh, or to discuss uh, digitalization processes through uh, business process management, and RPA robots or artificial intelligence chatbots. And um, also uh, the other hub which we are part of, it's the Smarty Hub, which uh, has a uh, other exposure in the Bucharest uh, region. So the uh, hub, it's um, a kind of, um, let's say, uh, very linked to, to the Valachia e hub, but it's another composition of uh, members. Some of the members are belonging to the both hubs and some not. So um, Smarty Hub uh, is located in uh, Bucharest. Uh, we have the managerial unit, our university of this uh, hub. And uh, if you see here, there are different other sectors we are touching and also some other technologies like macro and nano electronics, photonics, robotics, IoT, artificial intelligence, location-based technologies, cybersecurity and cloud computing. So uh, Digital Innovation Hub, Smarty Hub, it also uh, implies activities based on technologies and sectors. So what we are trying to do is to combine uh, different uh, stakeholders from the technological side and different stakeholders from uh, the side of the clients, side of the companies or the authorities which want to go digital. So you see here uh, in the Smarty Hub, we have a different composition of clusters. Uh, you can find USH Pro Business as uh, also as a, a co-founder of this hub, but we have a technological cluster for uh, for ITNC and also a cluster for electronics, uh, which is part of our uh, our uh, system. So uh, the consortium, it's uh, wider uh, also in this uh, area. We have the University of Polytechnics in Bucharest. We have Magurele Science Park and other scientific parks and, parks and different other stakeholders that you can see here in the picture. So why a digital innovation hub has to be active in a region and why universities has to be involved? because it's increasing the adoption of the digital technologies, it's increasing the competitiveness of digitalization and digitalization uh, of the strategic sectors in a region, also implementing a coherent and sustainable educational system for digital technologies adoption, which is a crucial uh, importance for the universities. So uh, it, it can see here the Smart e Hub mission is to stimulate innovation through digitalization, 
So uh, the value proposition is to act as a one-stop shop for digitalization. Don't We don't pretend that we can do deep diving into different types of technologies uh, as researchers. But what we are doing, we are orchestrating uh, different stakeholders which are able uh, and they uh, to to do uh, to do this performance that they, they have the competencies to do it. So Smarty Hub, as the other Valachia Hub, it's a collaborative platform built on networks of, of the hub and with a different expertise. So what we uh, try to uh, identify is, is to map, as you can see in this picture, to map what are the competencies of the region, to put them together, to try to orchestrate them in a manner where the companies and the businesses and also the other organizations like public authorities can have access to accelerated pace to digitalization. So you can see here in, uh, in uh, our supporting a digitalization, we have companies, we have educational sector, we have local communities, we have public administration as well. So uh, for Smarty Hub, we have a, a lot of examples. I won't enter into detail. What I am trying to say is that, they, that both hubs have already a history uh, of two years time of uh, uh, activity. So here are some of the activities uh, we uh, took photo and uh, just to present uh, that uh, we are uh, a dynamic uh, hubs. You can see here one of our uh, partners, the Magurele Science Park, which is an important uh, asset of the hub because it's uh, uh, gathering to it's gathering a lot of uh, research institutions, not necessarily belonging to uh, to us. But uh, now here, I would like to say something about USH Pro Business, which is on our, our entrepreneurial center. You see that Spiru Haret is the largest private university in uh, Romania, and we have campuses uh, in uh, different parts of uh, Romania. And in each part of Romania, we have a unit uh, which is collaborating with, uh, with the businesses in order to uh, make uh, interaction between the university and the business more stronger. So uh, another part of our members is L Inclus, which is an electronic uh, uh, cluster, which is focused on microelectronic, and this is which uh, which will be an important asset for the future of uh, of the cluster and of the digital hub. And also Smart Alliance, uh, we have 35 uh, companies, uh, 39 IT Romanian companies delivering different solutions. So we take these solutions and bring them to the customers. And also we work with them in a better training for, uh, uh, for, uh, for the people which will be hired by these companies through our uh, computer and science uh, faculty of the university. So as a conclusion, uh, important conclusion, big data should be embedded in the technological digital avenues. Another conclusion of our study case indicate that the di digital innovation hubs and universities are important orchestrators of the embedment in services. So what I mean by embedment in services, if I embed big data, I have to get big data with other technologies and to find the right configuration of services combining big, da big data with cybersecurity or with uh, um, GIS solutions or blockchain solutions uh, in order to improve uh, this convergence of technologies for a specific target, uh, uh, bringing value addition to some customers in the region. So universities has to adapt to the new skills, big data and digital technologies related. So it's not only uh, what that that we want to change the, the world, we want to change the region. Also, we have to adapt ourselves, and this is a crucial uh, importance for uh, for uh, for us as uh, as academics. And also, last but not least, participants in the ICESBA as individual academics and universities may cooperate in the future under these DIH platforms at European Digital Corridors in order to adapt themselves and contribute to the digital transformation 
of their non-university environment. So uh, there are probably, you know, there will be more uh, calls which will involve the university uh, to uh, bring to the university new, new curricula areas in digitalization, to change our curricula, to introduce in our curricula, uh, if it's uh, management or if it's uh, psychology, it's law or uh, technical sciences, computer sciences or engineering, you, shev you, shev you have to adapt the curricula to the new needs. That's all from uh, as a conclusion. And if you want to continue uh, to cooperate or to think, to have other thoughts about uh, cooperation in digital innovation hubs, uh, we are uh, very uh, open to any kind of uh, follow up discussions. That's all from my side. I will uh, stop sharing. It would be great uh, if um, any of the participants would ask questions related to this paper. If Professor Costiano Liano is available for questions, yes, uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, available for questions. Uh, actually, in uh, in uh, 20 minutes, I will enter into another conference. Uh, I'm not uh, now in Bucharest, but you can see my logo here in the back. Uh, you can see also the logo of Valachia I Hub. I am in the region. And uh, we will organize a meeting uh, with the uh, building and construction uh, 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 enterprises uh, to introduce a new technology. I don't know if you know about this. It's BIM, Built Information Modeling, uh, which is, will be totally changing the let landscape of digitalization on the building and construction in the future. So what we intend is to create a group to use BIM. And big data are very closely related to BIM because without big data, you cannot work in BIM solutions. Yes, please. So have you thought of integrating uh, digital twin technologies in your projects? Yes. So we are very much um, involved in finding the so-called pilot projects. So we are intending to develop pilot projects also in digital twin which is uh, uh, the region uh, it's lagging behind, to tell frankly. In the digital twin area, all Romania has to, to, uh, to catch up. But uh, also the region, yes, we are, we are interested. So if you have, uh, uh, what we try to do is to bring competencies together from different, uh, uh, different parts. For example, in, uh, in GIS solutions, we have pr uh, professors from polytechnics. We have professors like me in management. I'm not a professor in technical sciences or in computer sciences. I'm uh, back, my background is management, but also in other areas. So we bring this kind of communities of practice together and to try to stimulate to continually work together. Thank you so much, Professor Liano. Uh, maybe there are other questions from uh, the participants. If not, uh, many thanks again, Professor Liam. Okay, and, uh, thank, you. thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you. Good luck uh, thank you so and uh, much good, uh, good works uh, to your conference uh, and uh, to our conference because I am already participating in this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you a lot. Bye bye. I will say only one word congratulations. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Because it deserves it for sure. And we are open for cooperation also. That's the meaning. Okay. All, okay. all the best. Thank you. You are welcome. <coughs> now, George, um, I think um, I would share to all uh, my uh, words for from the open ceremonies because I knew that Professor Liano is going to, to have another meeting. So uh, my words of uh, opening for you right now. Uh, honored audience, highly distinguished keynote speaker and co-partners of the HS by 2021 conference, <clears throat> esteemed leadership of Spiro Halit University and faculty of economic sciences from Bucharest, distinguished professors, researchers, doctors, doctoral and master's students. Uh, this day is an important day for all of us and each of us, um, as you know, participating in the successful organization of the conference. 
for which I want to bring my uh, hurtful thanks. I would also like to express my special thanks to uh, the management of Spiro Haret University and also to the management of faculty of uh, uh, economics from Bucharest uh, to, to our honored uh, co-partners and keynote speakers who have always been uh, close to us, helped us, guide us, as well as to those who are part of the organizational and scientific committees, website and research colleagues, and also to technical editing. Uh, we wanted that the subject of our uh, conference to be a novelty, and uh, we thanked for uh, you for being with us uh, in thought and in spirit. Um, Industry 4.0 generates cutting edge developments in sustainable operations as an Internet of Things based real time production logistics. All manufacturing resources, artifacts, operations and services who are automated. The manufacturing cyber psychical system possesses progressively automated linkages and networking. Harnessing innovative advancements in Internet of Things, real-time production logistics, cognitive automation in industrial big data analysis. Sustainable smart manufacturing has been developed on sustainable organizational performance and sustainable product life cycle management. The advancement of sustainable industrial value creation, artificial intelligence-based decision making algorithm, Internet of Things based real time production logistics and deep learning assisted smart process developing as cutting edge technologies of industrial 4.0 have further the shift towards cyber manufacturing networks where production of parts and smart sensors interconnect automatically. So big data analytics can adequately enable the implementation of the sustainable smart manufacturing program, upgrading real-time process monitoring and sustainable product life cycle management in cyber psychical system-based manufacturing. Uh, on the individual panels of the conference, we uh, talked about smart management in the knowledge-based urban economy. Uh, this is the first panel for tomorrow. The chair is our colleague, Daniela Pashniku. We have another um, um, panel who is uh, talking about algorithmic data driven accounting information system, uh, whose chair is uh, our uh, director of department, uh, Professor Luminica Ionescu. And we have another chair tomorrow uh, talking about artificial intelligence, data driven Internet of Things, whose chair is our colleague, also uh, Mihai Andronia. We hope that uh, both today, uh, when the keynote speakers will present the, their papers, as well as tomorrow, uh, in which the conference papers will be presented on each panel, uh, will be for you as a source of new knowledge and uh, new information. In fact, um, my dear friends, uh, the idea of this conference was to start, as Professor Liano already told, to start the creating new partnerships, to write the relevant interdisciplinary scientific papers together and projects also. And in this regard, please do not hesitate to contact me to get in touch with uh, co-partners or keynote speakers to, who have done uh, us uh, the great honor of being uh, with us today. Uh, that being said, now, uh, allow me to present uh, the other part of our co-partners with whom we have uh, succeeded and uh, collaborated personally and uh, whom we had the honor to be with us today and now we are talking about uh, our co-partners as uh, azerbaijan tourism a management university from baku azerbaijan a faculty of contemporary arts belgrade republic of serbia uh, Information Technology School from uh, Belgrade, Republic of Serbia, uh, Instituto Tozeo Salerno, Italy, National Institute of Economic Research from Chisinau, Republic of Moldova, uh, Vasilevsky National Military University from Veliko Tirnovo, Republic of Bulgaria, University of uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, 
Spiru Haret Central Institute for Scientific Research from Bucharest, Romania, uh, University Business Academy in Novi Sad, Republic of Serbia, USH Pro Business Center from Bucharest, Romania, and Vishva, Vishvani Institute of Business and Management, Hyderabad, India, as well as Vishva, Vishvani School of Business from Hyderabad, India. Uh, also, uh, now let me, so allow me introduce uh, the other keynote speakers who responded to my invitation to attend this conference. And uh, allow me to introduce you, uh, Melina Allegro from Italian Ministry of Education, uh, University and Research from uh, Rome, Italy. Uh, Nelia Marfi Reilan uh, from Aleku Russo Ball State University and from National Institute of Economic Research, uh, Chisinau Republic of Moldova. Uh, Stefano Amodio from the Institute Zeo Salerno, Italy. Uh, Professor uh, Dragan Ilic from uh, University Business Academy in Novi Sad, Republic of Serbia. Milena Ilic from uh, Information Technology School, ITC, Belgrade, University Business Academy in Novi Sad and Faculty of Contemporary Arts, Republic of Serbia. Uh, also, Professor uh, Victoria Yordaki from the National Institute for Economic Research, Chisinau, Republic of Moldova. Professor Bakti Bekisakov from uh, Kyrgyz Turkish Manash University, uh, Bishkek, Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, Valentin Kuleto from the Educational Alliance Link Group, Belgrade, Republic of Serbia, Information Technology School, ITC, Belgrade, and from University Business Academy in Novi Sad and Faculty of Contemporary Arts, Belgrade. As uh, you now, Professor Costin Liano from USH Pro Business, uh, Professors uh, Daniel Mayer and Natania Mayer from University of Johannesburg, uh, Gauteng, South Africa, Edwin uh, Mirfazli from the University of Lampung, Indonesia, uh, Professor Francesco Pastori from uh, University of Campania, Luigi Van Vitelli, Capua Caserta, Italy, uh, Professor uh, Rodica Perchum from Monetary and Financial Research Development, the National Institute of Economic Research, Chisinau, Republic of Moldova. Um, Professor Elisa Petrova from Vasilevsky National Military University, Veliko Târnovo, Bulgaria. Uh, Dr. Viorica Popa, National Institute for Economic Research, Chisinau, Republic of Moldova. Dr. Sabia Sakirak, Professor and Dean of Vishvani, Vishva Vishvani School of Business. Hyderabad, India, as well as uh, Vishva Vishvan Institute of Systems and Management from Hyderabad, India. Professor Marta uh, Cristina Sucho from Bucharest Academy of Economic Sciences. Uh, Professor Wilfred Isioma Ukmere from University of Johannesburg, as well as uh, Professor Agil Valiev from Azerbaijan Tourism and Management University, Baku, Azerbaijan. Um, my dear ones, now uh, that we have made a short presentation of our co-partners and invited keynote speakers and, uh, you know, got to know them a little bit better, uh, we will try to give our word uh, to our uh, guest of honor according to the planned agenda. Uh, I wish you all uh, to have a nice day and please stay with us as long as you can. And now, uh, George, I think uh, we have to, to ask our invited keynote speakers to, to share their presentations. Uh, now um, we have um, Dr. Valentin Culeto presentation from the International Information Technology uh, School, uh, Belgrade, Serbia. I know that Dr. Culeto uh, from some reasons cannot be with here today, but we ask Milena Ilic from the same university to uh, share the presentation and to talk about the implementation of extended reality in higher education, examining students' awareness. Are you with us, Milena? Can you hear us? Are you here? Yeah. Yes, dear Elena, I'm here. I, I hope that you all can hear me and see me as well. Yes. Uh, Thank you, dear Elena. It is very hard to speak after you and after Professor Liano. You're such amazing speaker, so I will try to do my best. I'm um, sure of it, Milena. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Also. 
<laughs> thank you, thank you, dear Elena. Uh, distinguished uh, professors, I'm very glad that the Spiru Harit University has invited us to be co-partners of uh, ITESBA conference and gave us uh, such a great honor. Uh, we are very proud to be a, a part of this important international conference and we are looking forward to our future projects as, as well. Great, uh, for, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like um, shortly to present uh, my affiliations as co-partners uh, ITESBA, if it's okay with you, Elena. Yes. Um, I will speak briefly about, uh, first of all, about Faculty of Contemporary Art. Uh, sorry, sorry a little okay. bit, Elena. I, I know that our Dean raised the hand okay. and probably she wants to, to tell us something. Mariana? Okay. Let's hear. Do you want to tell us something? No. Mariana? No. Okay. Uh, yes, so, sorry, sorry, Milena. No, it's okay. Um, it's a live conference, it happens. Um, briefly, I will say a few words about Faculty of Contemporary Arts. It's an um, accredited faculty of um, performing and applied arts, offering a wide range of essential skills for a 21st century artists. It was founded in 1997 as the first private faculty of arts in this um, parts. It has uh, formed many successful and renewed, renewed artists, known not only um, in the region, but also in the world's uh, uh, art centers. And a few words about information technology school, ITS Belgrade. Uh, it's the first accredited private higher education institution in the uh, information technology sphere in Serbia. It offers uh, conditions, great conditions for uh, studying, state of art equipment, um, expert professionals, um, and, and uh, very practical implementation of um, acquired knowledge as well. Um, that is very uh, short about our two uh, affiliation. I'm uh, sure that uh, at the website of the conference um, uh, you can learn uh, more about co-partners as well as our affiliations too. Uh, today I'm here with, uh, uh, for two reasons with you. First of all, to present a paper and speech that my dear colleague, Professor Valentin Kulator has prepared as his not, uh, keynote presentation. And I will later, of course, present my other paper. Um, regarding uh, the Valentin's uh, attendance today, unfortunately, he has some uh, minor health problems, as Elena uh, has, has mentioned. Uh, just problems at the moment, of course, and unfortunately, he won't be able to attend the conference. So he asked we me. We wish to... Professor Coletta all the best and to be better soon. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, dear Elena. Uh, I will um, uh, uh, tell him that you sent his uh, your best wishes. Um, so today he asked me to read or to reproduce uh, his speech, so I will try to do that in, uh, let's say, following uh, 10 minutes or, or less. I will try to share the presentation now so that all of you can see uh, what the presentation is all about and what the research that Professor uh, Culetto uh, has um, conducted with, uh, with his team. Um, me among others yeah uh, i'm sure that uh, you can see the presentation that i'm yes, yes. sharing okay right, right. Uh, i will read the speech now in short lines greetings from belgrade serbia my name is valentin Kuleto. i'm founder of edtech company link group and professor in higher education institutions in serbia information technology school belgrade and faculty of contemporary arts belgrade uh, excuse all, me, Milena, yes. a little bit. Uh, are you reading from the sharing because we cannot uh, see the slides? Uh, uh, okay, I'm just uh, sharing the presentation and I'm oh, reading oh. the speech in uh, ah, okay. in, in great, some Word file great. I have. Uh, professor great. has prepared. I won't read the whole file, of course. <laughs> I think it would be easier if you see the presentation or the, the word file, but uh, as you like, I could share the file as well. No, 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 it's okay. The presentation is okay, Elena. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elena. Um, um, first of all, I would like to say my gratitude to my colleagues from Spiro Herit University, especially to Elena and Professor Liano. You all did a great job, as you always do, and thanks to your efforts and expertise, we are 
all here today at this conference, which has a great significance for promoting science and sharing knowledge. Uh, today, I would like to share with you some of my thoughts regarding the vital sector in which all of us are gathered, higher education, and how to enhance the teaching and learning experience while maintaining benefits for various shareholders due to a short form of this form today and the fact that all of us should contribute to the conference. Therefore, I will speak briefly only about extended reality as cutting edge technologies and significant opportunities and challenges we face every day in our journey for better education and a better world. Uh, in today's uh, higher education institution, there is a growing demand for exceptional learning experience and technology and chance teaching to meet the needs of an increasingly diverse student population. Some of these issues can be addressed by using um, uh, XR, which has gained traction in educational settings. The opportunities that challenges this arise when students and teachers use, use virtual tools are exam examples of evalu evaluation opportunities like virtual lab uh, instruments and materials and so on. Um, a shift in computational capabilities in higher education is always welcomed. However, ethical guidelines for uh, XR system uh, that do not violate individual uh, rights uh, through various methodologies should be future discussed as, as well. At college and university, students and teachers are already being influenced by virtual and augmented reality innovations. Implementation can also uh, be seen as a variety of fields such as healthcare, education, and so on and so on. HR has additional advantage in collaboration and more profound learning because it provides broad uh, education, participants, uh, participants' perspectives or how virtual technologies affect their work, study and social um, lives were gathered through an online survey published by researcher from Spiro Haret um, and showed interesting results. Uh, all Serbian, Romanian and Hungarian university students from public and private institutions were included in this study. Um, so, um, we um, analyzed this um, uh, during our research for our paper. Um, the author is uh, your um, um, Roxana uh, from your university, uh, our dear friend and college and uh, colleague. And this was very interesting research uh, for us too. Um, in addition, students' perception of HR, of um, XR in the context of online learning in three Eastern European countries were gathered for the study. Teachers and millennials alike are ex excited about the new technology. This was uh, um, concluding from uh, this, this research. And just to say a few um, other uh, words about uh, the uh, research that we have uh, that that we have uh, conducted um, about the paper uh, as well as the study. I'm sure that you can all hear me because I'm so, I'm facing some difficulties now right now. Uh, uh, you uh, you can hear me, okay? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. We can see the fourth uh, i think slide of your presentation yes uh, i'm trying to move it yes okay i think i'm to the next slide now yes no, it's okay milena yeah <laughs> okay thank you, thank you. Um, some of the findings that my uh, research team has come upon are presented in the paper for this conference implementation of extended reality in higher education examining students awareness which will be uh, hopefully published <laughs> in conference proceedings. Uh, of this course, research, Milena. Yes, thank you. This research paper describes documents and confirms the benefits of applying extended reality into higher education. Um, the article discusses the uh, discuss the challenges that occur in the uh, reality domain, uh, such as virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality as well and their uh, causes and solutions. We have included perspectives from technology design, uh, human factors and various technologies and ideas. And this paper primarily focus um, is on the benefits of using uh, extended reality 
through other disciplines that may intersect with higher education uh, where uh, appropriate as course and the whole as a whole the study aspires to provide a comprehensive overview of these technologies opportunities and future trends that will be applied in educational institution and uh, institution and uh, within our information technology school ITS in Belgrade we have performed some primary um, research in survey as a form of survey um, research it was an exploratory research of course that included um, 83 subjects 83 students our students of uh, uh, master uh, vocational uh, studies uh, and you can see uh, some of the results uh, here here presenting at this slide um, this research showed the high awareness uh, of um, extended reality among our students and usage of this technology in students' daily lives and whether they use uh, uh, this, uh, this technology depends on the age uh, of the survey respondents um, and to determine whether, uh, whether there was a correlation between the use of this uh, augmented reality and the age of the survey respondents uh, we used no, some non-parametric uh, statistics based, based on the ranks of the observation observation sorry based on the sample observations and the um, statistics we used uh, we uh, came to the conclusion that it cannot be asserted that there is a di direct correlation between um, the use of augmented reality in everyday life and the age of the survey respondents uh, however, the results showed that many respondents are aware of um, uh, this um, augmented uh, extended reality, um, more than two-thirds of the respondents, but they uh, are almost evenly distributed if they uh, use this technology in, the, in their daily lives. Uh, almost even distribution among uh, survey respondents when regarding their usage of this technology in their daily lives can be uh, probably explained with the fact that Serbia is a mid-income country and that extended reality technology is still not commonly used and affordable to most of uh, or most of that um, uh, people in, in Serbia, students in, in Serbia and young, young people and probably because um, um, extended reality is not um, commonly promoted well enough among uh, students of um, higher education institutions uh, yeah, as well. Just to conclude, technology and the scientific foundation upon which is uh, built are far too important to be ignored at this point. It is sufficient to focus solely uh, on the outcomes of the decisions and to foster responsible innovation as well. Um, uh, I will read just one um, paragraph from the uh, speech that Professor Val Valentin has prepared. Uh, once more, warm greetings from Belgrade, Serbia, a warm embrace from my team and the professors, associates and staff from Link Group, Information Technology School, ITS Belgrade and Faculty of Contemporary Arts Belgrade, stay safe and stay healthy. Uh, this is this is uh, all that I have <laughs> prepared. Thank you, prepared thank you, Elena. Thank and you. Elena. Now, uh, allow me to say a few words about uh, Dr. Coletto. Uh, Dr. Valentin Coletto is the founder and president of the leading multinational company uh, Link Group, which for 25 years have been successfully engaged in education management and professional education and certification in the field of information technology and modern businesses. Uh, though as many as uh, 50 educational institutions and over uh, 50 educational services, he is an associate professor of the Faculty of Contemporary Arts in Belgrade in Information Technology School at in Belgrade, Serbia. Dr. Coleto is the author of five books and many scientific and professional papers published in journals, national and international conference proceedings, and scientific monographs and of international importance um, within uh, modern education, educational technology, and uh, information technology. Uh, thank you a lot, Milena, for your presentation. And now, 
uh, if uh, we have around the um, confirm the agenda um, here is the time for uh, Maria Kovakova from University of Zilina. Hello, good morning. I'm Hi, here. Morning, morning. Morning. Maria, how are morning, you? Morning, George. Hi, Maria. How are hi, you? hi. Good, man. Thanks. And you? Fine. Nice to see you. Nice to see yeah, you. Happy to see you. Yeah, me too. Uh, Maria Kovakova here is going to, to talk us uh, about smart factory performance. Aren't you, Maria? Yes. Okay. Can I start? Yes. Okay, great. Many thanks. Oh, I will try to I will try to share with you my presentation. Okay, can you see it, please? Uh, yes, yes. yes. Okay, great, right. perfect. It looks fine. Okay, so uh, good morning. So I would like to tell you something about uh, and uh, present the uh, smart factory performance, cognitive automation and industrial big data analytics in sustainable manufacturing Internet of Things. My name is Maria Kovacheva and I am from the University of Zelina. So first of all, I would like to tell you the, what, the, what is it about, like the deployment of big, big data driven technologies in industry for zero based manufacturing system has resulted in the constant investment of digital factory environments. Manufacturing plants spend time and resources to optimize Internet of Things based real time production logistics. Sustainable cyber physical production systems develop on smart autonomous networked machines in intricate and fluid workflows. Reliable data sets support the adoption of an automated process monitoring in Internet of Things based decision support systems. Please take your time. Take your time, Maria. We are not okay. in a hurry. We are okay. Not in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to be in the uh, 10 no, or no, 15 no. minutes. No, okay, no. so. Okay. Take okay, many thanks. <laughs> so. Uh, if you look at the literature, we can see that uh, real-time sensor networks can attain significant level of rigorousness in monitoring applications to optimize operations in smart factories. Artificial intelligence-based decision-making algorithms facilitate handling of production data and determine ensuing system behavior. <clears throat> uh, sorry, I need to... Okay, um, system behavior. Artificial intelligence enabled carries out enhanced decision making or cognitive automation through machine learning models or Internet of Things based real time production logistics. Integrating production planning and scheduling, enterprise information systems, and product lifecycle management. Artificial intelligence, data driven Internet of Things systems configured. <clears throat> configure interconnected devices in smart applications. Real-time manufacturing performance assessment is pivotal in diagnosing production system hold status and attaining output enhancements. Intelligent processing capabilities, automation technologies, and decision support algorithms are pivotal in machine tools for sustainable industrial and operation engineering. By use of product decision-making information systems, deep learning assisted smart process planning and robotic wireless sensor networks in sustainable cyber physical production system. So, the methodology applied was uh, replicated survey data from uh, uh, some research programs like uh, LNS research management events, McKinsey, Black System, uh, uh, PVC, and other performing analysis and making estimates regarding intelligent processing capabilities, automation technologies and decision support algorithms in smart industrial systems. Descriptive statistics of compiled data from the completed surveys were calculated when appropriate. So the methods and materials uh, were conducted as follows that uh, we were, the interviews were conducted online and data were weighted by five variables age, race, gender, education, and geographic region. Using the Census Bureau's American Community Survey to reflect the reliability and accurately the demographic composition of the United States. An informed consent was obtained from individual participants. Study participants were informed clearly about their freedom to opt out of the study at any point of time 
without providing justification for doing so. Results are estimates and commonly are dissimilar within a narrow range around the actual value. If a participant began a survey without completing it, there was withdrawal of constant and the data was not used. To prevent this missing data, all fields in the survey were required. Any survey which didn't reach greater than 50% completion was removed from subsequent analysis to ensure quality. Data was weighted in a multi-step process that accounts for multiple stages of sampling and non-response that occur at different points in the survey process. This data was populated and analyzed in, in a statistic uh, program, ESPSIS, to ensure the logic and randomization were working as intended before launching the survey. To ensure high-quality data, data quality checks were performed to identify any responses showing clear patterns of satisfying. The cumulative response rate accounting for non-response to the recruitment service and attrition is 2.5%. The break-off rate among individuals who logged onto the survey and completed at least one item is 0.2%. Sampling errors and test of statistical significance take into account the effect of biting. Through the research process, the total survey equality approach designed to minimize error at each stage, as does the validity of survey research would be diminished, was, this was followed. So at each step uh, in the survey research process, best practices and quality controls were followed to minimize the impact of additional sources of error as regards specification, frame, non-response, measurement, and processing. Question, wording, and practical difficulties in conducting service can introduce error or bias into the findings of opinion polls. The sample writing as accomplished using an interactive proportional fitting process that simultaneously balanced the distribution of all variables. Stratified sampling methods were used and whites were trimmed up to exceed three. Average margins of error at the 95% confidence level are plus minus uh, 2%. The design effect for the survey was 1.3. For tabulation purposes, percentage points are rounded to the nearest wall number. The precision of the online polls was measured using a Bison credibility interval, and confirmatory factor analysis was employed to test for the reliability and validity of measurement instrument. Addressing a significant knowledge gap in the literature, the research has complied with trend methodology, reporting, and data analysis requirements. So, we can conclude to the results and discussion and to show what, uh, uh, what, uh, what we get through this. A robust and trustworthy software architectures together with data-driven methodologies can derive relevant knowledge supporting artificial intelligence-based decision-making algorithms. The advancement of collaborative robotics in groundbreaking production environments shape autonomous and network industrial systems. The massive volume of Internet of Things smart devices produces data that necessitate harnessing deep learning for analysis and processing. Sustainable manufacturing Internet of Things can optimize product quality and system output while decreasing associated expenses. So we will see these in uh, tables 1 to 9, uh, which will follow. And uh, Sustainable Industry 4.0 wireless networks enable smart factories to produce huge quantities of operational data. Implementing Internet of Things based real-time production, logistics without a convenient ground and objective can intensify organizational constraints, subven involvement and support, and configure an op operational disarray that can affect manufacturing plants' competitiveness. Deep learning algorithms are typically harnessed for establishing the link between multimodal data and sustainable cyber-physical production system. So, in Table 1, we can see robots will become major enablers of automation with large economic impact. The highest uh, points were get for 96. Industrial robots are used in an increasing variety of structures and are often employed in complete automation systems, which consist of a multitude of industrial robots. There is not such a big difference between uh, these individual parts uh, uh, analyzed in the table because uh, 94 points get the use of cloud-based solutions or standardized Internet of Things platforms can accelerate the initial deployment of new solutions and support their large-scale application. Another, the second table, sec the table two, 
uh, shows that uh, the next generation technologies can optimize targeted areas of operation, leading to tech-enabled ecosystem. The relevance is the, the highest relevance get the predictive analytics help operators get ahead of environmental excursions. This was followed by digital dis <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, digital dispatching of work orders to the field sense, workers real-time orders and updates. On the other side, at the end, uh, we get the real-time tracking of full requirements and recommended blending levels can monitor full consumption and availability. And the last, uh, with, the, uh, with the smallest relevance, was the centralized control room monitors with prioritized dashboard can reduce workload and enable better fleet level visibility. The next two tables, uh, the analysis was uh, conducted and, uh, uh, and was uh, uh, focused on the, which Internet of Things applications are you currently deploying? So the uh, individuals uh, who conducted the research uh, uh, um, response that the remote monitoring, asset and material tracking are the, the, the highest uh, what they apply and the kind of uh, applications that they apply. This was followed by predictive maintenance, factory optimization and industrial variables. In the next table, uh, the, is the sh is shown shows shows the percent of companies investing in technological advances, and uh, so we can see that the cloud solutions, multi-purpose production lines, are the uh, production uh, or companies with the highest uh, investing in this area. This is followed by capital equipment with network control system, embedded sensors, and embedded data analytic. Uh, the percent of uh, these companies is uh, quite high. You can see 96%, 95%, 94 So it is a really big, uh, um, big amount. Table 5 shows the, how are you using analytics to improve business and manufacturing performance across the enterprise. So improving manufacturing quality is a 59% uh, better forecast of a production plant. This is followed. Improved customer service and support, better forecast of production across multiple plants. On the other side, uh, the, the lowest uh, percentage is the social media interaction with consumers. We don't share manufacturing data outside the enterprise, for example. Uh, what is the expected benefits of Internet of Things investments? So uh, these companies, uh, for they apply that improved customer service quality is the highest percent. 58% of, uh, com of uh, companies applied that uh, this is the benefit of Internet of Things and uh, why they invest into this uh, area. Creation of new digital products and services, creation of new business models and revenue streams improve decision making through the efficient use of data and the last is reduced operational cost there is uh, the big table seven and uh, this uh, this table shows how industry leaders build integrated operations ecosystems to deliver end-to-end -end customer solutions according to this uh, table we can see that the industry 4.0 encompasses end-to-end -end digitization and data integration of the value chain offering digital products and services, operating connected physical and virtual assets, transforming and integrating all operations and internal activities, building partnerships and optimizing customer facing activities. Uh, here we can uh, conclude some, uh, also some, uh, some general uh, uh, stuff according to this, because we have last uh, two tables. Table eight showing that smart factory initiatives evaluated plant on uh, or already deployed by organizations are connected worker, digital quality control, condition monitoring, traceability. This is uh, with a uh, quite high percent. Uh, what uh, what uh, they they deploy in uh, in organizations. So asset performance management, uh, supply chain analytics, big data, digital twin or factory simulation. So based on this data, we can see that in companies, it's uh, really important to apply this uh, 
smart uh, smart internet of things and uh, big data analytics for which purpose are you using data analytics the last table nine shows that uh, why uh, for which purpose why they apply this uh, data analytics so the the responses with the highest percent was to the do predictive maintenance of manufacturing equipment to predictive maintenance after sale or lease, refine planning for local assortment, drive higher operational efficiency, drive real-time contextual targeting marketing. So based on this, we can conclude uh, some uh, conclusions, implications, and uh, further issue directions. Cutting edge software technologies required to gather, process, and develop data produced by use of artificial intelligence data driven Internet of Things systems, leverage over the manufacturing inline can acquire relevant knowledge for the harmonization of ground baking breaking monitoring services that can bring about added business value. Impacting the data life cycle in production environments by decreasing production line, discontinuities, and the complementary consequences and expenses. Smart manufacturing breakthroughs and sensor data support rigorous assessment of real-time operations of sustainable cyber physical, physical production systems. Through smart manufacturing processes, massive volumes of data are acquired for monitoring cyber physical system-based smart factories. Deep transfer learning machine health monitoring systems and prediction accuracy are instrumental in smart manufacturing. So, network intelligence machines aim the assimilation of distributed machine learning tools across sensing, sharing, and decision operations. Deep learning algorithms, when harnessed to industrial Internet of Things, can be pivotal in smart assembling and production, streamlined interconnection, and accident detection and prevention. This article, so uh, this uh, this presentation, this article focuses only on smart factory performance, cognitive automation, and industrial big data analytics in sustainable manufacturing in terms of things. Limitations of the research also include a convenient sample, small sample size, and cross-sectional data collection, thus limiting general visibility. Certain variables were dichotomized because of small cell sizes through the analysis, the sample size and the richness of the cohort study data set enable the control for numerous potential co-founders in the multivariable analysis and provide novel data on the topic. More data gathered either cross-sectionally or longitudinally that utilize larger study populations are required to check and support the conclusions drawn in this study. Further research should consider Internet of Things based real time production logistics, big data driven decision making processes, and industrial artificial intelligence in sustainable cyber physical manufacturing system. So, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, you, know, you can uh, contact me on my email or send me some uh, notes. What do you like to? Or, or even right now, if there are questions, Maria. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are persons who would like to, to ask questions now. Uh, we encourage the participants to um, ask questions uh, uh, so that uh, we have a, a proper debate. Very impressive your presentation also and your research also. Many uh, thanks. <laughs> very, very interesting. Uh, George, maybe you want uh, to yes. ask? Um, uh, Maria, um, uh, do you have um, uh, some uh, information regarding uh, the way um, Internet of Things based manufacturing systems are integrated in, um, in uh, Slovakia, in, uh, in Slovak uh, companies? Yes, uh, there is uh, the the research is uh, like uh, the is conducting, and uh, also it's uh, similar according to the these uh, companies which were in uh, analyzed because uh, also like the these uh, cloud companies and uh, uh, these uh, big uh, companies which need to uh, like transport companies because uh, in Slovakia the economic is uh, really based on the automotive industry. We have big, uh, big uh, companies like uh, Kia, uh, Volkswagen, and uh, these companies, they, they are pre 
their they have here their their automotive industry and uh, they're preparing uh, cars and so on so they uh, this it's a large uh, large part of economy of Slovakia Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, Professor Rath uh, uh, says, uh, deep analysis, uh, congratulations. Uh, Many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you again for, for joining us and is glad uh, to have uh, met you again. Thank you very much, me too. <laughs> have a nice day. Have a nice Take day. Care. Thank, Thank you, you Maria. Bye. You're great. Thank you. Now it's time for presentation from, for Professor Rath. I know that Professor Rath is here with us and uh, uh, he's uh, listening to us. Uh, as uh, George said, um, uh, his pro uh, Professor Rath is, is now in a train, traveling, in moving, and he asked me to, to help him to put his presentation, registered last night by him, uh, Professor Rath's presentation um, is about the dawn of marketing 5.0. It's about the symbiosis of agile, augmented, and productive marketing. Let me also say a few words about Professor, Professor Rath. Um, I know he's uh, hearing us right now. I have a few words about himself. Ah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm hearing. Yes, yes. I'm I'm looking <laughs> for your presentation, Professor. <laughs> uh, professor Rach <laughs> is a professor and dean of Vishwa Vishmani Group of Institution Hyderabad, India. Uh, he has 50 publications in national and international journals, including Scopus and uh, other referred journals. He has presented 100 uh, pa research papers in various conferences and co-authored and uh, edited conference journals, books, and white papers. He is also the chief of the journal called Marketing Guru uh, Business Media from uh, India. And now a few words about uh, the institutions. Let me uh, find them a few minutes because I have all of them here. Vishva, Vishva institutions of management and system of uh, and management, which includes Vishva, Vishvani School of Business from Hyderabad, India, is the third largest business school group in South India, having more than two decades of strong contribution in the management, education and research. Uh, the group uh, has three institutions offering postgraduate and undergraduate programs in business management and information technologies. Uh, is that right, Professor? Did I said it uh, okay? It was okay? Do you want to say yeah, it, two words? <laughs> thank, you. Also? thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> now I... I am preparing your presentation, Professor. Allow me. Yeah. Let's see. Now I'm looking for, um, I have a lot around here oops uh keynotes presentations yes uh, professor sabia saki good morning everyone this is dr sabir satira wishing a very pleasant morning from hyderabad india at the very outset, I thank uh, Spiru Hyatt University, Bukarest, Romania, for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity to uh, deliver a talk on the uh, theme of very uh, latest significance. And I also thank uh, Professor Elena for really giving me this opportunity and uh, giving me the chance to present my 
insights, my opinions and points of view on this August conference. Can I start my presentation? I'm going to talk about the dawn of marketing 5.0 the symbiosis of agile, augmented, and predictive marketing. All of us are very clear and all of us are very familiar with the, the industrial evolution that has been happening around us from industry 1.0 to industry 4.0. Last year, we talked about industry 4.0 and today we're talking about marketing 5.0. And this talks about the uh, rapid pace of industrialization, the rapid pace of changes that's happening around us. Now, when we we'll talk about this topic, uh, we will go through the uh, four different aspects of the points during the presentation. One, the marketing pipe zero and smart marketing, the smart marketing objectives, elements of smart marketing, and the road ahead. Now, basically, when it's the marketing 5.0, it is all about integrating technological and the business models to understand the changing customer behavior and act upon it. We are underlining the customer behavior aspect because the customer behavior is going to drastically change and there will be a lot of uh, fluctuation in the trends which should be uh, uh, predicted, which should be uh, understood and acted upon. Therefore, marketing 5.0 is all about integrating the technology and the business models to understand the customer behavior because ultimately the customer behavior will be the key to marketing decision making. Now, the link between marketing 5.0 and smart marketing objective. Now, when it's a smart marketing objective, all of us are familiar with the acronym SMART and how it is linked with marketing 5.0 is when it's a SMART, S stands for specific, M for measurable, A for achievable or attainable, R for realistic and relevant and T for timely. Now, whenever we are uh, going to set the marketing objective for the marketing 5.0, then the smart marketing plays a very crucial role because the marketing goals must adapt to the smart principle if they have to be successfully included. Now, at this point of time, uh, let me uh, speak that smart marketing objectives need integration with the framework that's called RACE, R-A-C-E. Now, the objective and the framework must be integrated in a harmonious way so that the marketing strategies will be more effective. Now, what is RACE from framework is, the R stands for reach. Now, whatever marketing objective we are framing, that must be linked with the reach how many customers or how much target audience we are going to reach. The next is X. Once we reach the target audience, then the question is acting upon. How do we act upon their behavior? How do we act upon their preferences? How do we act upon them? With this to our website, then comes the conversion. That's the key to the marketing 5.0 because the action on the reach will lead to the conversion next. So unless the visitors on a website is converted into the potential customers or the leads are converted into customers, there is no point in doing a marketing. So therefore, the ultimate aim of marketing strategy is to convert. Once they converted, the next thing is retaining because that's one more challenge for the marketeer. So therefore, you need to engage the customers who are already converted. So the rich act, convert and engage the race framework is very, very crucial for the marketing objective of SMART to be more effective. Now, to achieve the SMART marketing objectives, along with the framework, or how to see the framework is really implemented or executed, we need to integrate three elements onto it. And what are the three elements are agility, augmentation, and predictability. So let's uh, understand one by one these three elements and how they are important for the marketing success. The agility marketing or what you call design marketing is basically 
in the marketing context, if you understand, the word agility actually comes from the software uh, uh, the domain. And what in software domain agility means using data and analytics to continuously source promising opportunities and solutions to problems in real time. So it's using the real time data. Then deploying the test quickly, result evaluation, and rapidly implementing. Now the same has been used in marketing today. So let's understand that agility marketing or agile marketing is not a strategy. It's an approach, first of all. It is an approach to the marketing process that helps or guides the marketing and business strategies through a data-driven insights and constant learning. So it's basically a project management framework, how to integrate different domains, different uh, faculties of marketing and uh, develop a very fruitful, effective and strong marketing strategy. Now, where this is achieved by aligning a streamlining the structure, the communication, the process, the workflow, etc., to maximize the efficiency without sacrificing the quality. So, agility marketing is about from process to tool and tools to the individuals and interactions. So, agility marketing is or suggest change from following the rigid plan to responding to changes, being adaptable. From impersonal mass market approach to intimate customer tribes, we call them tribes. More customization required here. Opinions and conventions are not the hunting. Testing and data, frequent testing of data. Then from large experiments to numerous small experiments. Gone are the days when one newspaper advertisement was enough for creating a lot of budget in the market. You need to have a lot of small experiments. Official posturing to engagement and transparency. No rectification, no rigidity. Engagement and transparency is the key. Then from former market research to getting out of out to the market. Then the very important is peak launch cycle to continuous improvement and engagement. Now it should happen in small, small bites. The product development, the product design, the marketing strategy implementation, all this happen in small, small bites rather than a big launch cycle. Now, this is what uh, they adopted from the uh, different sources. How the makeup of an uh, agile war room, what's called war room because marketing is referred to as warfare, right? And in a war room, how it looks like to the core uh, war room team and the extended war room team. If you look at them, they're all integration of different faculties are uh, represented here. So, there is a legal uh, there is a legal team, there is an IT team, there is a marketing acquisition lead, there is a CEO, there is a art director, copywriter, media, the scrum master, analytics. All these team members are integrated into the system so that you give or the marketing manager can get a very strong marketing strategy for targeting the segments. Next comes your augmented marketing. The second element of the marketing 5.0 is the augmented marketing. So what is augmented marketing? We understand from the traditional marketing point of view, augmentation is basically adding a value to a proposition by an additional innovative offer. We understand it uh, very simply called one plus one offer in a traditional marketing sense. Now, this augmentation will be happening under marketing 5.0 using the augmented reality platforms. Now, if you look at the, uh, uh, the usage already, uh, Top giants like Apple, Google, and Facebook have already used the augmented reality uh, and for their different business purposes. Now, in fact, in the social media, if you look at that, a lot of uh, social media like Snapchat have already used it, followed by Instagram. E-commerce brands, uh, especially the beauty and lifestyle brands, have been using the AR feature by following or allowing customers to try out new products. Also, AR being used for creating high-impact brand awareness because awareness is the first step towards conversion. And everybody is very well uh, aware about the entertainment industry and how it is a big consumer of the AR. So all this shows how the AR can be used in multiple ways for a number of different reasons, whether it is increasing the user engagement or offering interactive elements for the consumers. So, 
If you look at the AR usage, the augmented reality will be giving the user's experience an enhanced zone, which we are earlier given, giving an extra benefit or extra product or extra offer. Now, this will be offered to a technological experience. For example, somebody can sit at home and can experience the journey through a particular trekking, mountaineering experience. Now, why brands should use the AR under marketing 5.0 is number one, assistance for improved customer relationship. Now, this AR will improve the customer relationship dimension for the marketer. Second, it will create a buzz marketing and branding because buzz marketing is important for the product to be successful because people must know about it. The customers should know that something is happening around it because whichever is visible will get into the customer's mind faster. That's part of it. Then comes your better product visualization. Customers sitting at home can visualize the product design, product style, product architecture in a better way when they are using the AR. Then comes deeper engagement and rewards. AR helps in deeper engagement and rewards for the customers. Customers will be more and more involved if you are using the AR or leveraging the AR for product design, product experience, etc. Then come also the AR helps in B2B marketing and very effective way. Because when you have B2B marketing, we may not get an appointment of uh, the client. All of a sudden, may not be possible to meet the client uh, every time and again. Therefore, the AR gives a very virtual experience in a very fantastic way. Uh, so B2B marketing becomes more successful using the AR. Next comes the third element of the uh, smart marketing or the marketing 5.0, predictive marketing. Because if you look at the future, the future is all about predicting the customer's behavior. Of course, in the past, also the customer has been the key or central or the nucleus to the marketing activities. But in future, it is going to be more challenging and more important. So here, predictive marketing, we're leveraging the AI and machine learning, artificial intelligence and machine learning to combine the insights generated through various data set, algorithms and models to predict the future customer behavior. So here, we are mixing the technology with the business practices. Now, if you look at them, the three models of uh, predictive marketing uh, being used, one is the cluster model, where uh, the algorithms are used as audience segmentation based on past brand engagement, past purchases, and demographic data. Now, if you look at them, they resemble the fundamental concepts of the marketing segmentation. However, this segmentation is done based on the past data using the cluster model. Second, the propensity model, where the uh, evaluation of consumer likelihood to do something like such as conversion and uh, act as an offer or disengagement. So when a cluster model talks about analyzing the audience segmentation or designing the audience segmentation based on the past engagements, the propensity model talks about how the customer is likely to react to a particular offer by helping in converting from a non-user or disengaged user to an engaged user. Then comes the recommendation filtering. So here this model evaluates the past purchase history to understand where there might be additional sales opportunities. So opportunity exploration will be done or will be achieved by recommendation filtering. So these are the three uh, models of uh, predictive marketing. Now if you look at all these three models, they uh, are intended to achieve three different objectives. The past uh, analysis, of the customer's behavior. The second is how to get conversion. And third is what are the additional opportunities or what are the augmentation opportunities for the marketer to attract more customers. So what actually is the marketing 5.0 and what are the future for it? Now, if you look at it, there are two very important elements with which I will uh, like to conclude my uh, presentation here. The future of marketing is flushed with new consumer desires, personas, and marketing methods. 
let's understand very clearly customer psychology has been a very complicated area all through however it is going to be more critical in the coming time because the customer desires are going to be different the personas are going to be different and the marketing methods are accordingly going to be very very different so everything for everyone customized that will be the new mantra what we call the new guidelines for the successful marketing plan so with this i will conclude my uh, brief presentation on a note that the future is going to be definitely very very uh, challenging in the sense that the traditional marketer need to mix agility predictability and augmentation in a very systematic and symbiotic way to optimize the marketing strategies and marketing activities because that will define the success and future of any marketing activity at then i thank you so much for your patience hearing and once again i thank uh, piruharet university for giving me this opportunity for any kind of questions and queries i will be more pleased to respond them to different means thank you so much thank you professor rath <laughs> i know that you are here with us right now and uh, if there is a uh, someone else who, who want uh, to ask questions oh i don't think he is anymore with us. oh i see i see uh, now uh, i'm uh, looking on uh, our agenda and i'm seeing right now professor dragani Ilich from the university business academy in novi sad india uh, he sent me a message earlier because i haven't heard of him a few days and uh, he gave me uh, a message telling us that uh, in the last few days he spent uh, the days in the hospital uh, not very serious but he's not able to talk and uh, not able to participate uh, at the conference today and uh, he he, he tells us that uh, to accept uh, his sincere apologies and uh, he hopes to be uh, soon better and um, we send him all our uh, regards and best wishes and uh, from the sympathy with the professor and uh, uh, with his illness I'm going to Tell a few words about uh, Professor Jagan and about uh, uh, his institution. Um, I'm. Uh, I will be ready in a few minutes, uh, Professor. Uh, oh. I can see Professor Rat is on. Perhaps he is available for questions. Okay. Uh, by the way, very interesting presentation, Professor Rat. I, I was amazed of the presentation. I, I like it so much. <laughs> really, sincerely. Um, Nelly Amar has a question for you. Yes. Yes, may I ask? Uh, thank you a lot, Professor, for the very interesting presentation. Yes. Uh, of course, the marketing 5.0 is a cutting edge technology. But I just have a question. Did you identify any risks or negative impact on marketing 5.0 on the customers in the future? Okay, so probably the connection to the technology for sure. Being in moving, yeah, Professor Rat is not having a good internet connection, I think. Uh, he's trying, I see he's trying, but uh, the image and the sound is, they're not so good. Yes. Uh, we appreciate a lot the efforts of Professor Rat, and 
his presentation, his work. Uh, maybe later professor will have a, a, a better connection and uh, he can respond to, to our question. Uh, now um, I prepared um, I prepared uh, a presentation of Professor Dragan Ilic. Uh, he got his PhD degree at the Faculty of Economics and Engineering Management in 2011, and uh, his academic career started at Educons University in 2006. Since 2011, he has been working as a lecturer at the Faculty of Economics and Engineering Management. Until June 2013, he has the marketing. Um, he was the marketing director of the University Business Academy in Novi Sad, and uh, in the period from 2013 to 2015, uh, Dr. Ilic uh, was appointed as a vice dean for school and international uh, cooperation. Uh, at the Faculty of Economics and uh, Engineering Management 6, 2015. Uh, he has been the coordinator for international cooperation at the University Business Academy in Novi Sad, Serbia. Also, uh, uh, Professor uh, Ilic is a regular consultant uh, and uh, analyst uh, of the Serbian national TV station, namely the radio television of Serbia and the radio television of uh, Vojvodina in areas of uh, agribusiness, entrepreneurship, national economy and international business. Uh, since the academic year 2013-2014, he has been uh, the associate member of several uh, universities where he has uh, had several guest lectures uh, as the Faculty of Logistics from Slovenia, Budapest Metropolitan University from Budapest, uh, Faculty of Economics from uh, Hungary, uh, University College from Belgium, uh, Sekeroya University from Ankara, Turkey, and Stuttgart uh, Media University from Stuttgart, Germany, in the fields of marketing, logistics, agribusiness, uh, entrepreneurship and management. He is also a member of the academic network Bizinet, uh, I think, which gathers more than 100 higher education institutions from all over the world. He has published over 40 scientific and research papers and has participated in over 50 national and international conferences and meetings. And now allow me to say a few words about uh, uh, the University Business Academy as a, as a um, uh, co-partner. Uh, yes, I found it. Um, University Business Academy in Novi Sad is a higher scientific educational institution. Uh, autonomous and private university, legal, formed under the Serbian law. Uh, university Business Academy established in, uh, was established in 2000, um, is the first uh, privately owned university which uh, was accredited in the autonomous uh, province of Vojvodina by both the National and International Quality Insurance Authority. The university owns Certificate of State Accreditation of the Commission for Accreditation and Quality Assurance of the Ministry of Education, Science and Technological Development of the Republic of Serbia, which is a member of the International Network of Quality Assurance Agencies in Higher Education and has a candidate member status with the European Association for Quality Assurance in Higher Education. Um, we uh, send uh, Professor Illich our best regards um, and to be soon uh, healthier and uh, um, we, we're sorry not being with us today but uh, we understand the situation. Uh, now uh, I am looking at the agenda and I'm seeing uh, Professor um, Ajil Valiev from uh, Azerbaijan Tourism and Management University from Baku, Azerbaijan, uh, who is going to, to talk us about the effect of the use of and uh, knowledge of AA 
uh, and the advanced entrepreneurship and small business. Uh, uh, he is talking about uh, uh, case studies of uh, three countries. Uh, also, Agil uh, Valiev sent me today um, in the morning uh, um, uh, his presentation because uh, he had to to urgently go to a meeting uh, at, uh, with the dean of his country, of his, his university, and asked me to to put his presentation, and I'm going to do it right now. Let me, uh, allow me to do it. Yes. I'm going to enter here. Wow, we have an error around here. I don't know why. What? Uh, In the meantime, I want to, I just want to address good health to our colleague from Novi Sad University. Uh, I met him on another conference, so wish really is the best. And by the way, for all of us, stay calm and healthy. Because oh. all around the world, we, we deal with challenges. I want to congratulate our colleague from India, a very interesting perspective about marketing, but also Nelly for her lovely question. Maybe another conference should be organized based on this because it's really challenging. I just want to use a little the time until you you manage to solve. So. Yes, I found okay. out the presentation. I found out the presentation. I know where it is because I... No, it's it. okay. I just want to use a little the time in good perspective. Let's hope that I will be able to... to put the presentation. Uh, yes. Uh, I saw it earlier, but, uh, you know, uh, great. <laughs> Good morning, dear professors, dear colleagues, dear students, and dear organizing committee. First of all, I want to just uh, for thank for my uh, highly just uh, appreciation uh, for giving this kind of opportunities for the keynote speaker position for this conference. Uh, so, uh, I want to just introduce myself. My name is Agil Valiev. I am just a doctor of Azerbaijan. Tourism and Management University. So my uh, working subject uh, is the effect of the use of and the knowledge, use and knowledge of the artificial intelligence on the advanced entrepreneurship in small business, several country examples. So uh, of course, this subject is a quite uh, purely uh, emergent subject. So the, we know just the current situation, the effect of AI different business industries, different industry levels, and there's still just adaptation for this positioning. Uh, artificial intelligence of everything. This is the, there are several types of the questions in this regards. The, is artificial intelligence creating a digital quark? Why are 80% of companies and jobs will need to change or fail? This is still is the question. And or the what is the implications to the society, economic development of the countries and path to prosperity? And also another question is the artificial intelligence as a technical standards achieve sustainable development goals of UN. So to find an answer for this question, so I will try to mention the some key points there. The first starting the fourth industrial revolution. We know just now the where but I'm going to adaptation the fourth industry revelation and we're still living for this positioning. The main key clusters, three clusters of four uh, cyber uh, physical systems driven by artificial intelligence robotics. 
One is the physical human world, second is the digital and technosphere, and third is the bio biological natural world. So uh, each of them, they have this specific just impact for the business environment. So uh, what about the, the uh, connection between the artificial intelligence and sustainable development goals? Of course, uh, the people thinking about artificial intelligence uh, are key tools for uh, implementation of sustainable development goals of UN. Just starting the some key tools to for uh, if we review the uh, sustainable development goals of UN, one of them is no poverty issues. For this reasoning, the artificial intelligence have been the role just the tracking poverty issues to, by using the several tools. And if we talk about the good health issues, here's artificial have active participation diagnosis issues. And about quality education, it's a very emergence impact of artificial intelligence to uh, quality education the, by reasoning to some influence development programs and education but by using the different softwares for understanding the learning quite easier. So uh, then the good jobs and economic growth uh, in this regard artificial have uh, uh, effect to the microfinance sectors. So what about the greenhouse emissions and smart cities? Of course, the huge effect of artificial intelligence for this industry. Then so, also global partnership. Uh, here is a we need to quite talk about artificial impact of artificial intelligence the for this sectors that quite wider. Just now starting the uh, connection between the small medium enterprises is artificial intelligence. Small medium enterprises, the here is a way of going to finding answers to the question that are you ready for artificial intelligence? So how do you begin? Where you will plan to begin? So here's the several questions and the one biggest question, what could my business use artificial intelligence for? So for this regard, the SMS basically we know just they have solved using artificial intelligence you're understanding their clients, improving their operation system, optimizing system. So uh, for getting for their just supply chain issues and stock management issues, that is the major key tools, the role of the artificial forces uh, industry. So artificial intelligence is giving the allowance to significant factors in prediction, prices and facilitation issues for making good decision making. For this regard, enhanced prediction, the capability, uh, artificial intelligence giving their laws for greater market segmentation, open news, opportunities for small and medium enterprises uh, in the scope of the innovation. So uh, artificial intelligence also can substantially affect small and medium enterprise, the business environment, uh, where and how they are making this on efficiency of public administration, reducing the red tape and also securing digital infrastructure, improving the small medium enterprises access to finance environment and easing the skill management issues. So, and also uh, small medium connection between the small medium enterprises with the artificial intelligence, the artificial intelligence that have been active participation or for several barriers, the lack of data cultures they still uh, they have the and also lack of the awareness about what artificial intelligence could bring for small medium enterprises. And the need for retraining managers and workers they still most countries uh, not have the quite enough the skills regarding artificial intelligence for adaptation the skills to business and different industrial levels. So uh, here is the data is the key issues because of governments they have a role to play in supporting the uh, small medium enterprises in building the culture of the state. So another corner issue is the human factor is critical. That what I have said before here is the reskilling of some small medium enterprises managers and workers by using the tools and techniques of artificial intelligence. So uh, I have also tried to mention the such kind of the country examples. 
uh, threat of artificial intelligence. Some countries they have preparing specific strategies, programs for uh, adaptation of artificial intelligence for their business environment. Regarding Denmark examples, they have also the 2018 they launched the Denmark's digital growth strategy for further digital technology advance. That is the major aim is to improve digital development in Denmark. You can find here is the six items from the strategies of the Denmark regarding the artificial intelligence, a digital center will be in Denmark, the small medium enterprises here, digitalization technology pack, and also they are thinking about a computer-based thinking in primary education strengthening. So data as a driver of the cross, they think you are strengthening the cybersecurity issues in companies they buy a finding for uh, artificial intelligence. In the UK examples, they, they think the five key areas, the ideas, people, the infrastructure, business environment, location, are these ideas the world's most innovative economy that finds their, their country. But what about new post-pandemia paradigm for robotics? Of course, pre-pandemic, the application uh, in case of just the IE in highly developed countries with declining populations, such as Japan, like but post-pandemic, uh, just as there are several kinds of questions, can we use robotics to protect human workers if it means the increase in cost? And also, can we use robotics to break existing barriers to human creativity? This question are still is the open question for still thinking around of that, discussion around of that. And of course, we know that COVID has the negative impact over the world. And in this kind of society are going to react more. So for this position in artificial have active participated in communication tools and the management system, and also uh, try to increase in its the participation in different industries. So I have also arranged this survey among the 411 the, uh, peoples the, uh, for interview results. The, here is the uh, the, from the result of the survey, I found that just the, uh, the people mentioned that the artificial intelligence in SMS are still is low. So here is the uh, benefits of artificial intelligence are not often really measured because people or companies are still thinking about that. And here is the we can mention that so most people just blindly trust that artificial intelligence is beneficial. So uh, my just speech is the short brief. So that's why the, I wanna for making the, my thank thankfulness to for uh, organizer committees. For I hope just that this kind of the presentation will be useful, benefit, benefit. We get the benefits to, for all participants of conference, and also I wanna just apologize the not active participation in the direct participation uh, in the conference processes, uh, the, the reason of, because of just uh, some reasonings. So you know, thank you very much for taking to your attention, your time for listening for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ajil. Uh, in uh, respect for uh... Uh, Professor Ajil, I am uh, going to say uh, a few words about uh, him and um, about his institution because his institution is a co-partner uh, at this event. Uh, Azerbaijan Tourism and Management University, uh, represented here by Professor Ajil Valiev, uh, trains people in tourism in Baku, Azerbaijan. Uh, this institution is established under the Ministry of Culture and Tourism of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Uh, the professional goals of the university include improvement of the tourism industry, training personnel to meet the need of qualified personnel in the field of travel, leisure and hospitality. In uh, 2014, the institute became the University of Tourism and Management. Uh, this university uh called now azerbaijan tourism and management university cooperates with uh, many local and international organizations also uh and within uh, within the framework 
uh, of this cooperation, several research and development projects, teacher-student exchanges have been uh, implemented along the time. And uh, now uh, allow me to say to you a few words about um, Professor Agil Valiev, who is a good friend of mine and um, who is sending me all the time uh, papers to, to the general of uh, our university. Uh, Dr. Agil Valiev is a lecturer at uh, Azerbaijan Tourism and Management University. Uh, he's also a lecturer in different European universities from Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, Austria, and a few others. He has more than 80 publications in different international journals, and he's a member of an uh, expert group in the Science and Technological Commission of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Uh, thank you for uh, all the efforts that Professor Agil made uh, today in the morning to send us his presentation. And we are sorry not being here today to ask him questions, but um, as we all know, uh, Professor had uh, uh, a, a very good presentation and uh, personally, I, I liked it a, a lot. Um, now, Milena, I think it's your turn again. <laughs> yes, it's my turn again. Thank you, dear Elena. Your uh, real turn. Yes, my real turn this time. Um, I will uh, uh, present my other paper briefly because uh, I'm already late to, to my another uh, Google Meet. Uh, I'm sorry uh, because oh. of that, because of the shortness of my uh, future presentation. Um, okay. I will uh, now share the presentation. Please apologize with, with us. You. No, no, uh, I uh, contributed to the lateness of, <laughs> of, uh, of uh, this. Believe me, I, I took uh, a little more time than expected to present uh, my first paper. Sorry for that. Um, I think this is my presentation. Yes, yes, it is. I, I hope you can all. Uh, see it at your um, um, computers. Uh, now yes, I will present uh, the research paper and the research study that uh, my other team has uh, prepared for this. It has a, a conference. My other team, just to present them shortly, uh, uh, is made of uh, very, very good uh, uh, professors from Serbia and uh, from Romania, from Spirit Harit University. I'm sure that you recognize uh, the name of your colleague, um, dear Professor Oksana Bucama Matea, Matea Tonis, a dear friend also, like you, Elena. Uh, we uh, often um, um, research together. We have many uh, published papers. Uh, and I think that uh, among other my uh, dear colleagues, uh, that she is the most valuable um, uh, researcher I, I know. Um, Nevenka Popovicevic also, Marko Rankovic uh, are the members of um, uh, this team, along with Roxana and uh, me. Uh, we have analyzed, um, uh, I think, very interesting team regarding the competitiveness and innovation. And we try to uh, compare uh, two countries that are not uh, um, uh, so similar um, regarding its uh, stru their structures, yes. Uh, we have uh, tried to ob observe uh, these uh, elements of competitiveness and innovation in uh, Serbia and uh, Romania. I think that the, our findings are a bit interesting. Um, uh, we made the analysis of um, uh, some available uh, uh, official sources and reports and uh, we perform such analysis based on those collected data on innovation and competitiveness of the Republic Serbia of, and uh, Romania. Uh, we also, uh, for this research, use content analysis as a research technique. And then we further compare the data using comparison method. And um, uh, we used uh, various international and national uh, sort, sources of, of data. But uh, most of all, we, our research uh, is based on the global competitiveness report of the World Economic Forum, 
um, data that we use to pre present the ranking and uh, innovation elements are uh, based, uh, mostly based on two reports, one uh, for, for the year 218 and uh, the other uh, is the report uh, based on the um, uh, the year uh, 219 uh, from that World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report. Um, we uh, also uh, wanted to use the report for the year 220, but that, that was a special edition and didn't contain uh, any rankings on the global competitive index that was valuable for, for us to use. Um, uh, for this uh, concrete research, uh, we used, we observed two uh, pillars. One of them is uh, business dynamism, dynamism sorry. Uh, it's the 11th pillar, and we also uh, observed the 12th uh, pillar called uh, uh, innovation uh, um, capability. Um, or, um, due to a shortness of, of uh, time here, uh, I will address only some, uh, let's say, uh, major fa findings that we came uh, across to and compare uh, the Romania and uh, Serbia within these uh, elements or the elements within these, these two pillars. Um, regarding the Romania, this global competitiveness report ranked Romania in the 15th, first place out of 141 countries with this global competitiveness index score a value of um, 64 Point four, uh, which is a good thing and uh, it, which represents um, uh, a movement uh, from uh, one for one place since the uh, report that was um, for the year 218. Uh, also, interesting, interesting data: uh, Romania was placed at second, 72nd place in uh, business activity dynamism. Um, in uh, 2019, uh, and uh, which showed, uh, if we compare the two reports for the t uh, two years, which shows that uh, Romania ranking has improved by uh, even eight places, having in mind that Romania rega regarding this pillar was ranked at uh, uh, 46th place uh, during the report of for the year of 218. Um, as we have concluded, when it comes to Romania, most innovation comes from ITC sector, which is well organized in business clusters that uh, offer um, uh, information and, and um, uh, I should say uh, consultancy support uh, for um, many uh, involved enterprises, especially for small and middle enterprises, which is very important for um, uh, development of this uh, sector of economy. Uh, also, as we have conducted, uh, uh, as we have concluded, sorry, the young working force has a good results also in ITC sector. Um, having in mind that most multinational IT companies that set up uh, uh, some um, subsidi subsidiaries in Romania. And also we have concluded that um, very a good creative economy uh, is um, ha having an impact of good um, result that Romania has on uh, um, th those elements. Um, Based of uh, base of uh, I, I should say a great development of uh, creative economy and its uh, elements and its companies. Um, also, a short uh, explanation about results that Serbia has obtained according to the uh, world of uh, economics um, global. Uh, competitiveness report for the uh, year uh, 2019. Serbia ranked at 72nd place out of 151 countries with a global competitiveness index of uh, 60, um, which is uh, not so well uh, 
for for our country for Serbia uh, because it uh, shows that Serbia has fallen seven places compared to some results uh, obtained in the um, report uh, the same report for the year 218 um, uh, regarding the eleventh uh, pillar that we have uh, also observed for for Serbia, um, it's a uh, good good information that that um, uh, this pillar made made the most significant positive uh, contribution uh, in that in that way. So it's a it's a, some kind some kind of a good impact for for uh, Serbia. Sorry, sorry, sorry for a, 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 a few seconds, Milena. Oh, great, great. <laughs> we haven't seen your screen for a few minutes. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, I forgot okay. to, to spin, the, <laughs> spin the slides. Sorry. Um, I will uh, I will change that now. I think that you see um, uh, figure one uh, regarding the innovation ecosystem of Romania. Um, those are data that I have... Um, uh, and uh, noticed uh, earlier uh, regarding innovation capability uh, and uh, business dynamism, 11, 10, 12 uh, pillar. And uh, here I can pre present shortly uh, components uh, that are based on uh, for business dynamism elements uh, for uh, administrative requir requirements for Romania. Uh, here we can see the score and the rank, rank of those uh, components regarding cost of starting a business, time to start a business, and, and etc. Um, also, uh, I will show the results for for Serbia um, uh, just to, to uh, have have uh, this uh, visual. Uh, um, uh, data analysis. Uh, this is uh, also a uh, uh, figure regarding innovation ecosystem of Serbia, uh, regarding the dynamism of innovation acceptance in Serbia based on those uh, pillars, uh, pillars uh, as well. Um, at the first um, notice, uh, we can see that uh, analyzing the two countries and know, uh, knowing the um, structure of two countries and other elements that that they are um, at the first glow, glow there are uh, not many uh, uh, joint elements that can be uh, compared but we learned that um, um, from our research that a circular economy can be a good path uh, for both countries, for Serbia and for uh, Romania, to increase their results in uh, uh, innovation and uh, competitiveness uh, regarding the situation uh, which, um, um, in which Serbia uh, is not a member of um, European Union, unfortunately, and uh, um, uh, Romania has that, uh, I should say, privilege. Uh, uh, although although that difference exists, uh, Serbia has uh, some, uh, I would say, interesting projects that, uh, regarding um, uh, circular economy that can um, probably help uh, help our country to obtain some good results and to follow your country as a, a leader i should say in this in this region when it comes to a circular economy um, uh, just to conclude uh, the this um, uh, interesting results that we came uh, upon to uh, i see that uh, we saw that romania made critical green procurement and uh, agile management steps uh, to positively impact productivity uh, and that is uh, something that our country must uh, follow serbia must follow as well uh, as well uh, we have observed uh, romania in this case as a a benchmarking or as an example of good practices that we can look upon to. I think that is that is all I could say in this in this short time. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Milena. Um, okay. If there is someone who wants to to ask Milena something. If uh, 
uh, until your your uh, uh, thinking uh, about the question, uh, I'm going to, to talk a few words about Professor Milena. Uh, Professor Milena Ilich is a doctor of economic sciences, assistant professor of the Faculty of Contemporary Arts in Belgrade and Information Technology School, ITC Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, Milena is an author of 10 textbooks and editor of three uh, scientific monographs of international importance. In addition, uh, she has uh, published uh, over 120 original uh, scientific papers in international and national scientific journals, monographs, and proceedings of international and national importance. Uh, a scientific uh, field uh, within uh, which her scientific research is uh, conducted uh, refers to the um, uh, um, <laughs> um, uh, entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah. you know better. Uh -huh. Yes, I know yes better. because I, I don't know why my, my, uh, my document is like. making me feel. <laughs> yeah, the scientific field within which her scientific research is conducted refers to educational technology. AJRM, economics, circular economy, and entrepreneurship, and uh, and more. Thank you, Milena. <laughs> thank you, uh, Milena. You know this technology. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, you Milena, for uh, as well. Your uh, presentation. Uh, 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 I will leave you now uh, shortly uh, okay. to, to address the other conference, and uh, we'll be back soon. Okay. Greetings. Thank you. Thank you, Milena. Um, now, uh, looking uh, on our agenda, I can see uh, Dr. Victoria Yordaki from National Institute uh, for Economic Research, Republic of Moldova. She sent me yesterday night an email telling me that she has to be urgent. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is uh, uh, Popa Viorica, not me. I'm here. I am here. I'm oh, sorry, 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 Popa Viorica. Sorry. Uh, Popa Viorica, sorry. Um, uh, Viorica uh, is telling me uh, that he is not going to, to be with us today because he, he had to be in our country and probably uh, she's now at the border of our country or between countries, I don't know. Uh, she sent me her presentation, but because the time is running fast and it's uh, the time from Professor Roman Sperka to to present his paper. Uh, I want to know if Professor Roman is uh, ready for presentation after that. Uh, later, we will, uh, I will put the presentation of Viorica Popa. Uh, I, I saw him earlier, but he is yes? he's not with us now. Oh, 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 I see. Then in this case, I can put the, the presentation of uh, Professor Viorica Popa as scheduled. Uh, let me see. Yes. Yes. Good morning, dear colleagues. My name is Popa Verica from National Institute for Economic Research in the Republic of Moldova of Department of Financial and Monetary Research. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in the conference. Today, I come up with an important and current topic, hazardous waste management through smart digitalization. This research comes as a study conducted within the state program development of a, a mechanism for the formation and the secular economy in the Republic of Moldova. Where waste problem is quite agreed, uh, not all in the Republic of Moldova, but also worldwide, as the number of the population increases globally, so does the consummations of products that generate increases of waste. Respectively, in the Republic of Moldova, the urban population is increasing with the improvement of living standards, which is accompanied by increases in the rate of resource use and uh, a massive increases in waste that is generated from industrial, commercial, institutional sources. In fact, 
In fact, everything we buy is made from uh, national uh, resources. And what do we do with him? We buy, consume, and throw away. So the products consumed become waste in a very short time. This is also the result of human over-exploitation of natural resources. After all this uh, was ends up in the landfill, what happens? Uh, waste is mixed with uh, household waste toxic, having a major risk to public health and the environment, so the footprint on natural resources increases uh, CO2 emissions increases and climate and uh, climate change occurs. What to do this land uh, landfills contain? Simple toxic waste, which toxic substances, which are the most careful and dangerous to the environment and human health, containing heavy metals such as land. Conceptually, hazardous waste is presented in the European Con Waste Catalog, which includes the three points of view. One, the type of waste that has one of the hazardous properties in certain uh, process. Two, components to do for different types of waste that make it possible for waste to be hazardous when when it has a, a certain degree of hazard. And three properties that can make uh, waste hazardous. Currently, contemporary researchers are conceptually addressing the risk for waste that uh, can be characterized and set through the following three uh, components. Degree of has the exact houses of the waste, the uh, width uh, of exposure by which the dangerous substance passes from the source to the uh, receptor and receptor status. In the Republic of Moldova, has the uh, hazardous waste is regulated by law uh, 209, uh, 2016. Uh, on west of this law, hazardous waste is any waste that has one or more of the hazardous properties specific in annex no number three of the law. The list of wastes, including hazardous wastes, is elaborated and uh, updated uh, periodically by the Ministry of Environment and is uh, approved by the government. The properties of the waste that make is has this uh, indicated in this annex. With um, the toxic waste management process takes place through the uh, collection, transport, recovery, and uh, disposal of waste, including the supervision of this operation and the subsequent uh, maintenance and this puzzle assist, including the actions taken by a trade or broker. Some of these waste can be recycled, uh, for example, oil, solvents. Other must be stored in places specially designed for hazards waste. Uh, from, uh, from toxic uh, products uh, can be recycle uh, mostly from the products for various industries, uh, glass, metal, uh, plastics, oil, paper, um, wood, it is not. Uh, digitalization is a uh, useful and the current process in all EU, uh, uh, EU countries. This smart system allows both the citizen and local public administration to have concrete um, measurable data on the value of waste and the degree of selective collection. But uh, by placing containers with large volume correctly dimension to the number of inhabitants, allowing access only to the tents. Thanks to these platforms located in special areas, the blocks 
will be much tart and uh, tender and cleaner. An example is uh, the smart Internet of Things, Sensit, which allows the city administration to optimize uh, the distribution of containers, monitoring the label of filling and the type of the host is an easy task with the help of smart seasons. They can be installed in the, any type of uh, garbage containers and are resistant to daily use. Smart uh, sensors provide real-time monitoring of containers and are an important step in eliminating problems with spilled containers. Uh, conclusions. Hazardous waste management is a complex subject uh, consisting of several components. There is no perfect model that can be applied in any situation, but the European Union has firm principles on which to base its uh, approach to waste management that also can be applied in the Republic of Moldova. And uh, a key tool would be digitalization. Thank you. Uh, thank you also, Professor uh, Yorika Popa. Uh, now, uh, allow me to say um, a few words um, about, about Dr. Yorika Popa and about um, the institution uh, that uh, Dr. Yorika Popa uh, represents. Um, I have here all the presentations. Um, Biorika Popa has a PhD degree in economics, is a coordinator researcher at the Department of Financial and Monetary Research, National Institute for Economic Research of the Ministry of Education and uh, Research for uh, of Moldova from Chisinau. The domains of scientific interests uh, are banking and non-banking sector, implementation of strategic management within organizations, insurance and public finance, circular economy, analysis uh, of uh, hazardous waste in the Republic of Moldova. She has been a member of the team of several research projects, participating in various national and international conferences in the country and abroad uh, with presentations in her field of expertise. She is a member uh, of an international conference with a good history in VOS. And now allow me to say a few words about uh, the institution that the doctor represents. Um, uh, it's about the National Institute for Economic Research from uh, Chisinau Republic of Moldova, who is a public institution uh, of think tank which uh, deals with scientific economic research. Uh, main beneficiaries are Ministry of Education Economy, Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industry, Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, Academy of Sciences and others. Main activities are related to scientific research in economy, finance, statistics, demography, reforming of social sphere and integration of the Republic of Moldova in the world economy circuit. circuit. Former uh, uh, experience covers a wide variety of applied research on the evolution of economic and social processes in Moldova, ensuring a stable economic growth and uh, high living standards. The most important research directors are uh, economic uh, directions, sorry, are economic and financial models, mechanisms for sustainable growth, uh, business and uh, investment environment, uh, agricultural policies and uh, informational base uh, for rural development in the cons context of food safety, improvement of statistical information system according to the EU standards, as well as demographic and social development policies. Uh, personally, I liked a lot uh, and I appreciated a lot the effort of uh, uh, Professor uh, of, uh, Dr. Viorica Popa to, uh, to make uh, this presentation and uh, to make uh, her um, uh, paper also, because she has a paper also. And uh, um, we wish her all our best. 
And uh, now uh, I think uh, uh, George, uh, uh, professor, uh, uh, is with us. Professor, uh, confirm the agenda. Professor Roman Sperka is here with us. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Hello, professor. <laughs> Hello, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so I will share my presentation. Okay, so good morning once again. Uh, I'm sending greetings from Czech Republic to Romania and to the rest of the Europe and to the rest of the of the world. As I uh, can see, uh, you have also participants, for instance, for from India. So I'm sending hello. Uh, uh, I come from uh, Silesian University uh, School of Business Administration in Karvina which is uh, in, uh, located in the uh, Czech Republic. And I am working as associate professor at this um, uh, faculty. And I'm also a head of Department of Business Economics and Management. Uh, I am cooperating for some time with Professor uh, uh, Lazarovu. We are also organizing a nice conference. Uh, the last edition was uh, actually in uh, Prague in May, by, but we had also to shift ourselves to the virtual board. But we are using a, a different platform. We are running on my Microsoft Teams. So in my research, I'm uh, working with my PhD students and my research teams, mainly in uh, business data, which are mainly stemming from uh, uh, enterprise resource planning systems and different kinds of information systems and we are trying to uh, to cooperate with application sphere with different companies from our region also from from abroad and this presentation uh, is a brief introduction into into this topic uh, how to use maybe real business data <clears throat> with more value and how to get more information from the real business data uh, here on my first slide, uh, you can see a quote from uh, a well-known professor from Netherlands, Neil van der Aalst, um, who mentioned that in the last 10 minutes, in the last 10 minutes, we generated more data than from prehistoric times until 2003. So it's a really uh, big amount of data which surrounds us and uh, uh, we are not uh, not using them very much to get uh, more value from them. So we are generating e event data, um, which are coming, for instance, from browsing web pages, from refueling our cars, from taking the train or bus, from making an appointment and, and giving these dates into our calendars, from buying a coffee, from watching TV, making a phone call, paying bills, adjusting the temperature, and so on. So there is a huge series of data, of even data, which are stemming from different activities we are doing on a daily basis. For instance, we are, we are all using cell phones, and cell phones have got many, many sensors which are generating data also, for instance, here. We have camera and we are making photos, which is uh, also digital data. Uh, we are mm, making phone calls, which is mm, digital data, fingerprints. We are using Wi-Fi. We are using magnetometer, gyroscope, proximity sensors, touch screens, Bluetooth, GPS, 4G, 3G, 5G, and all these technologies uh, are generating data on a daily basis. From this is coming the notion of so-called Internet of Events. So we all know maybe uh, the first bubble on the left, Internet of People. So there are many people which are uh, present on uh, social networks like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and, and, and so on. And they are in social interactions with, with, with many people or with many organizations, and they are generating many, many kinds of events and, and also uh, many kinds of uh, digital data, which is stored somewhere. Uh, the second example is so-called Internet of Content. 
and we are generating big big data throughout uh, using internet everywhere like for instance we are browsing web pages and the companies are running different cloud applications and are generating big data which are stored for instance in data warehouses and uh, and, and in different um, data on different data disks in, on companies in companies or uh, in other um, providers um, buildings uh, we all know and we also had here some presentations about internet of things um, there are many devices which are connected throughout cloud services <coughs> with uh, with our um, with our devices uh, in homes and uh, here are companies which are producing chips we all know that we have uh, now nowadays the so-called chip crisis and it's also connected with this internet of things because for instance the chips are used in uh, car industry and everything is connected with our devices with our cell phones or, or with different remote controllers and this is all all connected to so-called internet of things and lastly we have uh, many sensors in our cell phones and, and we are having so-called so internet of places that means that there are technologies which are following us our locations and which are giving us some uh, uh, some services which are best on on our location like for using uh, like uh, for instance using google maps or apple maps or different kind of other services so this 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 all is uh, connected uh, through so-called internet of events yeah when we are talking about big data this big data i've got some uh, attributes um for instance it is that the big data is a big volume there are approximately 2.3 trillion gigabytes of data, data which is stored every day on different data warehouses. The second attribute is velocity. There are approximately 50,000 Google searches, 7,000 tweets, and 125,000 YouTube videos which are watched every second. Uh, the next attribute is variety. There is a different type. There is a different types of uh, data which is stored in these uh, data warehouses. The data could be structured, unstructured, and could stem from various data sources. And the last attribute, which is typical for big data, is discrepancy, bias-free, and trustworthy uh, data. Uh, we need to get more information from from this data. And then we have data science, uh, which is able to deal with this big data and big uh, amount of data which is stored on, on, on daily basis throughout the world. And, the, uh, and uh, the typical data scientist is able to collect, to analyze and interpret data from a variety of sources, from the social interactions, from business processes, cyber physical systems in, in production or in factories and so on. So there are four typical data science questions we have to tackle this, and that is what happened, why did it happen, what will happen, and what is the best that can be happen. So the typical questions, for instance, here you can see on this slide is how can we reduce costs? So this is the typical question for businesses which are, which are surrounding us from, from retail stores to factories, small and, small and medium-sized enterprises and so on. Why do customers have to wait so long, for instance, in some retail store? Do employees follow the, guide, the uh, guidelines? Can we predict the waiting times and how much stuff is needed tomorrow? So these are the questions which are, which are crucial for a typical uh, for a typical business. When we are in data science, there are many skills that needed to answer, uh, that are needed to answer su such simple questions. So in the center of our point is the data science, but the data scientist is dealing, for instance, with visualization of the results, with the domain knowledge, with behavioral and social sciences, with industrial engineering, that means 
or they have to know something about the technology. With system design, statistics, stochastics, data mining, machine learning, process mining, and distributed computing. So the profile of data scientists uh, is a bit of challenge and is really, uh, really complicated. We can see it in our research when we are trying to process some kind of data from companies and we, we need all these skills. So our research teams should be really uh, larger there is no, not only one one person which is able to do or to deal with all these skills. So we need to match the research team from all these skills. So the core of my presentation and the technology we are we are using in our research is process mining. So we are dealing with processes, and <clears throat> the main question here is it's uh, is at the side of the companies. It is the process stupid or or somebody else or something else. In the end, is it is the process that matters and not the data or the software. So we have a bunch of data. We have a bunch of information systems or other systems which are running in companies. But in the end, the business process is the biggest challenge. We have to ensure that the business processes are running well and correctly. So we are not interested in the, not just in the patterns and decisions, but in the whole end-to-end -end processes. Uh, so we have here some uh, examples of using this technology, of using this process mining. So the typical use cases are, what is the process that people really follow? Where are the bottleneck? Where, where are the uh, bottlenecks in my process? Where do people or machines deviate from the expected or idealized process? What are the highways in my process? What factors are influencing a bottleneck? Can we predict problem, a delay, deviation, a risk for running cases? And do we have some countermeasures? How to redesign the process organizational machine to do it right? So we are dealing with this type of data. So this is... Um, an example of data from Microsoft uh, Excel table or CSV, CSW table. And uh, when we want to do some analysis, some process mining analysis on the business data, we have to have at least these uh, elements. That means activity name, we need timestamp, we need case ID, and the most, uh, maybe the most important fact is that every row is an event. So we need this type of data to proceed with some kind of process mining analysis. So there is a lot of work to, to have this type of data because not, not each company is storing this type of data in these in this patterns in their information system. So when we have some cooperation with companies, we have to convince them to change their, uh, their behavior and to change their settings in their information systems in order to get this type of data. So when we have that, that type of data, we are able to design process models. Here is an example of process model, which is following so-called trace from activities which are stored in these log events. So we are able to work with this type of process models, which consists of activities in the rectangles, which con uh, consist of events, the circles, and uh, we have there also decision points, which are adding a kind of a logic to the process models. So we are able to transform the log events data to this type of process models, and then we can work the, with these process models. So the way how to process uh, the data and to get these process models is to use a so-called alpha algorithm, which was invented in by the professor van der Aust I mentioned on the first slide. And with the use of this alg uh, algorithm, uh, which is a kind of a complicated thing, we are able to process different types of the process models, as you can see here on the slide on the right side. So this was the introduction to the process mining. And to conclude, 
Process mining is really exciting topic, both from a practical and scientific point of view. It en enables businesses to understand their processes, which is critical to business success. Process mining tools make data extraction from different systems um, and they are, they are making it uh, much more easier. They are ena enabling that follow uh, non-standard procedures be to become visible. This brings the whole organization to the same level of understanding about processes and pave the way to process standardization. The process mining tools automate process performance data collection. This enables KPIs like SLAs, time to resolution, first time write to be continuously monitored, which allows process owners to continuously improve processes. Using these event logs, uh, process mining tools derive how distinct cases are handled and how operational decisions are made. And we are also observing improved customer experience thanks to fast delivery. But here is the last thing in this presentation. On the right side, you can see that the imagination of an ideal process in organization is to have a straightforward process composed from the activity of uh, composed from activities which are in se sequential order. But the process reality is that we have many distant cases which are different from the reality. And we have to analyze and to pursue the process owners and the employees in companies that the reality is a, real, is a really different thing and they have to make some changes, which are in many cases not very pleasant, to to get the process to be ideal. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. You are very good in what you've done. I, I, I hope you, that you know that. And very charismatic also. You are very good at this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Professor Sperka, thank you very much again for joining us. I have um, a question for you. Um, if you think that uh, in the Internet of Senses, uh, there are ways to assess the collected data. Well, so as you can see, you can have these log events. That means you have a data which are based or describing the events. So uh, we, are, we, we personally are dealing with data which are now describing the human behavior, but it is possible to use it also in Internet of Things area because then you can observe the behavior of machines, the behavior of devices. So the main point is to have uh, this type of data in this structure with this uh, minimal, uh, mi uh, minimum uh, elements. And then you can do this analysis and you can you can uh, get some value from information also from inter Internet of Things. Thank you very much. Thanks again for uh, your great uh, research and uh, hope we will continue our cooperation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, now, um, Victoria, I see you here. Victoria Ardaki from the National Institute for Economic Research, Republic of Moldova who is going to uh, talk with us about smart city development. Uh, Victoria, it's your turn now. Okay. Hello to everybody. Um, just, just let me uh, put my presentation. Uh, sorry, I will try once again. Take your time, Victoria. Yes. Okay. yes. Uh, Is it seen? Yes. Very, okay. very good. Great. Great. Okay. Just uh, so. Um, uh, what a uh, nice you. presentation. Wow, thank I you. like it. <laughs> thank you very much. So uh, in our, our, 
I will pass directly to my presentation, not to um, to lose time. So in our country, the concept of smart city implementation is that the incipient way. That's why for us researchers, it is an actual topic. So in 2020, our city hall, our Kishinev City Hall, signed the agreement with the National Association of ICT Companies on the digitalization of public services and development of smart city solutions. So, uh, solutions. So, the municipality set as objective the improvement of ICT abilities within the process of development of smart city concept. Yes, on local level, we have some good initiatives, but there isn't any strategy on smart city concept development. That is why I will repeat for us researchers, analysis of best practices and analysis of this concept is an actual topic for in order to for us uh, to give give some useful recommendations for local authorities. So my, I will pass to my uh, presentation. So um, um, cities attract perfect hubs uh, for innovation. With a high concentration of resources, capital, data and talents, uh, uh, spread, uh, which are spread over a relatively small geographic area, cities have a perfect position to drive a global transition towards a circular eco economy. Implementing the circular economy in cities through the smart city concept can bring important economic, social and environmental benefits for our community. Thus, smart city concept is getting an increasing interest for municipalities, representing one of the solutions for solving various city problems starting from urbanization problems excessive density transport problems and ending with environmental uh, challenges uh, to conceptualize such a transition so the term of smart city is often used this concept is interpreted broadly however in any approach the key role is assigned to information and telecommunication technologies that help ensure that current processes of city life um, go uh, through uh, within the, uh, in a pace with the citizens business and authorities uh, requirements so within the process of smart city development, ICT is used to optimize urban processes and this optimization is usually achieved by combining various elements and participants into an interactive intelligence system, the driver of which is the technology of the Internet of Things. A big part of this ICT framework is an intelligent network of connected objects and machines which supposes data transmission using wireless technology and the cloud. So cloud-based Internet of Things applications receive, analyze and manage data in real time to help local authorities, private entities and citizens make better decisions that improve quality of life. Citizens engaged, in fact, within smart city ecosystems in various ways by using smartphones and mobile devices and connected cars and homes. As a result, pairing devices and data with the city's physical infrastructure and services can cost, cut costs and improve sustainability. At the same time, by means of Internet of Things, communities can improve energy distribution, streamline trash collection, decrease traffic congestion, and so on. So. Uh, Digital technologies, artificial intelligence and blockchain can accelerate and maximize the impacts of environmental measures. Transforming a municipality that has evolved organically for hundreds of years into a smart interconnected ecosystem represents a problematic challenge. At the same time, it demonstrates a significant opportunity for implementing circular economy and smart city solutions for uh, the benefit of its citizens. So as a result of the above mentioned, the goals of the smart city notion can be summarized as shown in this figure, achieve a sustainable development, increase the quality of life of its citizens, improve the efficiency of the city as a system. Thus, the circular economy we see uh, can provide new, more impactful solutions to the smart city through, and we see, first of all, through new mobility, 
This means smart mobility that offers the most efficient, clean and equitable transport network for people, goods and data. From a technological point of view, the basic solutions are advanced GPS systems, connected and unmanned vehicles, management, etc. These systems would mean fewer, better utilized cars with such positive effects like less congestion, less um, land and investment committed to parking and roads. Development of a smart city transport system, the emergence of new transport services and modes of transport, traffic control and management systems, various path calculations, apples improve the traffic situation and increase in fact mobilities. Uh, next, it's improving energy efficiency. So smart cities and sustainable communities are already carrying toward a low carbon future. You, you know that all. A core part of that drive is locally derived power. Transition to the use of smart energy through smart distributed grids, smart control systems, etc., and energy efficient technologies through smart lamps, smart lighting, etc., will lead to savings in electricity consumption. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, uh, the transition to a new technological package will lead to significant changes in the electric power market of cities. Um, next, it's uh, smart environmental solutions. What does it mean? Uh, uh, the package of technological solutions to provide better environmental protection for smart cities includes, for example, systems for, systems for monitoring environmental parameters and systems of control and monitoring of transport load, allowing to reduce the level of uh, hydrocarbons and solutions in the field of smart waste management. For example, sensors for monitoring the level of garbage solutions in the field of smart sorting and recycling of waste, smart connected garbage tracks. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, we can mention here a, a project in uh, San Francisco, which forms prices for city parking depending on the level of demand at a particular time. Uh, which led not only to a drop in the average cost of a parking space, and, but to a greater accessibility of uh, parking spaces and uh, a 30% a reduction in greenhouse uh, gas um, emissions. Uh, so uh, many voices are supporting the idea of the post-pandemic economic recovery of the local economy in the base of the donut model. What does it mean? This donut model was um, elaborated by the British economist Kate Rayworth from the Oxford University. And um, this model was design, uh, designed as a guide to achieving defined prosperity in terms of the balance between the human being and the environment. And it can be applied even um, at the at a city or a, at a at a region a country so in um 2020, Amsterdam became the first city in the world to undertake a post-pandemic reconstruction of the local economy on the, model, on, on the model of the donut. So what would it mean for the city of, uh, to take into account the health of the planet? Yes, first of all, it should reduce carbon emissions. Um, uh, so, in 2020, the municipality of Amsterdam launched a 2020-2025 Amsterdam Circular Strategy with, with considering uh, these um, donut uh, principles. So, um, the strategy sh sets short-term goals of becoming 100% circular and climate neutral by 2050. Um, so uh, through this strategy, uh, Amsterdam aims to reduce food waste by 50% by 2030. Amsterdam will implement stricter sustainability requirements in construction tenders. Uh, so um, uh, the city of Amsterdam has various policy instruments at its disposal to guide the transition to a circular economy. These includes, you see here, I will not mention them all, regulatory instruments, economic instruments and soft instruments. 
So next, I want to give you some of the successful examples that are implemented in Amsterdam within the smart city and circular economy principles. So first, it's the project vehicle to grid technology that enables the electric cars to be used as temporary batteries, for example, to power households. Additionally, by combining multiple batteries, accumulated capacity can become large enough to effectively prevent unbalance in the electricity grid. So after two years of running, uh, uh, there are beautiful results. For example, the household increased the energy independence or zero emission energy autonomy from 35 to 65 percent. Next, it's... Uh, um, uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam has a record number of public electric vehicle charging stations uh, and there are many social uh, applications available to help uh, to find uh, uh, those charging points or a parking space. Smart mobility even goes off-road and into the water with developments such as robot, a futuristic and autonomous robot boat that um, uh, with multitasks as a taxi, bridge, flo fo floating stage waste collector and freight transporter so uh, it doesn't end with mobility here uh, so um, batteries no longer suited for using cars I also used to power entire football stadiums or smart office buildings uh, so in addition there are plenty of initiatives making the city's roads a greener place uh, next um, uh, for example um, um, Amsterdam has ranked fifth in the 2021 Urban Mobility Readiness Index. Uh, so um, Amsterdam scored highly in infrastructure and connectivity, system efficiency and innovation. It placed second globally in the newly introduced Sustainable Mobility Sub-Index, which evaluates how well cities are promoting green methods of transportation and making sure their infrastructure is resilient to the risk of climate change. So also Amsterdam is one of the recipients of the 2021 Go Smart Award for its smart city solution that detects street garbage with artificial intelligence. So the artificial intelligence application automatically maps objects and identifies garbage on the street. Uh, once garbage is detected, the information will be shared with the Amsterdam Garbage Management Services for them to pick up, helping the, thus the municipality keep the streets of Amsterdam even cleaner than before. So the Urban Object Detection Kit allows streets and other aspects of the public environment to be scanned with machine learning technologies. It uses smartphones linked to vehicles with an application that generates pictures. This system can be attached to service vehicles such as garbage trucks, parking scanners and maintenance cars, thus allowing for large scale deployment. So um, after devising short term and crisis management responses uh, related to social distances, um, cities uh, uh, started designing long-term recovery, uh, recovery strategies for more inclusive green and smart cities. Many cities are already introducing investment projects to pay economic recovery with the environmental sustainability with an emphasis on clean forms of urban mobility and energy efficiency. So, um, however, the recovery from the crisis should be a shared responsibility across all levels of national authorities for a good transition to a low carbon and climate resilient economy. The governments, in fact, should use climate change commitments and circular economy practices as opportunities to expand a new paradigm of economic development. So um, in the last, I would like to mention that post COVID-19 recovery policy packages may include the combination of the following uh, instruments. Extended uh, producer responsibility schemes applied for the whole supply chain and which will favor business model centered around the product life extension, remanufacturing and recovery processes, incentives to develop innovation activities and the creation of local research and development capabilities based on inter-industry collaboration, uh, 
incentives for the introduction of resource efficient and carbon neutral or carbon positive technologies to reduce environmental impacts, promotion of eco industrial parks and sustainable business areas to promote knowledge experience across activities and the sharing of circular activities. Of course, in the end, I would like to say that, uh, of course, um, local authorities need um, to, uh, to foresee the necessary budget because all these applications usually, usually cost um, and uh, nothing is for free of charge. So, um, in fact, uh, uh, local authorities should uh, collaborate uh, with startups um, with different stakeholders to implement in practice the objectives set in the urban development strategies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victoria. Your presentation was great. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Question. Uh, all the presentations today were was very good. Y yes, yes, Professor Isako, please proceed. Hi, it was very nice presentation. Yes, indeed. I have a question to Victoria. So, uh, so I'm from Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyz Republic. It's one of the former Soviet Union countries. My question is uh, smart home, right? Is it quite expensive? And uh, for example, can I build smart homes in my country? Is it possible to build in your own country? It is much expensive, right? It is, I mean, I'm asking the, the practical way. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much for your um, question. In fact, yes, of course, as I mentioned, all these apples are um, expensive. But if local authorities will um, smartly collaborate, for example, with the universities, the technological departments of universities, several startups, uh, I think uh, they can be attracted uh, uh, different minds. I am not telling that uh, they should be free of charge or um, not expensive, but in fact, um, a smart um, dialogue with stakeholders can bring um, um, different uh, results. Uh, here can be uh, um, attracted different public-private partnerships. Um, there can be attracted uh, um, um, foreign assistance, donors. Uh, um, so um, I think if, first of all, the municipality should uh, uh, elaborate the, idea, the strategy with objectives uh, and afterwards uh, 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 needed stakeholders should be searched to implement the ideas in the short, medium and long term uh, uh, perspective. You are very good at English, Victoria, also. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really? <laughs> You impressed me. You all impressed me today. In fact, more more than I expected. And thank you. I know that you are very good, but you are better than expect. You know, expected. So now I'm going to tell a few words about uh, Victoria Yordaki, Dr. Victoria Yordaki, uh, who has a PhD in economics and uh, is a coordinator researcher at the Department of Financial and Monetary Research, National Institute uh, for Economic Research of the Ministry of Education and Research of uh, Moldova from Chisinau. The domains of scientific interest uh, of her are circular economy, cluster associations, uh, illegal uh, financial flows, international financial flows, and financial markets. Uh, she is a member of uh, the teams of several research projects, national expert for the evaluation of educational programs, uh, as well as a member of scientific committees at the international scientific conferences. Uh, now, uh, there is someone else who, who wants uh, to ask uh, Victoria something. Uh, because I'm looking, uh, yes. I would like to ask a question. Yep. Uh, ask you a question, Victoria. Well, uh, uh, what do you think by um, uh, harnessing uh, self-driving cars on the roads? Uh, would uh, uh, their deployment uh, lead to a congestion, to an increased congestion of the of the roads, or 
uh, on the contrary, uh, they will uh, um, manage to coordinate themselves so that the, the traffic uh, will be better optimized. In fact, for example, if you, are speak, if you are speaking about the foreign experience, the Amsterdam succeeded. I am not sure if this will bring uh, the same results in Chisinau, uh, but uh, the foreign experience showed good results, that in fact the congestion reduced. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, there is uh, any more. There are any more questions? Uh, because uh, I, I was looking at the conference agenda and uh, I was seeing uh, now uh, Professor uh, Wilfred uh, Isioma Opere from the University of Johannesburg, and uh, I talked uh, with uh, him. Um, yesterday and uh, he told me that uh, he will be able to be with us uh, it's about 3 30 romanian hour not uh, this hour uh i i couldn't make changes to the agenda because the agenda was already made so um, uh, professor will will be with us after uh, 3 30 o'clock today uh i don't know if, if professor uh, thomas klistik is uh, with us right now i i know george no, he isn't yet, but uh, I think um, we, we can allow the, the uh, people who is somehow... Natania, I saw Natania, who is uh, uh, um, the next one, Natania Mayer from University of Johannesburg out in South Africa. Hi, Natania. Good afternoon. Uh, are you ready? Are you ready to, yes. to present? Okay, great, okay. Natania. Thank you. I just need to figure out how to share my screen. Yeah? Yes, I, I, I can uh, help you, Natania. Just... Next to the hand, there is a square with uh, an arrow. And uh, from there, you can uh, choose uh, all the screen. After that, you have to push uh, uh, yes. your uh, uh, screen from the monitor. And after that, to allow to send the image to us. Yeah, I know how to do it, but with for some reason with a Google Meet, it doesn't show all my screen. So let me just figure that out. We did a presentation last week in India, and it was the same struggle. So let no, no, no. It, it's really it's not very hard. Uh, please. Uh... It's not showing the screen I want to share. That's the issue. I'm just only seeing. Please choose the, the first, share all the screen. The first option from the menu. And after that, you have to push. Uh, yes, great, great, Natania, great. Okay, but it's not sharing my presentation. It's sharing no, the not rest. yet, not yet. I, I, I will uh, see you how. Okay. Oh, 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 great. That's great. Okay. Yes, <laughs> great, Thank Natania. You. Okay, so firstly, thank you very much for the opportunity to, let me just check my time, to be here today and this great initiative and I can see by the number of people and specifically all the wonderful topics that's on the agenda that this is really something I think that's worthwhile discussing and presenting and um, I think I see a good future in research on this specific topic. So thank you very uh, much. Take your time, Natania. You don't have to be in a hurry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so firstly, thank you very much for the invitation. It is a pleasure for me here today to share a little bit of my research. And in actual fact, this is some planned research I have. So um, I'm opening the invitation here. If anyone is interested to, to share this project with us, you're welcome to contact me at the end. Um, so as I said, this is a project that we're still working on. And I'm, I'm very excited to for next year to see you know where we're heading and the results that we will be getting. So the title of um, the presentation is the importance of the whole 4 IR or industry 4.0. I think there's different definitions for it. And the SME's readiness for this change in business models and how they actually perceive this whole um, change in how we do things. So just a little bit of an agenda of what we will, will be following. I'll look at introduction, then some just a brief overview of the revolutions, what is 4 IR, the problem statement, which variables we plan to use in the study. 
why is it important for businesses and how can they sort of link to these opportunities. And then as I said, the current project partners, I'll just introduce and um, then open the floor if there's anyone to who would want to join us in future. So just a little bit of an introduction. Um, I think we all know that even before the onset of the whole COVID-19, 4IR and artificial intelligence and all this, um, a lot of this has sort of accelerated because of the fact that now people couldn't be allowed to go to work or a lot of people couldn't be allowed to, to, to just act normally like we used to do before COVID. And I know um, you might have seen in the news that we are the winners of the new variant. So I think there's another wave coming for us. And I know in, in Europe, there's already some lockdown restrictions. So I think, and I'm pretty sure that this whole evolution of 4IR and digitalizing things and just changing the way we, we, we look at current business models is still not over. Um, because this whole pandemic is, is still going to be with us for quite some time. And I think it's forcing people and businesses to think differently on how to communicate and um, sell their products and service. So as we already know, um, econom economic sectors and a lot of component, components of government and communities are all affected by Industry 4.0 and the whole movement. I just heard a little bit of the presentation before now of, I think, Victoria. And it is very clear that even in the smart cities and the whole um, concept of changing the way things are done, also from a government perspective is very important. So I think this um, research has got two sides. It's not just to look at the importance from a business perspective, but then also definitely from a governmental perspective and how policies and the way governments apply um, us with the needed services we, we, we need, obviously, how this will also be affected and changed. And I think a lot of developed countries are seeing this at a higher level already than in some developing countries where we might be lagging a little bit with um, technology in, in the whole way services are provided. Then I think we all know SMMEs and entrepreneurship are seen as key drivers for economic growth and development. Um, especially more so in emerging economies like in South Africa where I'm from, then um, current governments should create an enabling environment for businesses to be successful and therefore there should be a synergy among these stakeholders. So there should be a synergy between businesses and um, government and the community and then this, if this whole 4IR concept can be intertwined between all of them, this could be you know, very useful for for the progression of economies in the future. Then both SMEs and um, or entrepreneurs and the government's readiness are vital for accelerated economic growth and specifically regional economic development in urban and rural areas. Um, on a regional level, local businesses and governments need to incorporate and form partnerships for success and also streamlining of this coordination between all of these technological advancements. Then um, this is especially important within the 4IR environment, which is an extremely dynamic environment. And I think we're seeing a lot of progression and a lot of advancement and maybe some countries and economies are on different levels with this whole advancement. But as I said, there's definitely a movement that this should be incorporated more within um, the whole business concept and business models. Um, and therefore, the readiness in terms of 4IR is important for economic growth and development. And um, in this process, the government should attempt to remove barriers and strengthen drivers of 4IR and innovation. So just an overview, and I think most of you probably know this, um, the first three industrial revolutions brought us some of this thing. So the first one, mechanized production, factory systems, steam power, improved uh, water power, speed efficiency, and of course, uh, scalability to a certain extent. As we moved into the second industrial revolution, electric power, mass production and distribution, the production of iron and steel, use of coal, railways, modern ship industry, etc. Then the third one started the sort of touching on the whole digitalization of technology. We started seeing some more sophisticated computers, internet, big data, and obviously the beginning of the internet of things. And now we are in the fourth industrial revolution and many are already saying that the fifth one is showing its head and already starting in some places. 
So what is for IR or as I said, industry 4.0? So previously industrial revolutions improved manufacturing where a lot of um, reliance was still on human involvement. Whereas the fourth one obviously looked at the whole computerization of manufacturing, connecting machines, work pieces and systems, businesses which can create intelligent networks um, along the entire value chain um, of the process. And these changes also affect um, everyone today, but as I said, it has a significant impact on business models and the way people um, tend to uh, look at traditional ways of doing business. Okay, so as I said, this is a study that we're still in, in process of, so we're busy collecting the data at the moment. So the whole pro problem statement or the reason we, we try or we are trying to get this data to, to, to do this research is, um, as I mentioned, there's a new growing field in this analysis of the whole readiness, barrier, barriers and drivers of 4IR. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has dis disrupted the way we live and um, especially in our daily lives and the way we do business and also the way in which governments provide services in some sectors. Um, the pandemic has accelerated the need for 4IR and new innovative technologies. This disruption and rapid change is, is how things are done, have affected all SMEs and entrepreneurs, no matter which economic sector and business trade you are in. And then the final research question is um, how applicable to this future study, what is the readiness levels of SME entrepreneurs and government for using 4IR and also to look at the barriers and the drivers in this specific situation. So we've included several variables in our um, questionnaire that's currently being, um, the data is currently being collected in the several countries that's partners already. So firstly, we're looking at entrepreneurial orientation. So what is risk taking proactiveness and the innovative levels of these businesses? Um, and then, as I said, we're looking at small, medium enterprises because a lot of larger businesses tend to be already more digitalized and more into this whole um, in technology advancement than maybe smaller businesses because the whole COVID thing forced smaller businesses into this field that maybe in some areas they might not have been ready to, to enter already. Um, then we're looking specifically at the digitalization strategy of businesses. So we are measuring what um, level their digitalization strategy is at and if they even have one. Um, so there we're asking questions like, for example, our company has implemented a digitalization strategy. Um, we communicated this with our employees and staff. The digital strategy of our company has a significant influence on existing and operating business models. And for example, um, is the strategy evaluated and adapted on a, on a continuous basis? Then we also um, are looking to get some information on the inclination that these businesses actually have towards technology. Um, because as I said, many of them were sort of forced into this whole new transition of doing things in a more digital way and um, they might not be ready. So we are trying to measure their readiness and also which drivers do they feel are most important. Sorry, if you hear something, we've got a thunderstorm here. So it's thunder and lightning all around me. <laughs> um, so the drivers, what drivers are forcing these four IR technologies, or maybe not forcing, but advancing these technologies in the specific businesses. Then obviously, as with anything, there's barriers. So we are looking at which barriers are sort of hindering the use of four IR in the small and medium enterprises then priorities and current usage. Some might um, tend to want to still implement some of these technologies. So we are looking at the prioritization of this and then also measuring the current usage um, that some of these small businesses, small and medium enterprises already are using some of these technologies in their current business. And then just a few um, variables that, that, that we're gonna play around a little bit with. So the technology readiness index, because the literature says that if, if um, people, or in this case, we're measuring companies, if they are more um, ready for this technology, they would advance easier. Um, if they are more reluctant to introduce these measures, it would take them longer. 
then also the level of business attachments, and then lastly, trust in technology, because I think um, a lot of people, and maybe this might be in some cases a lot of older business owners, companies that's been traditionally doing things the same way for many years, um, they might not have this trust in technology that um, we actually want at this level to accept all of these new technologies and um, things into the business. Because I think all of us at the end of the day, we remain human and we don't always like change. And sometimes change is for the better, sometimes it's not. So we want to measure if the um, readiness and trust of technology has an impact on the other variables that we are including in the study. So why is this important? What opportunities can businesses sort of get from um, jumping onto this bandwagon and introducing more technological advancements and um, manufacturing processes that digitalized and all of these things? So firstly, um, this whole thing of 4IR and digitalization has raised our global economy and income levels. Um, it can improve the quality of life. It opens up larger markets for businesses via online shopping, digital wallets, etc. a lot of online platforms. So previously where a small business could only um, access a small market because it was face-to-face -face and the traditional brick and mortar business models, now they have a whole bigger market and that they can actually access, obviously with some disadvantages as well, but that's one of the advantages. Automization of jobs has improved productivity. Um, I think the whole procurement, sales, uh, supply chain and telecommunication has significantly reduced the cost um, and improved the bottom line of companies uh, that's implementing this on a, on a productive and effective manner. And also in some cases, employees um, do less manual tasks or they're less manually task orientated. Thus, some of them can concentrate more on higher problem-solving skills within the specific business. And then higher creativity of staff members because of this whole innovative environment that they are actually in. Just some more opportunities that I think can, can actually um, be accessed through uh, in sort of embracing this whole digitalization within companies. So as I said, it also opens new doors for new markets and ec economic um, opportunities, specifically regarding things like the gig economy, for example. Um, I think most of us during some stage of this COVID, we sort of got uh, acquainted with this whole remote working thing. So this opens a whole new dimension for glo global online platforms. I mean, you can now hire someone who lives in another country and benefit from that person's um, skills without him moving to another country with this whole digitalization um, era we've sort of moved into. Uh, improved education and access to information. Again, uh, I think this whole COVID thing has advanced the way we see that you don't have to physically be in a venue to get education. Things can happen online. And I think we even see it with our networks as professionals in, in academia. Um, previously, you know, if, if, if we wanted to discuss a new project, you waited until you flew to a conference where you met those people and then you discussed it. Now, I think we're so much more easier just to quickly arrange an online meeting, even shared um, folders like Dropbox, Google Drops. I think this is things that I never used so much like I do now. So again, this whole pandemic, although negative in most cases, did actually bring some positives um, to, to the forefront. Um, then artificial intelligence, automation of self-driving, reduced, oh, there's a lot of advantages. I'm not gonna go into all of them. So I think the main thing is, 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 is to try and um, investigate, you know, if businesses, how ready they are for this whole 4IR transition we're going in. And, and we have a lot of countries that will be participating in. So we'll also be measuring the levels of different countries. Maybe some might be a little bit more advanced, some you know are still not there yet. So that's also some things that we will be looking at. So as I said, here some of the countries that's already involved, busy collecting data. So Slovakia, Hungary, um, Germany, Poland, uh, Estonia, and then ourselves. We're also currently busy with the uh, Indian University and the uh, um, American University to see if they want to be on board. And as I said, um, we welcome any other country who also uh, would benefit from maybe joining this um, international team with this research and 
Um, we've already dis developed the questionnaire. As I said, some of these countries are already collecting data. So um, that in a nutshell, that's my presentation and was actually just informing and telling a little bit more about my own research. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you a lot, Natanya. Um, you are great, more than great. And your English is very, very good. <laughs> A few words about Natanya uh, um, as uh, you are thinking about addressing her some questions. Uh, Natanya Mayer is an associate professor in the Department of Business Management in the College of Business and Economics, uh, University of Johannesburg out in South Africa. She is part of the, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, please, uh, Entrepreneurship Education Chair uh DAJT NRF Sarki yeah. Education Chair. I, I don't know how to pronounce Almost it. Almost great. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> uh her research focuses on uh, entrepreneurial and economic related topics, and she's also an editor, editorial board and scientific committee member, as well as a reviewer for several national and international journals. And you are very good on what you do. <laughs> Uh, now, questions for Natania, please. Uh, hello, Natania. I have a question. Whether um, um, crowdsourcing and uh, the gig economy, in fact, uh, do not lead to uh, some sort of uh, precarization of um, um, of uh, people uh, taking the tasks, so let's say, uh, um, short-time entrepreneurs. So the question, the basic question is whether in fact uh, some um, uh, uh, new platforms um, uh, leading to uh, segmentation of the tasks um such as uh, uh crowdsourcing and the uh, gig economy uh, do not lead in fact uh, to a, a precarization of uh, uh of the people involved in such tasks yeah um that's correct yes i i think at the end of the day with anything there's advantages and negative aspects so some of these things um might definitely lead to some positive aspects within businesses and as I said, it's, it's, it's research in progress, so there's quite a lot of things we're measuring. So hopefully we'll have better answers when we actually collect the data to see that how these businesses sort of um, assume these different concepts of 4IR and like, like you mentioned now, actually has an impact on um, the business and then also on the employees at the end of the day. Well, in fact, my question was referring to uh, independent contractors. Yeah. So, yeah. So as I said, we our our study will only look at SME owners and their concepts. So um, perhaps it could be interesting to also look at independent contractors because there might be some services outsourced that's not done in the company, and that's also one of the things we we are actually looking at. Yes, but the environment tends to be. Uh, hyper competitive and uh, uh, especially in the gig economy i saw that in new york uh, uh, in uh, in the these situations of uh, gig economy platforms uh, there are a lot of uh, people involved uh, these independent contractors that uh, tend to overcompete uh, yeah. themselves and, and thus they their uh, affairs uh, uh, go low and low, go and lower and lower and uh, so the, uh, somehow uh, uh, such uh, undertakings uh, might uh, go to some sort of uh, precarization. So that, that was my point. Yeah, no, no, I agree because of this uh, in, in enlarged market, obviously the, the competition is, is much stronger which could be positive for some because some people might then advance the way they do to be in the lead of this, um, you know, to have a competitive advantage over the others. But obviously it can also be a negative for, for some people. So, um, yeah, it's also a point I'll definitely take into consideration. Thank you so much. 
Thanks, George. Uh, please, Natania, send me uh, your presentation from today. And uh, hi, I'm going to look for the partners for your project. <laughs> Thank you, Natania. What, what about Daniel? Daniel is going to be with us today also, no? Yeah, it's a bit later. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Natania, I also want to congratulate you. I wrote also on the chat. Uh, but um, also to contribute a little to the debate, the previous debate, because it's not only competition nowadays. Mostly we have to look for collaborative hmm. and such kind of platform and partnership are really a proof that this is the way we are developing for, for the future. The future is bright from my point of view, based mostly on cooperation and uh, from sharing to caring and i will definitely be happy together with uh, my team to cooperate and for sure with all the other partners including those participating to this conference thank you very much good luck thank you marta uh, you professor uh, marta suchu is a distinguished professor in our country from the Academy of Economic Study, Bucharest, Romania. Uh, she has a lot, a lot of experience and great, great projects. So uh, thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, and a high willingness to cooperate indeed. Learning from everybody that was all my life. And I love people and I enjoy cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also. There is someone else who wants to, to ask questions to Natania? I, I have a suggestion, can I? Yes. Actually, uh, I'm listening every single presentation until now, and uh, there are so interesting points, that, but uh, how can we uh, get the presentations if you want? Is there any this kind of chance? Maybe we can create uh, some kind of Facebook, uh, research group, something like that. Is it like, is that possible? Uh, actually, fact, this is a suggestion for the Elena mostly. Yes, Professor Isakov. Uh, me and Natanya, and uh, I think uh, other members around here are members also of a Renet Society. Mm. And uh, this society uh, was established, I think, a few years ago from uh, a good friend of us from Poland. And uh, we are over there, I think, uh, uh, a lot of professors from a lot of universities. And I think maybe you should be a member of Renet Society. Or I, am, I was uh, thinking today and yesterday in creating my own, uh, uh, you know, uh, networking. Uh, yes, professor from uh, the Zoe Institute from Italy is now uh, with us. And uh, I was thinking about creating maybe our own uh, networking uh, group. Uh, after this conference, I'm going to talk with George about this and I'm going to, uh, to respond to you. Uh, you have my uh, email. Uh, I have your addresses also. Uh, I know both of you. Uh, I know. Uh, that, yes, George. Sorry. No, uh, sorry, Elena. Well, we can uh, do something like that. Uh, we can simply uh, share all of the presented papers to the entire pool of participants. If they agree with this. Why not? We do not publish them or somehow, somehow in, a, in a, some certain way. We publicize them uh, in good faith. Yes, uh, Elisa is uh, also uh, telling us that uh, she is interested also. Uh, yes, of course, uh, we, we're going to think about it and uh, we are going to uh, write me on my email and uh, I, I, I'm going to think about something. Yes, Elisa. Uh, now, uh, looking at the agenda, I uh, I uh, see Professor uh, Adam Balczarzak from your University of Warmia and Mazuri, Poland. 
uh, are you with us? I, I saw Professor a little bit earlier, but I don't know if uh, he is with us right now. Uh, now um, I see here uh, Professor uh, Stefano Amodio. Alexandra, are you with us? Do you know something about Professor Stefano Amodio? Uh, I know uh, that Professor Stefano Amodio is in a, a working visit in uh, Bulgaria this uh, uh, week. And uh, I, I don't know where uh, he might be right now. Uh, probably he'll going to be with us as soon as he can. I am seeing here also Katarina Valaskova, who is a program for uh, two o'clock. Are you ready, Katarina, to to share with us your paper? Uh, well, nice to meet you all. Yes, nice to meet you. with, with uh, connecting with uh, the, turning on the sound, but now I think it is working. Okay. Yes. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me for this conference. I would like to share my presentation. Just give me a second. Okay, can you see yes, the presentation? Yes, Catherine, it works. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So for today, I would like to present uh, some interesting study which is devoted to earnings management phenomenon, which is also the project uh, that my department and uh, our department and the people from our department are focusing on for, for several years. We are trying to explain this interesting phenomenon which is devoted to the financial reports and the way enterprises are reporting their financial statements and we are trying to use specific models enabling to see if the enterprises are trying are, or are manipulating the earnings in uh, their financial reports. Uh, it should be said that this kind of manipulation is the legal one and we are still talking about some principles uh, with manipulation uh, of earnings that are used uh, in the legal form and uh, usually are also accepted by the national authorities. So to start the presentation, there is just some basic statement about what we are just going to talking about. So earnings management can be defined as the use of various accounting techniques, which are aimed at portraying the financial status of an enterprise in the best possible way. There are several ways or several forms how the, uh, earnings of enterprises can be reported and the most used ones are equal earnings management principles, real earnings management principles and creative accounting. Uh, this topic or the topic of earnings management and the use of different methods and techniques to see uh, if uh, the enterprises are trying to manipulate the financial reports is um, not so old because the first models which were uh, presented um, uh, for uh, scientific audience were published in the 80s or 90s. So this trend or this phenomenon was not so uh, known as, for example, the prediction of uh, financial uh, health of enterprises, which is uh, can be said um, one aspect of earnings management phenomenon. And that's why um, we usually try to build also some background, what everything was searched, uh, what is the main focus and interest of the authors which are devoted uh, or which uh, focus their research in the similar field. So um, just to present the interesting topics which are closely correlated with the earnings management phenomenon, we use the voice viewer to present the basic trends which are connected with this kind of uh, manipulation in financial reports. So it can be said that uh, usually there are some incentives uh, or um, mean from the macroeconomic or mi uh, microeconomic aspects which can uh, be very important for enterprises to have or to maintain their position 
on the market and to be able to be competitive. And uh, those are the figure um, displays all the important fields which are closely related to the earnings management phenomenon. It should be said that the bigger the, uh, the, bigger the circle, the more important uh, the factor in the phenomenon of the earnings management and especially in the research devoted to the earnings management phenomenon. But what is the main aim of the research we are concentrating on is the investigation of this earnings management phenomenon in the conditions of the Central European countries. Because it should be said that this phenomenon it was uh, established in uh, American uh, countries um, following the specific accounting standards, which are generally not uh, uh, so um, uh, popular in these European conditions because there are different accounting standards used in different parts of the world. And that's why we are trying to use the American models and uh, apply them in other conditions. And based on the results, we try to find if the enterprises in the given conditions are using uh, these earning management practices. And based on the results, we would like to form the model which should be um, appropriate for the European conditions. Uh, to make the research, uh, we are trying to we are trying to collect the information, the financial reports of uh, enterprises because uh, we need uh, several um, financial information um, from the financial reports to be able to calculate the models. And this research is based on the data sample of uh, uh, more than 8,000 enterprises from the Visegrad environment um, consisting uh, from the data of uh, consisting the data sample of enterprises from Slovak, Czech, Polish, and Hungarian environment. Uh, in this research, we use the modified Jones model, which is one of the first models presented for the researchers and for the uh, for the uh, basic principles of uh, using uh, these earnings management calculations. And this model is based on the calculation of discretionary accruals, which are then used as the specific indicator of uh, uh, manipulation with earnings. Uh, just for the illustration, here is the uh, basic information about this model, how it is calculated and what everything should be included in the calculation. So, we need uh, primarily the information about the total assets of the enterprises, about the uh, revenues, about the re payable receivables, about the tangible and intangible assets, about the inventories, payables, depreciation, and so on and so on. Um, there are maybe 25 models which were formed around the world, and each of them is based on different important financial indicators. Uh, so, this model was applied also in this Visegrad environment and we would like and we would and we tried to portray if there are any statistically significant differences across the countries because we would like to uh, specify some determinants which can help us distinguish enterprises to those where the earnings manipulation is uh, some kind of uh, natural practice and for those enterprises where this kind of manipulation is not so not so um, usual. More of, moreover, uh, there is also one specific information which we need to take into account and there is the way of uh, the earnings manipulation. If it is aggressive way or if uh, it is just some uh, kind of uh, on making the reports more attractive for business partners. So we use specific, usually specific statistical methods. In this study focusing on the Visegrad environment, we use the Kruskal-Wallis test and dunbon ferroni correlations. And uh, uh, these statistical methods were used to reveal the differences across the categories of investigative earnings management determinants. So uh, to uh, go further, uh, we set two hypotheses. First of them was uh, focusing on the fact 
if there are some statistically significant differences in discretionary accruals across the countries. Because if the discretionary accruals uh, are different, then we can say that also the earnings management phenomenon is applied in different uh, in different uh, scale in different countries, which uh, is uh, which was also confirmed. And uh, if uh, the statistically significant dependence between the level of discretionary accruals was proved. Uh, then we tried to analyze the specific uh, firm, uh, the specific features of enterprises that help us to categorize the enterprises uh, into the individual levels according to the principles of manipulation and techniques of manipulation they apply. And this research was uh, focusing on firm age, firm size, economic sector, and legal form. Uh, there are different mathematical and statistical methods that can be used for the uh, validation and for the evaluation of this phenomenon. But for this research, we firstly try to answer or to uh, confirm the hypothesis if there are any statistically significant differences, uh, which was uh, verified by the Kruskal Wallis test. And um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it was proved that uh, each country uh, has different standards and different uh, methods and different levels of earnings management phenomenon, which is also closely connected to the political and economic system of the country and the way uh, the enterprises are supported from the, from the macroeconomic aspect. And then it was also possible to specify uh, where are the uh, biggest differences uh, between the countries. So it can be said that those countries which are marked with this star are those countries where there are very, very uh, big differences in the way of uh, earnings management practices. But not only the specification of the phenomenon was important uh, in the research, we also try to focus on um, the specific economic sectors, specific uh, of other forms of film specific features uh, to distinguish um, the kind or the types of uh, earnings management that are applied uh, in uh, each categories of enterprises, which is then very helpful for national authorities, for auditors, and for uh, for um, uh, tax authorities to reveal uh, if this kind of practices uh, is applied in enterprises and if it is still in the way that okay, we try to make the financial reports more attractive for our business partners but if the legal form is still uh still um, applied if they do not cross these borders and that's why there are two um, ways of identification of the practices uh, usually there are um, various forms of uh, earnings management behavior but uh, we try to select or to um, divide the enterprises according to the way of the uh, practices. So there are aggressive earnings management behavior, which is declared by the positive discretionary accruals, and then conservative earnings management, which is uh, usually connected with the negative discretionary accruals, and if uh, the accruals are very close to zero and uh, there is a need to use the statistical t-test to set uh, where are the borders and which is close to zero and which is not close to zero. And these enterprises are those where there are no discretionary accruals and no problems with uh, no aggressive or um, conservative earnings management practices. So, analyzing the countries uh, one by one, uh, in uh, Slovak conditions, only the, only the sectors, the economic sectors of enterprises uh, were identified as the crucial ones uh, 
trying to uh, trying to concentrate on the earnings management practices. So, as I mentioned, those are three ways or three forms or levels of discretionary accruals, positive, negative, and no discretion in accruals. And uh, this uh, map, um, which is called the correspondence map, um, portrays those enterprises in those economic sectors uh, which are or for for which are typical these specific earnings management uh, practices. Um, it can be said, as also uh, portrayed in the slide, that positive discretionary accruals are typical for enterprises in the sectors L, C, G and D, which can be also seen in this figure, that there are the sectors of manufacturing, real estate, and uh, completely different category of earnings management behavior is uh, revealed in enterprises uh, in the sectors M, N, R, or F. Why this is important? Because uh, mapping the situation in our country, we uh, have problems with some sectors of economy where the fraud behavior and uh, specific uh, practices which are far uh, from the uh, legal and uh, far from the uh, standards which are set by the national authorities are applied. And uh, that is the reason why this division of uh, economic sectors and enterprises uh, uh, realizing their business, uh, their business activities in these specific sectors are very important to follow. Uh, focusing on the environment in the Czech Republic, where the social, economic and political system is very, very similar to Slovak conditions, also only the economic sector was proved to be important when uh, trying to, uh, to portray differences between the earnings management practices. Also, the correspondence map was formed and uh, it should be also said that there are differences uh, in uh, uh, sectors and uh, their practices and uh, the way they report their financial statements. Again, we can see uh, the uh, sectors which are close to negative uh, discretionary accruals and uh, their practices will be focused on uh, income, de de income decreasing activities compared to the sectors which are closely related to uh, positively discretionary accruals and uh, thus uh, uh, trying to use uh, the techniques which are income increasing. So these are the ways the enterprises try to um, improve their financial statements and uh, try to uh, stay competitive and uh, stay, um, stay in, interesting for their business partners and for other subjects which are in close relation to uh, these businesses. The situation in Hungary was um, slightly different because not only the economic sector was uh, important, but uh, also but also uh, the size of enterprises play an important role, which is also declared uh, in these correspondence maps. Uh, following the correspondence map, which is devoted to the economic sectors, there are also some discrepancies in uh, practices and we can say that uh, which sectors are grouped around the negative discretionary accruals and positive discretionary accruals. Uh, then at the end of the analysis, I would like to summarize uh, those sectors which are the same in uh, the Visegrad uh, environment. So let's have a look on the size of enterprises. So here it is evident that large and very large enterprises try to uh, apply negative discretionary accruals, which means that they use income decreasing practices. And from the other aspects, um, it should be said that these practices are applied because of the uh, taxation of these enterprises. So 
also these results are very interesting for those uh, who are trying to find any ways how to reveal these techniques in enterprises and to take some measures um, and uh, try to uh, adjust the behavior of these enterprises to stay in the legal limits. Following the information about the small businesses, here it is evident that uh, uh, they prefer positive discretionary accruals which means that their activities are focused on income increasing activities, which is also important for them, uh, taking into account, for example, the credit policy and uh, the way of finding sources to finance their, their business activities. Finally, uh, Poland, which is the country uh, where the earnings management phenomenon is known, and uh, they also build their own models to evaluate the, this kind of behavior among the enterprises, which can be said is the pioneering country compared to the other Visegrad countries, because uh, neither Slovakia nor, nor uh, Czech Republic or Hungary uh, built their own models to calculate and to evaluate this kind of behavior among the enterprises. And maybe this is also the reason why not only the um, economic sector, but also the uh, firm age and the legal form were revealed as the important determinants that influence the way uh, the, the enterprises are behaving. Uh, I would like to use the correspondence map again. Uh, so the first one, is uh, very interesting because uh, uh, analyzing the enterprises where there is no discretion in accruals, meaning that there are no uh, mm, no manipulations in earnings in such a way, which should be um, maybe confusing for business partners. There is the public administration, which should be in each country. Uh, the, that sector which is, uh, let's say, without any problems. And uh, following the other in interesting results, those are also the ownership structures and legal forms. And here it can be also said that uh, the partnerships and private limited companies are those where the positive discretionary accruals and income increasing activities are applied, while the negative uh, and the income increasing activities are connected with the public limited companies. Finally, we also focused on the on the firm age. Uh, that means that how long the enterprise is operating on the market, and there are also quite uh, huge differences uh, between the enterprises. For example, as can be seen in uh, this map, uh, income decreasing activities are typical for those enterprises which are. 10 to 20 years on the market, which is also connected with the taxation and the tax policy of the country. So just to, to um, quickly present the results of this huge study, uh, where we focus not only on the uh, description of specific uh, features of enterprises that can affect the behavior, uh, there are also some other important uh, uh, trends which we try to follow and try to reveal. Those are, for example, the uh, different uh, policies applied in different years. I mean, the macroeconomic policies, which uh, definitely affect the uh, way uh, the enterprises are behaving. So just to conclude and to bring some findings, which are very interesting and very important for our next research, are those that uh, positive discretionary accruals and income increasing activities are typical for these sectors, uh, construction, information and communication, financial and insurance activities, professional scientific and technical activities, and administrative and support service activities, which are also the factors where there is a need to report good financial reports declaring the stability and declaring the competitive power of those enterprises. Uh, comparing to the other side of, uh, the, of uh, the measure, there is the uh, income, decre income, de income decreasing practice. 
uh, where the enterprise is either reporting uh, or calculating negative discretionary across, trying to lower their income and uh, thus uh, <laughs> um, uh, um, influence their um, taxation and their duties uh, to uh, the national authorities. And those are the sectors of agriculture, manufacturing, uh, which is also one of the most important sectors in our, in, in our Slovak environment. Then there is the electricity, wholesale and real estate activities. Just to sum up, this information is very important for the national authorities to make some measures allowing them to follow, okay, these sectors are trying to portray the results in different ways and we need to find the possible ways and possible measures to reveal if their behavior is within the limits or if it uh, exceeds what is uh, said to be um, by some, by some uh, uh, directives. So, uh, just to conclude, uh, the importance of these differences uh, may be helpful for authorities, policymakers, analysts, and auditors when identifying various techniques and practices of earnings manipulation, which could vary across the exact sectors based on their typical features as confirmed by the results of our uh, last analysis. Uh, the study also brings some kind of new and pioneering outcomes that may clue more researchers and academicians into the earnings management phenomenon and thus open new horizons for further investigation. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, if you have any questions uh, related to our research and to the research our department is focusing on, I am now ready to answer them. Thank you once more again. Great research, Katarina. Great, great one. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very much, Katarina. Um, I have a question for you. Um, I mean, whether there have been uh, uh, carried out any comparisons between the Visegrad countries and, let's say, the Scandinavian area or the Great Britain area or some other areas in Europe or somewhere else in the world? Yeah, thank you very much, George. Uh, it should be said that uh, we are trying to analyze not only this kind of environment, which is very closely related to social, economic and political aspects of other country, but we are trying to build uh, or trying to find the information also in the other countries in the European Union. But this was just short extract from what we are working on. So we are trying to concentrate mostly on the Central European countries as we can compare uh, the results very, very... Um, um, specifically. Specifically because those are very similar conditions and uh, this needs to be taken into account. Also the result, results which were presented are uh, from 2019 not 20, not 21, because these were very affected by the COVID pandemic. And uh, we should uh, uh, select and we should, we should uh, um, clear the data set of enterprises because um, trying to follow the results or financial reports of the enterprises in such tough times uh, couldn't bring good results. So we need and we are trying to make time series analyses, longitudinal analyses, just to um, make some connections between even the years and compare the policies which were applied in the exact uh, time periods. So maybe next time, next conference, I will have another country and another period covered which should uh, help us to build some significant model which should be used in a European environment. Thank you so much, Katarina. Thank you very much. Uh, Nelia Murphy has a question. Yes, thank you, Katrina. Thank you for wonderful presentation. It looks it was done at very hard work. Thank you. Uh, analyzing all the enterprises and countries. Um, I was just thinking that maybe it will be good to make a comparison between European and non-European countries also. Uh, just to let you know that we are going to, we are ready to provide you with all data you need for this. Perfect. Analysis. 
Excellent. I think it will be very interesting, especially for the non-European countries. Yes, and there is one. I mean, yeah. There is one important thing which should be said that this is uh, also important to follow the standards because some countries are following GAP standards, some countries are following European uh, reporting standards, and for example, our country there are no standards, just the national principles. So this should be also included. Yes, you are completely right. So, and it's also very interesting because um, uh, the non-European, the East European countries are right now in the path of implementing the international, uh, the IFRS, International yes. Financing Reporting Standards. So it will be also very interesting and useful, I believe, uh, for the economies and for the companies from these countries. Uh, also, you had mentioned in your presentation about the creative accounting. I just would like to see what what is this? <laughs> what is this? Yes, this is excellent question. This is uh, just the top limit of what is legal and what is not. <laughs> so okay. this is how to make your report attractive um, for your for your business partners when you when you do not want to show. That okay, maybe we have some internal problems, but we still have some um, practices which is usually or which are usually practiced and done by the top managers of the enterprises, maybe also the owners in the owners, uh, ownership structure. And uh, for example, they are trying uh, to make some operation with cash flows or with uh, some kind of assets or a goodwill, which can help them to. Uh, maybe change some uh, subcategories of accounting to different levels or to do some practices at the end of the year to to report the the their financial their financial statements in the way that okay now we can make these results for the audience let's say and then we have another year to improve it in uh, the standard way so i just uh, use the information very shortly because the time is so strict and i'm sure that it was more than 10 or 15 minutes but uh, it is for very very long discussion because there are very, many techniques mathematical techniques statistical techniques and even those uh, which are uh, which can be revealed even by some financial economics uh, indicators which can also help us to find the differences in what is uh, real and or what was achieved and what was not. And just some uh, last comment, there is also very, very big difference between those enterprises which are tradable and uh, on uh, uh, stock exchanges uh, or publicly, tra publicly traded enterprises and which are not. So many aspects which are under consideration and must be discussed because all of them create big differences in uh, this kind of behavior. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thank you so much, Tim. Yes, Marta? Uh, could, I, could I add something? Uh, yes, it's just a comment, not a question. Uh, Katarina, congratulations. It's a huge work and comparative economic analysis. It's really challenging. Uh, I highly appreciate that you focus on this region. And I'm telling that uh, also as a member of both ERSA, European Association for Regional Studies, and also on the regional, on the international one, ERSA, because really we highly appreciate there uh, the focus on the regional, on the local, on the global, if you prefer, where really this makes a difference. What is specific to this area. So I highly appreciate you done your best for that because it is not such easy to compare where there are huge differences. And the second point, um, I want to, um, to stress and also to invite all the participants, if you are interested, on the beginning mostly of the paper, you highlighted the important contribution on knowledge management, KM. 
And I'm also a member on European Association for Knowledge Management. So if any of you is interested in participating and joining us in our research, including comparative analysis on the European level, you are very welcome. I have to share with you the actual president of this association. Um, it's Professor Bratianu from our country. And he will also be very welcome, but please keep in touch. And if any of you, not only Katarina, all the others are interested, please just tell me. And that's the spirit of conference to identify not only social networking, but networking of interest, people with the same common interest, and just to start cooperating. That's lovely. Thank you, not only Katarina, to all of you. And also for regional studies, if you are interested, I can definitely recommend both on ERSA and ERSEA. Thank you so much. Good luck with your research. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Uh, Professor uh, Marta Cristina Suciu was talking from the Academy of Economic Studies, uh, Bucharest, Romania. A, a, a great, huge, huge professor in our country, esteemed professor. Uh, thank you, thank just you. Just a Lord. human being. I prefer to be just a human I being. I know, I know. Because for me, artist. the quality of um, of You're a person also, to, also. to remain great. to remain humble and uh, to learn for everybody, lifelong learning. That's lovely, and I'm still learning for for all of you, and that's really kind of you to invite me. Thank you. You honored us. You know that. Thank you, thank you, uh, Marta Christina. Uh, now I'm uh, looking on our schedule. Uh, there is someone else who wants to, to ask questions to Katarina? No, because uh, uh, now I see here Professor Stefano Amodio from uh, Tezeo Institute, uh, Italy. Hi, Professor. Uh, he um, is... Uh, uh, talking about organizational expertise and decision uh, making in corporate and co on complex organizations. Uh, please proceed, Professor, if you are ready. Uh, your microphone, Professor. P push, uh, press your microphone. Okay. Yes, yes, great, great. Now professor. You, are, you are me? Okay, okay. Yes, I am. Um, uh, uh, the president and the director of Istituto Teseo of Italy. We are a um, university of language, uh, in, spe in a specific of uh, mediation language, and we have two addresses. One specific address of uh, strategic science and the geopolitical science, and the second address is for management and uh, globalization marketing. Uh, my, uh, my, um, today I talk about the organization expertise and decision making in a corporate and a complex organization. Just one minute, because I want to show um, the slides. One minute, please. Do you need my help, Professor? I can help you. I, I can guide you, in fact. One minute, because I must to open the slides of my presentation. OK? OK. Secondo solo. I can I can back to one minute, please. Eh? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um Hello? You cannot see it. Yeah. I, I can guide you. Uh, 
if you allow me, Professor. Next to the hand, there is a, a, an arrow, a square with an arrow. Yeah, great, great, Professor. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Now, now we uh, see your presentation. Do you see? Do you see? Yes, yes, we, we can see yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I talk about the organizational expertise and decision making in corporate and a complex uh, organization. Uh, for the first thing, I want to say what is what, what are the ability ability to be a leader, the ability to carry out coordination tanks task within the group is identified with the leading role of the group itself. If this ability manifests itself continuously. It is an indispensable premise for the attribution of the leadership to the one who demonstrated and exercised it. Uh, for the second things, I want to say what uh, is the, uh, the leadership. Leadership is uh, therefore a quality, a gift, that is not only a factor of appreciation for the individual, but also a valuable resource for all the group. The third things that I want to, to say is the exercise leadership authority. It usually happens that one of the members of the organization find it important to, en to engage in seeking some influence on the other members. This means making attempts to exercise authority. If these attempts are successively and are repeated over time, they can actually confer leadership on the one who has been the protagonist. In whatever sector they operate, companies need to reap, uh, reap the benefits offered by leaders capable of generating the emotional resonance in the company that allows everyone to realize that aspiration and make their potential concrete. Emotional resonance in the group of his collaborators this is the second and the very important um, characteristics of the leader and to make a, a leadership for the organization. It is important to note that while it may be easy to achieve individual and private emotional satisfaction, the task is more complex when a leader wants to create an emotional resonance in the group of his collaborators. The wholeness of one's individual emotional realities represent for the entire organization of the company the beginnings of a, of a useful analysis of the common habits on which those emotional realities are based and from which they are fed. In fact, we can to say uh, this is a, a precisely the starting point of the leader want to spread emotional intelligence in his organization. Now we talk about the undertake change in the group. A group of people can in fact undertake change only when they have fully understood the, re the reality of the internal mechanism and above all, when individual members of the company are aware of a dissonant or uncomfortable situation in which they are possibly 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 operating. Understanding these realities, the group, on an emotional level is of, of fundamental importance, however, the awareness of the existence of the, or dissonance and the disconforms it is not enough to bring about a change. In this fact necessary that the member of the group go back to the cause and the discontent and emotional reality that usually does not originate in a disagreement with the leader, but very often in the basic rules and habits consolidated 
and assimilated by the groups. Other situation is the collective idol vision, starting for the understanding of the emotional reality of the rule and the habits that exist in the organization, it will be possible to develop a collective idol vision, which in the order of efficiently involve everyone must be, a, be in a turn with each person, personal one. Reading leadership in a globalization society is very important for the organization and for the corporate. In a period of a great uncertainty and with spread criticality such as the one we are going through, it is time to rethink leadership as a source and a great tool in development of human resources in the company. We will therefore look at the leadership as the result of the activity of an effective leader. That is one who is capable of innovating, innovating both in terms of a product and organization culture. A leader who proposes the improvement of his organization and who is not afraid to take new paths. A leader who makes the works they ex exciting and stimulating by creating meaning and purpose for and with his collaborators. Now we see, now we, uh, I talk about the globalization and the new organization realities uh, that must change the old conception of leader and the leadership. Contemporary organizational realities find themselves operating in environments that globalization has made particularly complex. The speed and rate of change have not equal in the recent or recent past. The widespread knowledge and the all level of the structure does not go well with the traditional top-down organizational models. The collapse of welfare systems the emergency of multiculturalism, which one, uh, uh, which on the one end enriches organization, on the other requires greater sensitivity and the competence to make the machine work more efficiently. In short, a real revolution that raises many questions about the nature and the characteristics of the leadership for the future. It is therefore evident that as the complexity of the context in which they operate has increased, today leaders more than in the past are faced with greater difficulties than in the past. Um, in uh, the old conception of the leader and the leadership, this the hierarchical image of the leader at the top of the pyramid sufficiently capable, creative and competent to lead an organization seems to be anachronistic with the respect with the respect to the change in environmental condition. Today it appears more appropriate that a facilitator of knowledge and a negotiator of ideas and we will for all levels of this organization. It is evident that such a leadership style requires the, uh, the, le the learning of skills and acquisition of a sensitivity different from the traditional ones. All the leadership exercise system. Leadership scholars affirm that the knowledge, economy, tradition, and the command of the control models are unsuitable for exploiting the potential offer by that is now considered the true business capital, knowledge. Evolution of leadership style. The evolution of the leadership style toward models or a facilitated on, uh, on co-create creation nature presuppose strong investments in terms of change, but above all the cultural evolution of a challenging and mental subsection through which we think about leadership. And more generally, the future uh, of the leader. In organization, it is considered necessary to operate 
even without per predefined maps, and therefore to reduce the complexity and the unknown of the future too, more inclusive. Leadership style, which enhance the important contribution of the various orchestral voices. It will be necessary to evaluate how to pass from leadership models where decrease walls we work together to realize my ideas to a behavioral typology in which the decision making processes is the result of the inclusion of all voices, including the partly dissonant in a perspective that can therefore be summarized in we created our vision and our future together. Well, do you heard me? Yeah. Organizational change caused by globalization. Many private and public organizations find themselves having to face an increasingly global and multi multicultural market characterized by socioeconomic, political, and technological change. In this way, organization will often be called UPA, the overcome numerous challenges. Some of this concern the ability to change the organization if the market innovation require it, make able they continuously manage and you can update, update one knowledge and information base, working in collaboration, considering the increasingly blurred blend boundaries and the companies and the presence of alliance with other organizations, incorporate new techs, new technique, and the new the the uh, theoretical and empirical insight. From the leader to the management team, if in the past more attention we paid to the activities and the role played by the leader, now we focus on the group and executive uh, that make up the, the top uh, of the organization, the top management group response not only for formulate, formulating and implementing solutions for large organizational problems, but also to develop administrative decisions that guarantee the carrying out of the routine activities. The way in which decisions are made depends on the characteristic of the group, structure, composition, processes, incentives, type of the leadership, and of the problem examined. The group activity is affected by the environment characteristic, the organization, and the way in which the group perceives the problems. The decision making process has consequences of the qualified and economic result of this decision. Well, do you heard me? Yes, Professor. We are okay. here with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I finish uh, my in uh, intervent and um, now I I exit. Sorry. Ten Thank minutes. You, Ten minutes. Yes, yes, it's great, right. great, professor. Thank okay. you a lot. Yes, yes, it's great. I respect the time. Uh, yes, great, professor. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Professor Stefano Amodio? Oh, yes, Elisa, please proceed. Thank you, uh, dear Professor. This is a, a great topic, especially since I personally teach management and leadership, and uh, I take this topic to my heart. And uh, uh, the mission of our university, because it is a national military university, is uh, to create leaders for the Bulgarian army who have the appropriate spirit, knowledge, skills and experience. So that you mentioned about all this. Officers to perform their duties in peacetime and during the war. And uh, I would only to say that it is a pleasure to, to meet you personally, uh, even it is personally means online, but uh, it is a really great topic. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. Thank you to you. 
Professor Elisa Petrova. I am very um, um, uh, 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 content. I, I am very happy of your um, of your discussion. Yeah, thank you, um, Professor Amodio. Yeah, um, for the the question, I can I can answer that uh, the future of the leadership uh, is not more individual, but is um, um, on um, uh, action uh, action group with uh, with uh, with many person. Uh, inside the uh, brainstorming activity and uh, 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 on a, a new perspective, new perspective uh, uh, that the globalization and the new situation, so, uh, social and economics are uh, created in uh, the last year. Uh, in, uh, my, um, in, in my article, I expose uh, all uh, this situation and uh, I talk about a very important uh, solution uh, for the future. The solution uh, I uh, indicated uh, on the... Um, on, uh, um, uh, my conclusion on my conclusion of uh, this um, art, uh, of, of my article and uh, is uh, uh, in uh, uh, a solution that uh, um, that including more intelligence intelli uh, creative intelligence and so uh, other form of of uh, intelligence of growth um, that um, that uh, change the situation of the last year uh, of the, the 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 last year uh, in the europe in in the world thank you professor amodio professor amodio is in fact a a friend of our university for some years and uh, george you, you you raised your hand do you want to ask something uh, yes uh, dear professor amodio i have a, a question for you well uh, you know, what uh, would you think uh, might happen with uh, uh, especially large companies uh, confronted with uh, some sort uh, with, with some sort of um, uh, demise uh, of uh, large-scale demise from um, uh, from their employees that uh, seem to like especially remote work now. How would they reconfigure their activities? Perhaps they might like the idea that they won't have to pay for logistics and uh, uh, spaces to rent or they might be affected and thus uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, people who uh, are interested in distinct activities like uh, freelancers uh, might have a better way of uh, operating than uh, the organizations themselves. Bella domanda. Allora, um, um, the, the organizational team is the same. Um, I, I know the difference uh, from the uh, complex organizational and uh, in uh, the corporate uh, and uh, the organization of the corporate of uh, uh, the other firm. But uh, in uh, the last studies, the, um, the new prospective are the same, the same uh, for um, a new form of leadership. A new form of the leadership that uh, considered uh, in, the, in the first time um, uh, three, three, uh, three situations. The, the first situation is uh, the 
um, emotional resonance of the group that uh, is very important for uh, for to have uh, a new uh, usually response, uh, re response uh, answer the second very important uh, uh, things for the uh, new model of the leadership is the uh, facilitated and the co-created nature of these models and the third uh, that i that i spoke on my article is uh, on the uh, the new creation of a top group management group uh, this uh, new form of the uh, leadership is a, a form of leadership collab uh, collaborative uh, with many people that include including uh, many form of intelligence and uh, over every and overall uh, uh, a form of the uh, interesting uh, in a uh, uh, new ambient because uh, the capacity of the, to um, uh, organize a new form of leadership is uh, differently in the uh, in base of a differently form of context. The context uh, influence, um, influence all the form of the decision making inside of the, the group now we uh, we live in a, a new era in a, in a new era when the globalization have changed all the situation situation um, uh, in the economy situation in the social group uh, situation uh, in all uh, the, the life of, uh, of, of, our, of our lives and for this we must to change uh, to the base and we must change in uh, all of the society with a new form of leader and uh, leadership and uh, for to have a new uh, a new leader that can to change this society thank you so much uh, could I add just a few comments? Uh, so, really, congratulations, Professor Stefano. I totally agree with you and I support your vision. Uh, we are facing, really, change is a single constant of the universe and we have to face a lot of challenge, including the need for new leadership. A new leadership called sometimes transformational leadership, as a time, like you tell, uh, told us, it's about collaborative, innovative, and creative leadership, which is very important, and which we are on a turning point of our civilization. We need to, to face the change, but also to adopt to it and to be prepared for it. And this kind of things uh, that you presented in a very interesting cross-disciplinary approach I highly appreciate based on emotional intelligence, intercultural sensitivity, intercultural dialogue, something we are also supporting during this conference also. It's really amazing and if you are interested about cooperation, I have also some PhDs that are developing thesis based on this very interesting topic. And uh, I also have a, a great cooperation with Italy. Uh, in um, 2019, November, December, I had been on Rome Sapienza University as a visiting professor for the PhD school. And uh, there I taught the course of culture and creative economy, which is really very much connected with your topic. So I'm looking for further cooperation. And thank you so much for challenging us with this new approach that we highly needed. Thank you again. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. You are welcome. 
um, yeah, just uh, another thing. We we can't to think um, the the leader at the leadership like uh, ten years ago with the the model um, uh, the model uh, based on the authority. Uh, but uh, we must to change. We rethinking, rethinking the leader and the rethinking the uh, models of leadership. <coughs> the world change, and uh, we can't. Uh, uh, stay, stay, stay. Stop it. I finish. Totally agree. Thank you. Uh, there are any questions for Professor Amodio? Uh, I would like uh, to, to say a few words about uh, the Instituto Tezeo Alta Formazione Ricerca Foundation, uh, who was born in February nine, uh, 2019, uh, first uh, as a scientific association uh, with uh, its headquarters in uh, San Donato Val di Como, Italy, and later in July 2020, it became a foundation with its uh, headquarters in uh, San Cipriano uh, Picento, Italy, where it currently has its operational and legal uh, headquarters. Uh, the foundation uh, Instituto Tezeo operates in the field of higher education and research, in particular in the field of language mediation studies and training, language studies, psychological sciences applied to neuro-linguistic and economic studies. Um, thank you, Professor Amorio. If, uh, if you want to, to, to say something uh, more, uh, we are here. <laughs> yeah, um, I thank all the participants to this inter very interesting conference. And uh, uh, now um, uh, I want uh, uh, to, uh, to pass the words to um, other uh, participant to uh, this uh, very interesting conference. Um, in uh, the second time, uh, there is uh, um, uh, Professor um, uh, Alexandra Radu with uh, uh, her uh, article. Yeah? Alexandra told me <laughs> earlier that uh, she wants uh, uh, to, to make her presentation tomorrow on the panels. Um, but if uh, Alexandra wants to and agrees. I am preparing for tomorrow. Hello to everybody. I want to salute uh, all the professor present. Um, and um, I want to say that uh, me and uh, the representative of uh, Paolo Cioni professor, because Paolo Cioni uh, can be present with us tomorrow. Uh, me uh, and uh, the representative of uh, Paolo, Paolo Cioni, um, we will be tomorrow uh, for the presentation. Um, I want to introduce um, uh, Melina Allegro, if uh, it's ready. Uh, okay. Professor Melina Allegro. Sí. Hi, Melina. Sí. Hi, Melina. Hi. Okay. One moment. Echo. I... Uh, good morning uh, to all, and uh, uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, I now I I speak, uh, I talk my talk concerns conflict in working relationships, uh, in particular the crisis of uh, role in modernity about uh, men and women. Uh, in the relationships. Uh, one moment, I presentation. Yes. Belinda yes. is working um, at the yes. um, Tesoro Institute and also uh, in the Italian Ministry of Education, University and Research from Rome, Italy. She is going to, yes. to talk us about uh, the conflict in working relationships and uh, about the crisis of roles and mo modernity, the men woman working relationship. When you are ready, Marina, uh, please. Yes, uh, I. 
I just just moment. Yes, we'll wait. Take no. your time. Yes. No, questa non è. Aspetta. <laughs> just one minute, please. Yes. Just I arrived now. Uh, I I'm sorry, and uh, it, it's okay, Melina. It's okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> we understand that you are very busy. Eh, certo. Yes. <laughs> Very busy. Allora, one moment. Ok. Ok. One moment. Ecco, so. Condividi. Ok. Allora. Ecco, you see? Uh, you see? Not until now, not until now. No. But yes, 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 yes. Yes, now, now it's it's okay. Now we can see it, Melina. Okay. Yes, great. Okay. Uh, allora, my interview uh, speak about conflict. Uh, what is a conflict? Uh, the conflict is a divergence of opin opinion opinions which as such generated an emotional alteration in turn arising from a clash of mutually antithetical views. I decide to start from this definition to emphasize how much within a conflict situation, we, whether it be work or family, the factors in the field concern both the cultural aspect of a person and emotional one. Speaking of conflict, therefore, without taking into account the social cultural substratum in uh, which it has its root, inevitable, inevitably uh, involves and emptied uh, of those which are fundamental ingredients of any type of relationships. Has, um, as already mentioned uh, in previous uh, chapter, the social cultural transformation that have uh, occurred in recent decades have led to a complete redefinition of the roles that men and women respectfully uh, cover during their lives. In fact, in the uh, era era of modernity, many of rules that had been at the basis of society for decades were gradually overturned. And um, so, a man, in fact, going through a phase of profound changes that go end in end with the social cultural changes of our time. The stereotypes and that aim to uh, relegate men to the narrow rule of the uh, of an uh, always strong, dominant and self-confident figure have over time given way to more flexible models with which men can identif identify. Uh, Women, in turn, by overcoming cultural limits, are becoming more and more competitive by not accepting the role of shoulder. Over time, they have acquired a critical sense that more easily reveals less standardized aspects of the masculine. The result, the result of all this is that men lose the privileged position they previously enjoyed and find it more difficult to maintain dominance, power and trustworthiness in the eyes of the other sex uh, their own. What emerges for, uh, from this new condition is a man in crisis. Uh, frightened by uh, the loss uh, of the status that for decades 
he had considered the only possible one, a man who often tries the rich uh, by losing himself defensively, avoiding any form of contra confrontation or showing aggression and attacking, even before behind attacked. Uh, schematizing, uh, generalizing, simpli simplifying really, uh, reality and uh, pigeonholing uh, the information of what one is experiencing in rigid cat categories can create an illusion sense of security and control over reality, which is rigidity but not strength. In the same way, the woman finding herself in the position of someone who acquires her new status uh, runs the risk of approaching this new condition with an attitude so of someone who owes something by virtue of a past uh, to the, to that today she finds unfair. This is this idea uh, risks uh, leading the woman to assume that she is right in all the circumstances that see her confronting an, a man in one of the new context she is part of. Uh, to hold this must be added the uh, difficulties uh, that this change of status has generated in the management of family dynamics that previously were the exclusive prerogative of woman. In fact, it was uh, the woman who dealt almost uh, entirely uh, with all the matters concerning the management of the house and the ch children in uh, and in general with all matters concerning the family manage, menage finding having uh, to delegate to a third part what until recently were their characterizing activities uh, often leads women to experience a strong personal emotional conflict torn between the desire to fulfill themselves by exploiting uh, the new opportunities that modern societies uh, society has given them and the duty imposed by the cultural heritage with which they grew up. Uh, the, with these premises, it is inevitable that men and women who now find themselves sharing a new space in their lives risk critically raising uh, the threshold of conflict, risk, uh, risking uh, losing the enormous opportunity for enrichment uh, to each confrontation with a different model from ours inexorably leads. Um, the hidden potential of relation conflict uh, to better understand how they manage conflict, it is important to start with two brief considerations. Uh, one conflict is an event that inevitably occurs within human relationships, especially in working relationships, as they are strongly dependent on the personal opinions that people feel about each other, greatly influenced by power relationship. Her, uh, uh, clearly um, determined that to the point of determining uh, not only the social vis visibility of the person who is the protagonist, but also the level of self-esteem and the personal perception of the self as a valid person. In fact, work represents a very important part of our life, both for the large amount of time invested and for the quality of the research invested. 
and is uh, therefore absolutely impossible to consider it as if it were a marginal experience with no consequences for the perce uh, perception of itself in the world. Conflicts cannot be identified exclusively as a painful event or a regressive form in fact, thanks uh, to its onset, a change is often implemented and evolution, evolutionary a turning point, as Duccio Demetrio affirm, who supports the idea of the conflict understood as a creative force for change, especially in adulthood. The crisis, the conflict, the fracture, all implication of the metaphoric process because there is no form of reward re uh, that is painless, are not regressive manifestation. Those who change rather return for growth. Uh, René Wang himself, himself uh, adds power to the previous adulthood. The change experienced uh, and suffered becomes to the emblem of a more fascinating adulthood because it is emblem, emblem uh, of a superior synthesis that we have been able to act achieve against all adversities. Uh, according to this vision, the conflicts between adults uh, contains within a powerful, a powerful transformative uh, and emancipatory force as inevitably uh, leads its protagonists to question themselves to the get involved, involved to consider in uh, any case the position of, of other, others in uh, order to understand them and then decide uh, whether they support them or less. Conflict also leads to a deeper uh, understanding of relationships increases their intensity and consequently generates a ever greater emotional involvement. One moment. Um, and conflict also leads it deeper understand and select um, you. Understanding or relationship increases. They no, this is what I read. Okay. Uh, moreover, it can often increase productive if uh, it manages to give light uh, to new idea. Allora, one moment, please. Allora, vabbè, niente. Guarda che non mi hai fatto l'ultima riga. Allora, un momento. Eh, Ecco, so sempre qui. If new agreements and mediated solution arise from the conflict. For all these reasons, not only should the conflict not be avoided, but rather is, uh, it should be a token as a possibility of exchange, of confrontation, of growth while clearly sensing and uh, all its painful presence. Conflicts should therefore be lived considering its most constructive aspect, strengthening of relationships, growth of, uh, of self-esteem, improvement of productivity, increase of stimuli, greater trust and openness in relationships and at the same time endured in its evest aspect by management manage difficulty uh, uh, concentrating but also relationship relation increased irritably rate problems in having a correct opinion of oneself 
and surrounding reality have extreme situation in which the individual who cannot cope with the conflict implements increasingly complex defenses me mechanism of uh, up uh, to avoidance and escape. Conflict must therefore be seen and an opportunity for person growth uh, as it contains our uh, frailties and weakness um, that clash with those of the other from the conflictual modalities that we put in place with the people with whom uh, we enter into a relationship we can in fact understand by observing ourselves carefully uh, what uh, our shadow our area are and ask ourselves question about the region of anger and therefore of pain that the relationship with the other he has discovered in us okay i finish thank you thank you uh, malina allegro uh, the subject is very interesting also i i, I want to say uh, a few words about uh, you uh, until uh, my colleagues uh, are thinking to a question to to, to ask to you um i want to say about uh, Marina allegro that is uh, the vice president the director of international and external and orientation relations and member of the board of directors of the fondazione istituto teseo alta formazione ricerca from salerno italy she graduated educational sciences and obtained the second level executive master governance management and development of human resources in the public administration and uh, she is also a permanent uh, teacher uh, at Italian Ministry of Education, University and Research, Rome, Italy, qualified to teach uh, human sciences in secondary school, trainer in the field yeah. of experimental pedagogy and training processes, technology and education and learning. Uh, she is also a, a former member of the Commissioner of the Ordinary Primary School Competition Commission in 2016. Um, if, uh, if, uh, ah, yes, Elisa, please proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Professor, it is interesting uh, to me uh, whether you conduct ex exercises and seminars and uh, whether you use special teaching methods such as situation games, case studies, other in this discipline. Um, do you teach uh, conflict management and what methods uh, do you use? Thank you. You can speak in Italian language if it comes uh, in Italian more than in English for you. I think we can understand it. But first with the microphone on. Yes, yes, of course. Excuse me. Yes, uh, I can speak Italian. Okay. Allora, eh, nel sistema di eh, insegnamento e, e di eh, diciamo, proposta eh, di, dei metodi eh, di relazione appunto tra eh, nel, in, tu, in ogni comunità eh, che eh, comprenda il conflitto esistente tra eh, il ruolo dell'uomo e della donna, eh, bisogna porre diciamo, l'accento su quelle che sono gli obiettivi, cioè l'obiettivo diventa il mezzo, il trade union eh, per raggiungere lo scopo e soprattutto eh, occorre mettere in evidenza eh, quelle che sono le caratteristiche eh, anche emotive no? che riguardano appunto l'intelligenza emotiva eh, di ogni componente del gruppo, quindi alla base della, di una relazione efficace occorre eh, dare ad ognuno il, un proprio ruolo e un ruolo che sia eh, fondamentale per la riuscita del progetto. 
Thank you, thank you, Marina. Uh, Alexandra, mai ești cu noi? Are you here with us, Alexandra, from Instituto Tezeu? Yes, I'm here. Can you translate I'm a little bit here. for uh, Elisa, what uh, 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 professor yes. said? Melina said that um, the emotional the emotional uh, intelligence is the um, principal is the most important factor that uh, guide uh, um, our um, capacity to integrate uh, integrate us um, in a, um, 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 in on, in uh, in the organization and to resolve the conflicts. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Uh, now is the turn uh, uh, for um, uh, Rodica Perchun and Nelia Marfi Reilan uh, with uh, from the. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, National Institute of Economic Research, Chisinau, Republic of Moldova, and Nelis also from Aleku Sobol State University, Chisinau, Republic of Moldova. Nelly, if you're ready. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, thank great. you. Uh, I hope you see my presentation. Yes, yes, great, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, thank you again for to organizers for this wonderful opportunity to present their research researches that we have done. Uh, also, unfortunately, Professor Perchun could not attend this plenary session because uh, uh, she has uh, she is uh, implicated in other activities right now. But she is sending her congratulations for this wonderful event and uh, wish to all of us a very productive conference. Uh, our today presentation is again about Industry 4.0. And uh, we would like to show how the countries react and accept in their development strategies the challenges brought by the digital revolutions. We conducted our research on the Republic of Moldova experience to show up the policies and strategies adopted by Moldovan government, public institutions and businesses uh, to face uh, the digital avalanche. Uh, also, I would like to mention that the research was conducted within the state program developing the circular economy mechanism for the Republic of Moldova. So the objective of research are the international experience in the field of economy digitalization, Industry 40 good practices versus Republic Moldova experience, the national legal framework analysis, diagnosis of economic indicators regarding the ICT implementation in the Moldovan economy, and also we can, came up with some conclusions and a recommendation. Um, I will not stop on the definition of the industry for zero because it was uh, wonderful done by uh, previous presenters. Uh, this term introduced by Klaus Schwab in 2016 was taken as a concept and paradigm of economic development dominated by the widespread use of ICTs. Uh, this uh, in term meets a wide range of concepts and refers to the convergence and application of nine digital industrial technologies, what are actually successfully applied in practice. Combining them in an integrated system will allow, of course, the development of the Industry 4.0 concept. Uh, for sure, Industry 4.0 is a political, economic and social challenge for the entire world, which aim to absorb digital innovation in products, process and business models. Many developed countries in Europe, America and Asia have included this concept in their strategic development programs for the coming decades. Talking about the international experience, Europe, for example, will invest more than 1.3 trillion euros in the development of the virtual technologies for the next uh, 15 years. Many companies in Europe, the United States and Asia have already entered the race to adopt and implement industry for zero in their businesses. Uh, to quantify the potential global impact of industry for zero, uh, the Boston Consulting Group uh, states that the production pro 
prospects in Germany in several areas such as productivity, revenue, employment, investment, producers, integration of production and logistic processes. For example, the results of the trend analysis show that Industry 4.0 leads to increased productivity in all sectors from 90 billion to 100 50 billion euros productivity improvements on conversion cost which exclude the cost of materials ranging from uh, 15 to 25 percent industrial equipment manufacturers achieved an increase in productivity from 20 to 30 percent according to the um, bcg report industry for zero leads to revenue growth manufacturers demand for improved equipment and new data application, as well as a consumer demand for a wide range of increasingly customized products, have led to the further revenue growth of around 1% of German, German GDP. In the analysis on the impact of Industry for Zero on German production, it was found that the growth uh, it stimulates will lead to a 6% increase in employment over the next 10 years. Demand for employees in the mechanical sector could increase even more by up to 10% over the same period. In the investment segment, the adaptation of production processes to incorporate industry for zero will require manufacturers in the next 10 years to invest between 1 to 1.5 percent in their, of their revenues in digital technologies. The estimated benefits in Germany illustrate the potential impact of industry for zero for global production. Industry for zero will have a direct effect on manufacturers and their workforce force, as well as on companies that supply intelligent production systems. All the estimated cost reduction include 30% for labor cost, operating cost and expenses over the five to 10 years, integrated production and logistic processes will not be more cost effective by, but will reduce cycle time up to 30%. Adopting these technologies will require an increase in investment about 35%. According to the analysis carried out by the Statista portal in 2020, IT and software expenses for enterprises amounted to approximately $500 billion worldwide. The software market has seen a high level of growth in recent years, with revenues doubling in the decade between 2009 and 2019. Recent forecasts suggest that this rapid extension trend will continue in the coming years, with market revenues reaching $556 billion by 2021. Um, according to the statistical portal, OECD stats, uh, in uh, 2018, 87.32% of German companies have websites and use IT resources in businesses. In France, this index is 66.33%. In the United Kingdom, 83-63% uh, and in Finland 96 and 28%. Of course, the pandemic crisis increased these figures. The national ICT framework. Analyzing the situation regarding the ICT implementation in the economy, the Republic Moldova has an extensive infrastructure of informational technologies. According to the findings made in the innovation strategy of the Republic of Moldova, the rapid expansion of ICT use is taking place, increasing the level of digitalization by 10 percentage points contributes to increasing the country's score in the Global Innovation Index. Another document on the digitalization of the Moldovan economy is the National Strategy for the Development of the Informational Society, Digital Moldova 2020. According to this document, the government of Moldova considers as a priority direction of the strategy for building uh, the informational society, increasing the competitiveness of economic actors and creating new jobs by exploiting the opportunities offered by new information and communication technologies. 
uh, in the first decade of um, 20s, the process of creating government information platform began. Currently, uh, the e-government agency is active in the Republic of Moldova, incorporated all the 40 e-transformation sub-projects, building a sustainable platform for the modernization of public services and innovation in, gov in governance. Uh, also, the Industry 40.0 is intensively promoted by multinational companies located in the Republic of Moldova and, of course, by the international audit companies. The International Telecommunication Union uh, examined the indicators of access and use of ICT in 2019s and certified that the situation in our country is better in compared to the common independent states, overage and close to that of the Central European uh, countries. However, ICT is not a defining element for the business organization. The fundings made by EUT are presented in the innovation strategy of the Republic of Moldova for the period 2030-2020, innovation for competitiveness. Uh, for the analysis of IT knowledge and its application and entrepreneurial practices, the Global Innovation Index is applied which allow the international comparison of innovation results as well as the Innovation Union scoreboard. According to the report of the International Telecommunication Union in the Republic of Moldova, there are many advantages for the development of the ICT sector, namely a relatively low cost labor, a high general level of information infrastructure, service market IT is dynamic and developed with, with high speed internet and high accessibility to mobile services. Also, national ICT legislation is aligned with the legal framework of the European Union, and ICT policies are involving benefiting from the existing infrastructure with a focus on the development of innovative entrepreneurship. The facilities of the tax system have favored the development of outsourcing in the field of ICTs and have created advantageous conditions for the development of this type of services. The adaptation degree of ICT and the economy can be estimated by analyzing several indices proposed by the International Labor Organization for the analysis of the business environment in the Republic of Moldova. Uh, so the first the indices is Network Readiness Index. Uh, this index is intended to estimate society's capacity to use ICT to increase the level of development and competitiveness of developed and developing countries. And the evolution of this index for the period 20, uh, 20, 2019 uh, compared to several countries in the world. As a result of the analysis, the top of the countries with the most favorable climate for the innovation and technological adaptation is Estonia with 5.5 uh, points, followed by Malta, 4.8 points, Slovenia, 4.7 points, Romania, 4.1 points, and Republic of Moldova with um, 4 points. Uh, number of internet users and mobile subscriptions. This is the second indices. According to the TC data database platform on the World Bank, uh, in uh, 2018, um, 2018, in Moldova, 71 of the population used percent of the population used the internet. In the comparison countries, the situation was similar. Estonia, 87.22%, uh, Malta, 77.29%, Slovenia, 75.5%, Albania, Romania, 69.50%. Uh, uh, this is uh, the data from the 2018 years. Okay. Uh, also, uh, the um, another um, another indicator is uh, the ICT Development Index. This index compares developments in information technologies and communications. The ICT Development Index is aggregative and contains 11 indices that characterize the degree of use and relevant skills, such as household with the computers, the number of internet users, the literacy level. The index is applied 
in international practice as a benchmarking tool at the global, regional, or country level. Uh, you can see in the table uh, this Moldova is where Moldova is situated, so it comes after Romania. Also, our country is ranked seventh in the world by the spread of the internet, and ICT has reached the level of 20% of GDP. All these are other characteristics elements of the third industrial revolution and not uh, the revolution for zero, which requires the use of robots, artificial intelligence, cl cloud computing, blockchain in industrial products. Analyzing the dynamic of expenditure for information technologies in the period 2014-2019 in total by economy, we can conclude that all through the dynamic of this um, expenditure is positive for the entire analyzed period. The largest share in total belongs to the expenditures for the purchase of computing equipment. 40% in the total expenditure in 2014 and 24.33% in 2090s. Uh, the share of expenditure for the procurement of software products decreased uh, also to 19.6% in 2019. At the same time, the share of the expenses for the design and elaboration of informational system registered a considerable increase from 5.6% to 22.9%. Uh, the decrease in the share of the expenses for the purchase of computers equipment in favor of the purchase of software and information system demonstrates the tendency of economic entities to invest in digital products and informational system for business. The largest share of investment in ICT belongs to information and telecommunication activities, um, financial and insurance activities. The share of investment in ICT in the manufacturing industry reached the level of 3.8% and uh, uh, in 2013 and uh, 3.76% in 2019s. Uh, in agriculture, the situation is worse. Uh, so now it's uh, around 0.31%. Uh, Uh, the IT, IT sector remains one of the main strategic area of the national economy, uh, with a contribution of 7% to the country gross domestic product. And the study conducted by the National Association of ICT Companies show that 9.9% of, of the companies in this sector developed ICT products and 37.4% products and services, according to the study carried out on the sectors of the national economy for which IT services and products are developed, the agri-food sector account only for 2.2% uh, of the portfolio of IT services provided for the national economy. And the largest share, largest share belonged 31.9% to financial banking, retail, and entertainment. Following the analysis, we identified through the SWOT method the strengths, the weaknesses, as well as the risk opportunities to implement Industry 40.0 uh, tools. So we can state the weaknesses such as lack of the specialist in the um, in the uh, IT uh, sectors. Uh, a lack of the uh, coherent government program in the field of industry for zero, a lack of the scientific research with uh, some exception in the field of industry for zero, a lack of financial resource and, uh, resources and IT investment, a lack of interest of the financial banking se sector in financing the activities specific to the industry for zero field, a lack of specialists in the digitalization of production processes, a lack of skilled labor and interdisciplinary fields specific to industry for zero, computer sensory, uh, mechanical technologies, materials, production, organization. Uh, what are the threats? Uh, security of the personal data and information, increasing the risk of cyber attacks, reduction of job as a result of automation and robotization of production processes, also a lack of qualified staff for the IT field. 
Uh, in conclusions, we will like to start that uh, to define an agenda for industry for zero in the Republic of Moldova is a real need. Also, to include the industry for zero concept in the national development strategy of the Republic of Moldova. Uh, also, to include the industry for zero concept in the national research and development and innovation program. To promote industry for zero in academia. To develop interdisciplinary courses at the level of the colleges and universities in curricula that the approach of um, industry for zero. Also, to promote and finance studies in the field of machinery technology machine tools and production system, industrial engineering, uh, mechatronics, robotics, data instrumentation, acquisition, telecommunication networks and software, computers, information technologies. Uh, also to motivate the involvement of Moldovan companies in the Industry for Zero agenda, to interest banking institution in financing initiatives in the Industry for Zero program, and to access and actively participate in European platforms and agencies of interest in uh, Industry for Zero development. So thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer to, to the questions. Thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, Nelly. Very, very interesting. Uh, ye yes, George, presentation. Um, Nadia, Nelly, I have a question. Well, uh, uh, as uh, smart manufacturing or industry 4.0 uh, is likely to be thoroughly implemented in in the uh, couple of years next ahead well uh, or at least in in the next decade um, what would happen to the enormous volume of uh, former employees um, even in uh, this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, situation uh, the population of the planet is supposed to, to grow and uh, uh, to increase in age, live longer. And um, with all this job automation and technological unemployment, what might happen? Um, would be feasible to introduce some sort of uh, uh, tax robot or perhaps or in conjunction with it, uh, some sort of... Uh, uh, minimal uh, uh, income for uh, each person that uh, can find a job because some jobs will not ever exist. Let's yeah. say postman. Postman might be replaced as a, a human delivery person by uh, uh, delivery drones. Uh, uh, drivers uh, can be replaced by autonomous vehicles. And, and so on. Yes, uh, thank, you, thank you for the question. Uh, this is a, this is a big challenge for the for the entire economy, I believe, for the entire world. Uh, of course, a lot of people will lose their jobs because the because of the automatization. Uh, but also, it will be uh, the the need in more qualified persons and more qualified specialists will increase in the next years, because uh, we will need people that will program these robots, will control how these robots are doing their job. So it means just um, you know and another level level of the um, of the um, competencies and skills that will be asked from the from the people so we just need to think uh, right now about how to prepare uh, the new specialist to work in the industry for zero condition and to to give them uh, you know the competencies they will need to to face all the challenges in in this new digital era. Well, I think usually the questions from my students from accounting asking me: Is it true that we will not be need any more in the future accountants? Mm -hmm. and yes, you will. We will not need uh, no technical operators or accounting operators. We will need brains that will you know will will be able to to control what the machine does, what the program, we, also artificial intelligence, what, uh, 
what she is doing and uh, everything is uh, is correct. Thank you, Nelly. Thank you. If uh, there is someone else who wants to, to ask Nelly a question and until there, uh, yeah. Until there, I am uh, going to say a few words about uh, Nelly. Uh, she, she has a PhD in economics, being an associate professor at the Department of Economic Studies, Faculty of uh, Real Economic and Environmental Sciences, Alekurus Obal State University, and also a member of the National Institute for Economic Research of the Ministry of Education and Research of Moldova from Chisinau. Uh, her colleague, uh, Dr. Rodica Perchun has a PhD, uh, is a PhD habilitate a professor and head of the Department of Financial and Monetary Research at the National Institute of, uh, for Economic Research of the Ministry of Education and Republic of Moldova. And uh, she's also the director of many national institutional projects, member of some editorial boards, national and international expert for uh, independent project evaluation, and also member of many scientific committees and some international scientific conferences also. That's probably why she couldn't attend today our conference. And thank you a lot, Nelly, for being here until the morning with us. <laughs> thank you a lot. Uh, and we, we appreciate you a lot and, and your work also. Thank you. Exquisite. And uh, now uh, allow me to present you the next speaker uh pro yes uh professor edwin mirfazli from the university of lampung indonesia who is going to talking about the corporate social responsibility uh please proceed uh, professor okay thank you very much uh first i want to set in my <coughs> presentation next to the hand uh i showed yes. you in the morning not the hand the arrow next to the hand the arrow the arrow edwin oh sorry okay okay you can see my presentation uh, no no uh choose the arrow uh push the button um uh, all the screen after that you have to push your screen mm -hmm. it's um uh, a pictogram with the, your screen you have to push it and after that to push the button allow the square with an arrow okay. after that all your screen push the um, icon with your screen and that the button allow you can see my screen yes i think it's preparing for something yes okay. it's preparing uh we cannot see your presentation because you have to choose your presentation i think yeah yes. yeah yeah you have to choose your presentation from your uh, computer yes yes and to to show it to us you can show now not yet not yet sorry what's up it's okay Take your time. Do not hurry. Yeah, okay. Um, do you want to, to say again the process uh, to, to, to make it again? Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Stop. Yes. Yes. Uh, all the screen, mm -hmm. push the pictogram on your... Uh, um, page with the screen and yes. then the button allow and after that you have to choose from your uh, computer the document and to share it with us yeah as we made in the morning i think it's yes great Great. Yes. You can see? Great, okay. Edwin. Okay. <laughs> yes, great. Okay. Yes. okay, thank you very much, uh, Elena. Invite me to the... I think the... you you pushed something that I told you in the morning, not to push it. Yes. yes. 
yes, okay. great. Yes. Yeah, great. About, <clears throat> okay, thank you very much to invite me to speak in the uh, ICHESBA conference 2021. So my topic about corporate social responsibility disclosure in accounting perspective. <clears throat> so this is my book I want to, to share for you uh, because uh, after make research in CSR, corporate social responsibility, since 2008, so I try to collaborate. I try to make a book uh, to uh, explore about uh, research in CSR. But uh, in this point, uh, I I just to explain about corporate social responsibility and related to social accounting. Okay, you can see uh, my. Uh, this one, <clears throat> uh, social accounting is a philosophy of CSR. Uh, you can see in the diagrams uh, about uh, central position of social accounting. And if you look, if uh, once of a part of uh, social accounting is corporate social responsibility. So it means if you if you want if we back. Uh, the story of uh, corporate social, social responsibility or CSR, because uh, some activity in uh, most activity in United States about uh, for social accounting. However, uh, they have some problem about uh, how to explore about social activity, and then. Uh, they still they still use uh, philosophy of social accounting. Uh, I can I can show you about uh, uh, definition or uh, identification of social accounting. If you look, uh, pressure of social accounting is social uh, relationship between social cost and social benefit. Uh, uh, after this, I want to explain why. They stop about this activity because after uh, from uh, 30 until 80, the activity of social accounting is very rapid in the United States. However, uh, they 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 have a little bit problem when uh, uh, when they try to measure to measure about uh, disclose about social activity. Okay, uh, I continue. This one is, ah, uh, this one is about uh, relationship among objective of social accounting. If you look uh, how uh, relation between social cost and social benefit, and then they try to uh, measure with uh, social accounting. We adopt for, uh, from goes. Uh, in uh, in this time, uh, social accounting is not popular because of uh, most activity uh, related to uh, social responsibility. It's mean corporate. So after this, social accounting is stuck. Is stuck. But now uh, I have collect uh, maybe you know uh, Professor Rob, Rob Gray, uh, he passed away last year, so he very confident, very extract how to explain about social accounting, why social accounting is stuck. I I can continue. I can explain why. This one. Uh. Uh. When. When uh, Milton Friedman uh, uh, write article about uh, the conclusion is the business of business is business. So uh, the company is changed because uh, investor give the money for uh, profit activity, not social activity. So it means 
activity of social social activity is in uh, shareholders uh, not not by stakeholder ah this is the answer why social accounting is stuck uh, is stuck it's not it's not uh, uh, i mean they they leave social accounting and then uh, about social activity just only investor or shareholders uh, this one is uh, uh, just only in the United States. Yeah, if 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 we come uh, feedback again. However, many researchers in Europe and Australian, and then some of uh, Canada, some of uh, Asia, is not agree about Milton Friedman. So because. Now, this one I want to uh, relate, uh, relate uh, KSR and accounting. In accounting, we know about uh, entity, business entity concept. So according to them, even uh, maybe person of investor just only uh, respond uh, uh, about activity, however, uh, because this one is entity, so the company is include. I mean, the company is must respond about their activity. For example, related to uh, environment and related to social. So why uh, they don't agree? So because the feedback to accounting, uh, we know about business entity, business entity concept. So the company is entity then they must responsibility about their activity related to environment and social this one i want to uh, give uh, uh, two dimension about corporate social responsibility if you look a uh, relationship between uh, social uh, social economics and then <clears throat> wide and narrow uh, something like uh, according to Quasi and O'Brien, so uh, corporate responsibility is related to company activities. This one is uh, the point of uh, corporate social responsibility. And then uh, this one, I want to uh, explore about triple bottom line. This is uh, uh, based on sustainability development. So if you look a uh, company, uh, the pressure about this uh, for disclosure, because no standard, no standard uh, for disclosure from company, not just only uh, corporate social responsibility, also sustainability. For example, like this, if you look, uh, concern about environment. Now, uh, many many country is concerned about environment now. Okay, so they they uh, invest for anything for to uh, explore about to save the planet and anything. But they forgot about many people is another word like in Africa, in uh, Palestine, in anything, is hungry. So the problem is not only environment, but include the social, include the social. But pressure now just only in environment, but limited in social. So this is the pressure what I want to know, I want to explore about disclosure because uh, no standard disclosure, social disclosure, no standard. Okay, we know about GRI, we know about uh, uh, ISO uh, 26000. However, many country is different. They have culture, they have different culture. For example, in Indonesia is a lot of culture activity, culture activity. So company is very concerned about culture uh, related to religion activity and and so on 
But if you look in gear I G4, just only one, just only one, the dumps to explore about social. However, activity about this one is very lot. Not only Indonesia, include like Asia, like Thailand, like Malaysia, like uh, East, East European too. They have a culture activity and company is support. However, in if you look in JR4, there are four, just only one point, one dumps. Yeah. So, I mean, we must to elaborate to try to explore again uh, about um, culture activity from uh, uh, East, like Asia, East uh, Europe, and, and so on. So this one is the point. And then uh, about economics, of course, because economics, if company not profit, they, they, don't, uh, they don't concern about social environment. Uh, however, they must to disclose about how they get they they get uh, how they find the profit. They must to transparent they, uh, about how they they find uh, uh, profit, and then is illegal or uh, illegal, like uh, before before uh, this someone uh, professor. Katerina is a uh, research about earning management, but earning management is some some country is legal but limited, but another country is illegal, so, uh, like this. Okay, okay, and then uh, this one is uh, if you look uh, the conclusion about. Uh, triple button line is sustainability. Now is we concern about sustainability, not only for business activity, include social activity, include uh, many things. When first I uh, research about CSR, my concern is about low level and high level activity of a company. It's related to economic disclosure for example a uh, company with uh, chemical company is is uh, uh, I mean they must concern about environment because chemical is very dangerous so they must to make uh, some uh, activity for um, uh, improve environment uh, and then about low level uh, company, so they must to uh, see in social activity by company, for example, like uh, bank, uh, banking, for example, like finance and anything. But the point is, this one is about uh, ethical and financial performance. This, 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 this one is the point of sustainability. Okay. I think this is my uh, I mean my presentation about uh, CSR. So if you ask me how you choose for uh, not conclusion uh, hypothesis uh, for this one, okay, I agree about GRI, but we must to improve again. We must to improve again uh, GRI. So maybe in this conference we may, maybe like uh, someone is uh, give option to make group I think it's very good so we must to elaborate again uh, uh, item or them in uh, GRI okay and last I want to give some uh, some spirit for Thank you very us. Much. <laughs> some spirit for us I say if i die tomorrow i will be all right because i believe they will never come the spirit carry on okay thank you very much for everyone this one this is my presentation thank you thank you edwin uh, 
Hello, Adam. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. Uh, you can. Adam, Adam Balchurzak is next. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. um, Edwin, please. Uh, <laughs> your your microphone. Yes. Okay. So. My, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want me to to upload my presentation now or? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, now uh, I, I want to, to ask uh, Professor Daniel Mayer to allow us to to introduce Professor Adam Balcherzak. I am so sorry for this inconvenience. I know that Professor Mayer is for a while uh, with us, but um, it will be short. Thank you. I'm sure it's fine, Lina. Don't worry about it. Uh, okay, uh, my first question as standard, um, can you see my presentation yes. and can you hear yes. me? Perfect. So um, thank you very much um, uh, for the possibility to, to be here. I would like to thank uh, Professor George Lazario for this possibility to participate in this great event and uh, to make this uh, presentation. So uh, let me let me start with uh, with the topic uh, quality of institutions and entrepreneurship uh, are the new members catching up with the old uh, eu uh, countries so ladies and gentlemen uh, as we do not have much time let me start with uh, the objective uh, the principles of this presentation the main objective uh, is to discuss the dynamics of institutional changes uh, in the EU, but within the context of heterogeneity between old and new EU members. What is important here, I will be talking about, uh, of course, mostly developed or relatively developed countries. Uh, I take the perspective of uh, transformation towards uh, knowledge-based economy, digital economy, or as we have uh, in the topic of current uh, presentation, smart urban uh, economy. And um, I will be uh, taking into perspective here uh, the institutional uh, the institutional framework and uh, the the concept of uh, transaction cost theory, and I will be concentrating mostly on the formal institutional aspects that are uh, that are crucial for the process of relocation of. I think Professor Adam lost uh, the connection. Uh, is there a problem? Yes. Can you can you hear me? Yes, it's now, fine now. Now, now yes. Uh, and the presentation is visible again. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. So can I can I continue? <laughs> yes, Adam, please. Okay. Uh, so. Um, so uh, I will be I will only name uh, the institutional aspects here, which I analyze and take into consideration uh, due to the limited uh, amount of time. Then I will shortly uh, say you uh, or point the methodology, move to the results and uh, conclusions. So. Uh, the first institutional aspect which I take into consideration that are formal regulations uh, influencing entrepreneurship, especially important for uh, startups with high growth uh, potential. Then the second institutional aspects which I uh, analyze that are effectiveness, efficiency of juridical system uh, in keeping low level of transaction costs. Um, but what is important, I do analyze a uh, juridical system from the perspective of its influence on investment decisions, organization decisions, and the scale uh, of uh, enterprises. Then the third institutional aspects which I take into consideration 
is the uh, regulations uh, affecting competitive pressures pressure again from the perspective of innovation potential spill spillover effects and total factor uh, productivity growth the fourth institutional aspects relates to uh, regulations affecting level of labor market transaction costs uh, mostly from the perspective of bur burden for for uh, again entrepreneurs and fast growing enterprises and finally the fifth institutional aspect that are financial markets and uh, and uh, its effectiveness from the perspective of asymmetric information uh, the presence of market uh, transaction uh, costs uh, so uh, this is the uh, the general framework which i take into consideration mostly from the perspective of entrepreneurs uh, startups uh, mostly from the perspective of technologically advanced uh, sectors and its influence uh, for reallocation of resources. So uh, here, the role of minimization of transaction costs uh, is uh, generally uh, crucial. So let me move to the empirics and the multiple criteria analysis. Uh, from the perspective of uh, methodology, uh, again, I want to remind, we are talking about developed economies, knowledge-based economy, uh, so smart urban economy. Uh, we are talking mostly on of, about uh, formal institutions. And what is important, we define quality of institution by instit transaction cost and the objective of minimizing transaction costs. Uh, statistically speaking, I will apply a TOPSIS method, which is commonly known. Uh, the only maybe difference is the metrics which I applied for the method, which is GDM uh, distance uh, measure, mostly due to its uh, statistical uh, characteristics. And uh, the method, uh, and I enables me to, to take into perspective uh, the, 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 uh, the, the individual aspects. So five individual aspects can be analyzed separately. And then I can take overall perspective at the effectiveness of the whole system, uh, which is presented in a, a current, uh, current um, presentation. Uh, and of course, I can group uh, the, the countries into relative groups. Uh, so I analyzed uh, five aspects uh, discussed uh, before. There were 28 potential diagnostic variables. Uh, the detailed presentation uh, with respect to the, to the variables or the discussion behind the institutional aspect is given in this uh, paper. Uh, published in uh, 2020 so if you are interested you can you can uh, look uh, look at this article and uh, let me go to the uh, to the results uh, which are given on this maps so let's let's start with the uh, overall quality of institutions uh, from the perspective of smart urban economy or uh, digital uh, economy uh, lo let's look at the European Union. And of course, if we look at these results at, at this map, especially in the first years, we can see uh, two, uh, generally two spatial regimes with old and new Europe. This uh, division is not so obvious uh, in the end, in the last, uh, in the last, uh, in the fourth uh, map. Uh, look at the uh, dynamics of changes. Uh, they are visible here. So the, the, the most important institutional changes were present uh, in uh, Central European uh, countries. So what we can conclude from this uh, from these results? results. Uh, we have, first of all, especially uh, in the beginning of the research, uh, between all members. 
I think we can attribute it to the process of transformation and uh, moving towards uh, market oriented uh, economies uh, in Central Europe uh, or a process of modernization of Central European economies. Uh, we have significant institutional changes and significant improvements in Central European region, uh, which uh, adjust the region, uh, which adjusts the region to to the reality of knowledge-based economy or uh, smart urban economy. Uh, what is important, <clears throat> we have institutional conditions uh, mostly attributed to the changes uh, which were present in Central Europe. And also quite important, uh, we have lack of significant improvements with respect to quality of institutions with respect to old EU countries. Uh, and of course, we can conclude uh, this, uh, those results in the following way. It is very good from the perspective of our regions that we are improving. Uh, so good news for us, our potential uh, competitive position in the reality of smart urban economy will be uh, stronger, better. But if we look at this result from the perspective of uh, European Union, as a whole, and from the perspective of competition in global scale of the European economy, this result is definitely not good. Uh, if we look at the big European economies uh, which do not improve its uh, institutions from the perspective of digital economy, such as, of course, uh, Italy uh, or Spain or even France, uh, well, it is um, uh, it is quite obvious, but we also can see the problem in, for example, the most important European economy in Germany, which is not improving uh, significantly. Also, and of course, which which sets sets up uh, the 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 most um, uh, important competitive framework from the whole uh, system. So, thank you very much. Uh, if you want to see uh, the detailed. Uh, results, I, I, um, I invite you to read the paper. If you have questions, you can also contact me with uh, my email. Thank you. Thank you very much you, uh, Anna, for Anna. your excellent presentation and for joining us. And uh, congratulations for your uh, uh, first rate journal. Uh, you are uh, the editor <laughs> in chief for Economia Copernicana. That is, uh, uh, it has a huge impact factor. It is in the first quartile in the web of science in economics. Wonderful, congratulations. Well, so, so I invite you also to, uh, to look at the journal, uh, which, which can be found at the website oeconomia.pl. Uh, uh, I invite you to submissions, uh, your, your papers. Thank you. Thank you. Many Thank thanks you again. Yeah, um, now I want to, to invite uh, 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 keynote speakers here if uh, they have any other questions for Professor Adam. If there are questions. Uh, I might have a question, Adam. Well, okay. in terms of entrepreneurship, uh, uh, perhaps uh, development is uh, somehow associated with uh, being in a regional um, advantage area. In terms of, uh, uh, you, you mentioned Germany, but Germany performs uh, uh, perhaps lower than her neighbors, but better than more other countries. And let's say Poland performs better than Romania, let's say, because it is close to Germany and to uh, Nordic countries and so on. Is, is there some sort of a community value of a country by being placed where uh, it would be better to be than uh, there might be other reasons for being competitive? Well, uh, of course, the, 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 the geographical rent is a commonly known uh, fact, but uh, it seems to me that from the perspective of knowledge-based economy, uh, at least we can be...
I think that professor is having a bad connection right now. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I had I some problems uh, probably uh, with with uh, connection. I, I I lost you for for a minute. Yes, that's ah, right. Yes. Okay, but it seems to me that uh, it can be uh, okay now again. So uh, yes. uh, look, for example, at the very good results uh, with respect to to institutional changes in Estonia. Uh, which of course is a small country uh, and uh, was able to transform very quickly, but it was mostly attributed not to uh, geographical reasons, but probably the, the closeness, institutional closeness uh, to, to, to Finland. Uh, and uh, I think that that kind of factors can be, uh, can be much, uh, much more important than uh, than uh, standard uh, geographical uh, issues if of course uh, that was your uh, the core of your question yes that's right uh, i uh, also thought of finland when we when we mentioned estonia perhaps uh, they mm -hmm. they uh, estonia had some sort of historical influence at this at least lately from uh, from finland in, in this respect yes of course i was um, um, when I was doing this research, I was mostly concentrating, as I stressed, uh, on the formal regulations. But but it is obvious that uh, formal institutions, formal uh, formal regulations, are deeply uh, strongly related to to let's say this informal long term uh, rules of the game uh, that are typical for given economies. So uh, that, that, and of course Estonia is the best example here that uh, this this supports the process of uh, modernization of the economy really uh, really strongly thank you so much adam again thank for you. joining us and for your excellent presentation thank yes thank, thank you a lot professor uh, adam for being with us and for honoring us uh, in our conference now uh, I saw that it's ready, uh, Professor uh, Mayer from uh, University of Johannesburg, Gauteng, South Africa. Hello, Professor. Are you ready, Professor Mayer? Hi. Uh, your uh, microphone, Professor. You wanna hear you also. Is there any problem with uh, your microphone, Professor Mayer? Because we cannot hear you. We uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, no, no. The presentation was uh, was okay, Professor Mayer. We cannot hear you. That's all. The presentation was okay. Uh, please uh, verify your microphone, please. Because you, you have a good connection, uh, we can see it, but we cannot hear you, Professor. Um, Yes, you can stop sharing for a moment uh, and to uh, see what's the problem with your uh, microphone because we cannot uh, hear you. And um, if uh, uh, you allow me, uh, I will say uh, a few a few words about yourself uh, until you're preparing your microphone. Uh, 
Uh, professor Daniel Mayer is a professor at the College of Business and Economics and the director of the School of Public Management, Governance and Public Policy at the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. Daniel is a specialist in regional, uh, uh, local economic development analysis and policy development. He has developed various initiative measurement tools, indexes and scales to analyze regional economies. He has authored more than 100 internationally peer-reviewed uh, research papers since 2015 and also uh, has presented more than 60 international conference papers, including a, key, uh, a, a number of keynote addresses. Uh, his research is uh, multidisciplinary throughout the combination of uh, development, economics, business, public management and governance. He has uh, established a large international network of uh, research partners across the globe with a strong focus on the Visegrad group of countries. He also um, he has also successfully completed and uh, delivered more than 40 regional development strategies for local governments and provincial governments. He is also involved in various community development projects in the communities where he lives. Now we, we can hear you. Are you with, uh, with Professor Daniel, uh, Natania? Because we can hear you now. Uh, All right. Good, great, good afternoon. Great, can you hear me now? Good I, afternoon, I, Professor. Now we, you can proceed. All right. I'll proceed. My computer didn't want to unmute. It says settings is wrong. We never use uh, this platform. So it's a little bit of a problematic platform. It says I must uh, reset my computer and my microphone to unmute it. So I don't know what was the problem there, but now it's fine. Everything is working. Yeah. So the presentation is about, I'll go back, please, on one slide. Uh, the presentation is about the assessment of the interrelationships between country risk, economic growth, and good governance, the case of the Visegrad 4. As you said, I'm from Johannesburg, University of Johannesburg. And uh, this topic has been uh, this type of topic we've used to analyze uh, data uh, using econometrics. And uh, this is one in a series of uh, various uh, articles we're busy with. It is basically putting a African tripod and you put in data in it and you mix it up and you come up with interesting results. So many of the times we don't only use e e economic uh, variables, but we also use other types of variables in one uh, equation. Um, investors assess the environment and the level of risk before they can invest in a specific region or a country. And globally, there are many uh, country risk indexes uh, that has been developed since the 1990s and using risk factors such as politics, the economy and sovereign risk factors. And these indexes include many of them, but the main ones is the, is the uh, risk agencies, the risk rating agencies like Moody's, Standard & Poor and Fitch, as well as the country risk classification by OECD the PRS International Country Risk Guide, and also the Euro Money Country Risk Index. For this article, I used the Country Risk IO uh, Country Risk Index for 2021, and it goes back to many years back, but we've used since 1996. And the country risks refer mainly to the performance and stability of governance in a country. So I'm using those three uh, variables, country risk, good governance and economic growth in this case. And uh, let's see how the results look like. Okay, so good governance is one of my variables and it's very much related to country risk. More and more the risk rating agencies are looking at various components of good governance. If you look, up, look at the World Bank, they've got their World uh, Governance Index and uh, that includes uh, effective government, political stability, the quality of the regulations, corruption control, rule of law. And there's other data sets also looking at uh, good governance. And as you know, good governance is very much related to economic growth and development. They go together. So we wanted to see the relationships between all of these. If you look at uh, the graphs, if you look at the graphs there, 
The first one on the left hand side is the country risk index. And uh, the lower in this case, the better the country is performing. So if you look at the left hand one, it is the Czech Republic. It's got the best country risk, although it has spiked upwards uh, in the late 2019 and it has surpassed Poland. So actually Poland has got the lowest one at the mo in 2019. And then uh, it's uh, Slovakia and worst off is Hungary with the country risk index. The middle graph is the size of the economy, the GDP. And as you know, Poland by far the fastest growing and the biggest economy of the four countries, uh, followed by the Czech Republic and Hungary and lastly Slovakia. And if you look at the good governance of effective governance indexes between minus 2.5 and plus 2.5, all of the four countries are declining in their indexes but the czech republic is still by far the highest uh, index for good governance and followed by slovakia poland and hungary so uh, that's just a summary of the status quo the country com comparison in the article there's much more information um, the methodology used was um, quantitative in nature and we've looked at the four Visegrad countries uh, from 1996 to 2019. And an econometric model was formulated to achieve the objective of the study to analyze these relationships between the three variables. We've used a pool panel uh, analysis, which include cross-sectional component of the, the four uh, countries, as well as time series data. The, for the three variables, uh, country risk we got from the uh, country risk IO uh, database. Uh, it shows us the sovereign country risk index in a composite index, including political, economic, and social components. And the index indicates the level of sovereign risk in the level of zero up to zero up to 100. And the index were inverted to have the same trend as the other two variables because good good uh, risk index must go up and their index goes down a low index means good but i've just in, inverted it if it, a high score means it's a good um, low risk the gdp you know what it stands for from the world bank and then good governance from the world bank uh, good governance uh, indicators and the equation that the basic one is just uh, uh, country risk index is the dependent variable with the other two independent variables as predictors of country risk levels. We did three types of regressions, uh, uh, panel regressions in this case, to just have some robustness and testing and to see if we've got same results or different results. So what is important in this uh, uh, result is firstly, we did a panel OLS estimation. And you can see that country risk is the dependent variable with GDP. All of the variables were placed in log, in log form. So a 1% increase in the GDP would cause a 0.166% increase in the country risk, improvement in the country risk rating. And it's significant. The proper P values were significant for that, as well as for the good governance. GG stands for good governance. And it's a similar increase also at a, at a significant impact, a positive impact of uh, 0.128%. So it's quite similar, the impact of GDP on the country is similar to the good governance. So good governance in terms of the basic OLS estimation had a positive impact on the country risk rating. The second analysis we did is the fixed effect uh, model estimation. The same uh, process were followed. And you can see that uh, in terms of this analysis, good governance were not a significant predictor for uh, country risk uh, changes. Although it had a very small impact, but not significant. While GDP, on the other hand, had a significant impact and a 1% increase in GDP would lead to a 0.3% percent increase improvement in the country risk index and then the last robustness analysis were fmols uh, panel estimation 
And uh, in this case, it confirmed the uh, panel OLS, the first estimation was similar to the OLS, F, F moles one. And uh, we've got similar coefficients, uh, impacts, and they both, both of them were significant at 5% levels in this case. So overall, it looks like GDP, 1% uh, increase in GDP could lead to a 0.1516% increase and the good governance. One of the tests uh, did not indicate significant impact, but the other two did indicate. So overall, we can say that good governance had a positive impact on the country risk index. In terms of causality, we also looked at a panel causality analysis and uh, all of the independent variables are uh, do cause changes in the country risk index. So it comes from GDP does cause country risk as well as good governance cause country risk, not the other way around. So it's just a unidirectional causality. And interesting is that good governance does cause improvements or growth in the GDP, but not other way around. So that is very interesting for, for, for the future. And uh, conclusion, uh, the, the, the main conclusion is that we wanted to fill the gap and to do some research using some unique variables, mixing up uh, governance variables with economic variables. Uh, the limitations, uh, yeah, the, the time frame is not so long, 1996 to 2019. We're hoping to uh, look into the future for 2020-21, what happened in the COVID era of that. But we are limited uh, using World Bank data, which starts only from 1996. But as a panel analysis, there's more than enough observations. Future studies will include more comparisons of regions and individual countries and adding additional variables such as FTI, interest rates, inflation, other governance indicators such as government debt, rule of law, political stability and corruption control. The implication of the research is important for both developed and developing countries. Lower country risks have a positive relationship with economic growth and macroeconomic factors as well as good governance. Countries are affected in different ways regarding the different types of risk affecting country risk indexes or ratings. And these factors include political, economic, sovereign, and social risk. High levels of good governance are required to ensure lower country risk and increased economic growth and development. A good governance factor is sustainable debt management, for example, and effective control measures will contribute to lower country risk and economic performance. Therefore, through effective policy implementation, governance policies should strive to lower country risk as far as possible to reap the rewards of future investment, domestic as well as foreign direct investment. Thank you. And uh, any questions uh, are we, we can try to answer. Thank you. Uh, dear Professor Mayer, oh, okay, okay, please ask, ask you first. It's okay, Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I am Alexandra Radu from uh, Teseo Institute. Uh, I, I want to ask uh, Professor because uh, his work is what uh, it was great and um, very interesting. And I want to ask the professor, I'm not, I know that uh, applying the economic evaluation indicators uh, that uh, the professor presented um, about in the paper, uh, there is the possibility to estimating a future armed conflict, um, such a conflict um, for example, uh, conflict uh, between Ukraine and Belarus, uh, I'm uh, referring. It is possible to apply uh, this um, um, this um, economic evaluation uh, in uh, our uh, situation uh, in Europe. Uh, it is possible to estimate in such a conflict, Professor. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, any conflict wars, uh, I know on the border between Belarus and Poland, there were a situation building up. 
that will have an impact on the country risk uh, ratings done by international country risk uh, agencies. So it will have a negative impact on those countries and the region. And that is very important to note. And it will have an impact on, on all of the components of the risk uh, assessments for countries. It will have an impact on the economics of that area. It will have an impact on uh, governance uh, indicators. So any conflict is important to analyze. And we can have a variable, and they, there is a variable available for conflict, wars, and so on, in terms of the uh, PRS, International Country Guide Index, that they use that as a sub-component uh, of their aggregate uh, risk index. So that could be a separate study, definitely the impact of conflict, wars on the economy of a country as well as the risk rating indexes. So definitely for future studies, you can have a look at that. Thank you, Professor. Well, my question is whether there is some uh, recent research regarding whether um, the four countries uh, constituting the, the Visegrad the group uh, uh, have more economic relationships among them or some of them with other countries outside the group? All right. Let's say if I understand your question correctly, maybe why did I select Visegrad? And is the Visegrad group really an uh, interconnected group of countries that uh, do trade with each other and they are homogeneous in yes. terms of a region? And uh, yes, let's take another example, the BRICS countries. The BRICS countries are uh, China, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, and India. Those countries are not a homogeneous group of countries. So I never do research on those ones. But the Visegrad countries, I've done many research on them individually and as groups. And uh, they've got similar uh, trajectories in terms of their economic growth, their governance situation on the graphs i've showed they are following the same type of uh, path in terms of economics governance um, many other factors that i've looked at in the past are similar they are a group that has got a formal uh, council that comes together uh, uh, annually and they are bordering each other and it's a homogeneous group of countries. So the panel analysis I've done for them together, it is significant in terms of statistical uh, tests, but individually also it is significant. So I feel that the Visegrad countries are one of those groups globally that has got uh, interrelationships and are very homogeneous. And it's a very important group of countries as uh, Poland, for example, is the fastest growing Western country in the last 20 years. And that's affecting the countries around them to also be very much more positive in terms of growth and governance and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, you, you asked me one week ago, I think, about uh, a journal where you, you can publish your work. Now, I think you, you saw earlier Professor uh, Adam Balcherzak, so uh, <laughs> I think uh, uh, his journal is uh, appropriate for you, for your work. Thank um, you. Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, um, we uh, have the next presentation, the no next keynote speaker, Elisa Petrova from uh, Vasilevsky National Military University, Veliko Ternovo, Republic of Bulgaria who is going to talk uh, about uh, uh, the cadets problem in the educational process. Uh, Elisa, please proceed. Is it visible? Yes. Presentation is visible, yes? Okay, yes. so so their colleagues say, uh, it is so hard, hard to speak after so many erudite and uh, wonderful persons and lecturers and uh, professors and uh, 
uh, after the articles in with so uh, big uh, with high level impact so i decided to, to do something different i will present really briefly our university for example for two minutes and then uh, i uh, uh, will show you a film for our university uh, for three minutes for example so uh, uh, maybe to be more it will be more interesting i hope for you uh, and then i go really briefly in two minutes maybe uh, through my uh, presentation of my article and uh, first of all i would like to to share our greetings and um, to say that it it is my great pleasure to be among you and uh, uh, would like to uh, to share greetings from our readership from especially from our brigadier general of national military university and from vice rector and um, uh, we are proud that uh, we have very wonderful cooperation with spiro Harit university and of course with elena uh, especially uh, which we started uh, before maybe before 10 years and it, it uh, lasts till now and i'm hope that uh, i hope that i'm sure in fact that it will continue in the future so please uh, uh please uh, would like to, to thank you again for this opportunity and uh, get our greetings from our leadership and some uh, slides from Vasilevsky National Military University. I know that uh, my presentations will be very different from uh, uh, the other colleagues, but I hope uh, they will be interesting for you. And uh, a little uh, in brief, we'll share some information. The National Military University dates back to the autumn of uh, 1878, when in September the 1st, in Filipopolis now Plovdiv, the Imperial Russian Commissioner in Bulgaria, Adjutant General Prince Alexander Mikhailovich Dondukov Korsakov, signed order on the military administration of the Bulgarian Land Army, with which it appointed the first common staff on the Sofia Military School, consists of six people. And you can see uh, our uh, first building in this uh, so um, so early years in uh, the start of our uh, military education um, then uh, our military uh, university uh, was divided in uh, three faculties uh, land forces faculty aviation faculty and uh, uh, artillery faculty uh, now it consists uh, two faculties in veliko ternovo land forces and uh, faculty of artillery and uh, uh, informational technologies and the mission of Vasilevsky National Military University is to build its uh, graduates morally, mentally and physically to include them in uh, ideas of patriotism, duty and honor to form them as individuals and leaders with established leadership qualities able to develop and apply scientific knowledge to manage public and special structures in peacetime and crisis and to participate in national and multinational projects for maintaining security preserving peace and developing society and uh, uh, some information about our education we training cadets for a bachelor degrees and students for bachelor degrees also, we have um, uh, bachelor and master pro uh, programs for students. We also have training of doctoral students. Also, uh, other other uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, this we do uh, in uh, three areas of higher education, social, economic and legal sciences, technical sciences, security and defense, and in seven professional fields, 15 civilian and one military specialty. We also prepare contingents of Bulgarian army for participation in mission abroad. You can see some part of our education in our university. Again, we you have uh, possibility to see some uh, activities in our university. 
and some words uh, of greetings from our general. The moment I became head of the Vasilevsky National Military University, I realized what an extremely key role this university has for the Bulgarian army. Here we are uh, as a family. We take care of the cadets 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 365 days a year. With us, the cadets are fully supported by the state, receive scholarship, are fed, dressed, cared for. When they graduate, they received an appointment and a 10-year contract the next day. And here, I would like to, to do a little pause. And please, uh, Elena, is it possible to send you, to send you in our common chat one link to yes. our film for our university yes. three to four minutes not more please uh, please start it to so to all of us to have a uh, possibility to see it now oh <laughs> let's see I, I i haven't did it before i don't know how it works uh let's see. or maybe i will try i will try uh, to oh I will try. Is it okay? Yes. Ah. Yes. Okay. Can you hear it? Uh, not. Can, but we, can we, you? We, we cannot hear it, but, cannot. but we can see it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> It's okay like this. Okay. This is uh, from uh, your university? That's yes. What you do? This is from our university. In fact, uh, we have uh, uh, annually. Um, this is a training? Every year. Yes, it is tactical exercises on the field. Wow, wow. Impressive, really. And the music is... Uh, very uh very good but <laughs> I, I am sure of it uh, but the image is better than you know that any other music it's really impressive wow <laughs> so uh, it is normal in fact uh, every year our cadets have uh, this uh, Annual tactical exercise. Yes. Um, we have we have different polygons how to, to do this. Oh, I see. And we have very good professionals, of course, our colleagues officers. Mm -hmm. We trained a lot there. They're they're really good trained. Very very good trained. Like in the and movies. Yeah, you can see. Like in the yes. movies. <laughs> American mm -hmm. movies. I saw that you participate with uh, your cadets uh, in, in uh, a lot of uh, military actions uh, abroad. Uh, wow. Can no, we have the PowerPoint presentation of the Professor Petrova of the Yes, uh, she, Academy? Yes, she's going yes, 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 it is in our common chat, in fact. It is on our common this chat. This is the film, but the link of the film, but the, the, link. Uh, the, PowerPoint, the PowerPoint presentation. Your PowerPoint presentation. She's going to... to to put it right uh, here to, to talk about the presentation right now, I think. Ah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you. The, the the link is in our common chat. So if you are interested, in, you can uh, you, you can use it. And uh, briefly, as I uh, already mentioned, uh, my empirical uh, study in the real environment on the problems of students and cadets' performance in the educational process. Can you see the the presentation? Yes, we can see it. Yes? Okay, okay. Everything is fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Only briefly, I will uh, explain uh, some part of, uh, of the studies. So, timely analysis of motivational excellence uh, in the training process based on higher educational institution in Europe is a necessary pre executive for uh, forming up a complex picture characterizing the state of the higher education institution in terms of the motivational methods used, the individual satisfaction, the forms and the levels on the achieved motivational silence, and in the training process in the sphere insecurity and defense and it is a uh, no study which is conducted between 2012 and 2019 currently in this year now its results are implemented um, are honored and implemented by the management by leadership of the national military university uh, in different uh, activities for cadets and uh, students so more than uh, 300 different sources were investigated and only a small part of them uh, uh, was reflected in uh, this paper, uh, namely on the issue of basic of motivation and re a relationship between environment and motivation, on the difference between internal and external motivation and the relationship uh, in strict motivation and self-determination in human behavior and in the terms of methodology for conducting the study on motivation for education for cadets and students. And the main method used was empirical uh, statistics study conducted in a real environment, expert opinions on motivational expression um, was uh, was taken from the Department of Military Science, uh, from expert from the Department of Communicational and Informational System, expert from Department of Resource and Technology Management, expert from Department of Population and Infrastructure Protection, Logistic of Security, National and Regional Security, and Specialized Training. They give uh, their opinion on the students and cadet performance. And you can see uh, the models and different questions and the, uh, the results. The first figure presented the per participation of the trainees during, during the seminars. And you can see the answers. Uh, the figure two uh, presented initiation by the trainees of activities for the purpose of the de development of their personal and professional qualities and skills. Then the learning outcomes really reflects if, if they really reflect the uh, intellectual effort that learners make. It uh, was one of the questions to our experts. Methods used to motivate uh, students in uh, order to achieve higher academic results. You can see uh, some positive support, uh, some sanctions, and I do not use uh, motivational methods. Some explanation and opinions of our experts. Use of motivation based on rewards and incentives. Use of motivation based on sanctions and coercive measures. And maybe one opinion of the expert from National Military University. I use sanctions and coercive measures only at the beginning of my work, which a certain category to emphasize that uh, violating safety measures of incompetent handling of weapons, ammunition, or imitations, weapons, and dangerous the health and life of all of us. 
when you reach an understanding in the team that any mistake, ignorance and incompetence can lead to fatal consequence, sanctions and coercion are no longer needed. You receive both personal motivation from each trainees and internal control within the military unit. You can see the application of some collective negative reinforcements. And the analysis of, of the results obtained from the experimental study in the real environment on the problem of students and cadets performance in educational process show some tendencies. Participation of the trainees during the seminars and academic and trainees exercise was at a satisfactory level, but there was still something to be achieved as a result, as 20% of the survey experts believe that the participation is unsatisfactory and 30% believe that it is only in accordance with the set task. Initiation by the trainees of activities for the purpose of the development of their personal and professional qualities and skills were at a satisfactory level, but results signalized that there were some learners who did not take su such initiatives. Learning outcomes really reflected the intellectual efforts that the learners made in a total of 70% of cases. As methods used to motivate learners in order to achieve higher academic results, the positive motivation and motivation by, based on sanctions and rewards was indicated. Methods of motivation in the training process based on coercive me measures were also indicated, but rather as setting a common task to carry out or make a joint effort rather than involving any corporal punishment. Thank you very much to your attention. Thank I you, hope Anna, Teresa. It was interesting. Very, Thank you. very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, for us, uh, all was new. And uh, allow me now, uh, until you're um, thinking to put Alisa a question, uh, to uh, say a few words about Alisa and about um, uh, her institution. Uh, Elisa Petrova is an associate professor in the field of social, economic and legal sciences and doctor in economics and management uh, and also doctor of science in security and defense at the Vasilevsky National Military University from Veliko Trnovo, Bulgaria. Uh, she is one of the Erasmus coordinators and leader for Horizon for the university and also she conducted lectures in many foreign universities and academies in Romania, Slovakia, Czech Republic, uh, Poland, and uh, Hungary. And also allow me to say a few words uh, about um, uh, her institution, because uh, her institution is also a co-partner in um, this conference. Uh, Vasilevsky National Military University of Bulgaria conducts training for cadets and students in three years of higher education social, economic, and legal sciences, technical sciences, security and defense, details in seven professional fields, 15 civilian and one military specialty, and uh, 21st military specialization corresponding to the branches and special forces. Also, the university conducts training for PhD students in 15 accredited spe specific specialties, as well as contingents in the Bulgarian army for participation and missions abroad. Thank you a lot, uh, Elisa, for being uh, with us today until morning, uh, until the first hour in the morning, in fact. It was my great. pleasure, Elena. Thank you for your you were, friendship. You were great Thank you. because uh, you supported us so much, uh, so many hours, so much time. So uh, we have here... Uh, uh, Professor uh, Isakov, Bakhtibek Isakov, uh, from, um, uh, let me see, uh, from Kyrgyz Turkish Manas University, Bishkek, Kyrgyz Republic, where the structuring the idea throughout data hypothesis and a triangle, uh, a title triangles, and we have another professor also after that. Uh, so, Professor Isakov, when you are ready, please proceed. Professor Isakov also is uh, with us until the first hour in the morning. 
uh, how are you all? It's really not so good to be in the last, to be in the last part. You are not the last, professor, professor Wilfred is the last, Professor Wilfred. But, but dear, dear Professor Isakov, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> you are the last, right? You must know that the whole conference is yeah. recorded. And we are so much thankful to the people who, for their patience, who are still now with us, right? Uh, so, it's already nine o'clock evening, PM. Wow, in your country in my, it's nine o'clock? In my country, wow. yeah. <laughs> you lost all, all day with I'm, us. I'm still in my office. Wow, <laughs> we appreciate this a lot, Professor. But, but no, no, no. Uh, dear Professor uh, Isakov, no, no, no. you don't I, have to... I mean, the presentations are was really, really interesting. <laughs> and i so much happy that, that I, I was a part of this conference and want to keep my collaboration with all of you if, 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 it, if it is possible, right? So, um, uh, here is my presentation. Um, let's I start. Yes. Uh, the title of my presentation is, as you see, Structuring the Idea Through Data, Hypothesis and Title Triangles, right? Uh, let's some background on my uh, presentation, actually. In between 2009 and 2015, I spent a semester at Harvard University I was a visiting scholar one year in Busan University in South Korea. I was also a postdoctoral researcher for 10 months in Padova University in Italy. Wow. To a good fortune, I could participate in six different academic writing summer schools in this cities, Istanbul, Almaty, Tbilisi, and that stuff. The main title of my of the schools that I took part uh, were what are the scopes indexed journals? What are the main criteria, the main article writing techniques? Now I would like to present my paper basing on the knowledge that I got from those six different academic writing schools, as well as from the professors working at, uh, work at, at Harvard, Pusan, and Padua universities. So here is my, here is the title of my presentation, the idea, data, hypothesis, and title. I tried to explain the, my topic with, with a simple way. So today, there are two kinds of articles, as you know. Simple article, I, use, I usually say it's simple article, written with an, an ordinary way. Uh, all the academic journals of universities, institutions, organizations, usually before 10 years ago, 15 years ago, usually the format was like this, simple way. Now I try to visualize my presentation as much as possible in order to give uh, reliable uh, information. So, so um, my question here in this presentation is, what is the difference, the main difference between the indexed journals, which is social science citation index, Scopus, and simple articles? Let's see. So, the first difference is size. Usually, simple articles in simple journals, in classical way, they are usually five to seven, five to ten pages usually. As you see here, this is the introduction part of the article. It's about half page. Then the main body, four, five, four, seven pages, and this is the conclusion, right? You know, before the citation index or, or scopes journals 
or 10 or 15 years ago, all we, all the academicians were writing dislike articles, right? The simple way. Maybe some of us still write dislike classical or traditional articles. Now, this is the difference visually. As you see, this is the simple way of article that we were writing 10 years or 15 years ago. Maybe still we write these like articles in this way. But the articles in indexed journals, in scopes journals, the article visually looks like this. Taller than, than classical one. And the sizes, the articles in index journals start from 14 to 25. Sometimes I see 31, 32 page articles. But they usually ask minimum 8,000 words, right? <clears throat> Let's focus more in detail now. So, in indexed journals, I mean the Scopus Social Science Citation Index or Science Citation Index journals. This is the visual display of the article. And this, the first thing is abstract. Abstract, right? It's usually 250 to 350 words. The sizes and also and also uh, as you know as all you know the abstract abstract must include the main argumentation of the article and the methodology as well these two must be in abstract We, we got uh, very nice seminars of editors of scopes journals basing on their courses. I'm pretty sure say that every abstract, if you want to write an, up, an article for a scopes journal or citation index journals, the abstract must include two things. The main argumentation and methodology. So, introduction. Introduction looks like this, but in size, it's usual. It usually, it usually the introduction takes or consists of twenty-five percent of whole article. Twenty-five percent usually. It usually four five pages you see it's so big right again again this introduction part also must include the main argumentation and methodology but not only this i will stop later and the main body this is the main body. And the main body of the article usually consists about 65% of the whole article. But it usually from 8 to 12 pages. In conclusion, also looks dislike. And it takes or it consists of one and a half pages. Conclusion, one and a half pages. Again, the conclusion must include the methodology, the main argumentation, and some recommendation as well. It must include this kind of, these points. So, 
Let's see this one. When we when we finish our article, and we send to a journal, indexed journal, scopes or what what else? Cited index journals. We send usually whole article. It's not correct, actually. You know, it's not correct. We need sent an abstract because the abstract is the advertisement, the, ad the advertisement of your article. It's like the trailer. It's like the trailer of your film. And the abstract must be written hamburger model in hamburger model. Every sentence, every sentence must full fill in the some kind of gaps. So let's say stop on the introduction. So when you send to a scopes journal your abstract. They read it, and if they like it, it, like this advertisement, they write you back. Okay, abstract is very interesting. Please send us the whole article. When you send the whole article, as the, again the editors from Scopes journals, they told us the editors usually read. After after abstracts, they, when they got whole article, they only read introduction part only, not whole but not whole article, on introduction. Because introduction includes, as you see, these twelve points. They must be these twelve points must be in every introduction part of articles that written for the scopes journals that written for the social science or science citation index journal for example cook general background scope and limitation key definition theories gap puzzle papers contribution brief literature review research question or thesis statement, methodology. For example, methodology. For example, when you write the methodology and introduction part, there is very clear, um, very clear standards, I may say, how to write it how to describe the methodology and even an introduction part which longs for four pages or five years for five pages in which place must be this methodology what is the size of the methodology what kind of information must be in this methodology so interesting and so enjoying details it has. When I teach this, uh, I usually uh, give my seminars for the young academicians and I stop in this introduction or I give this introduction in different, different in three seminars, each for one and a half hours. I will stop every detail. As a final word, transferring a simple article into a science citation index or scopes format journals is very, very interesting and very, very enjoying topic that I really, really like. I really, really enjoy so much. I have no very limited time to talk but I may deliver my presentation if you write me. And also I can give a, a seminar, it's free of charge.
for your PhD students, for your master's students, for the young academicians in your universities or institutions. If you really think it's, the seminar is useful, um, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Allah, Professor Isaac. Because it short, because it was uh, told us that we have only ten minutes, right? If you yes. have any um, uh, questions, yes. suggestions, comments, critics, you may write me. You may send me a friendship on Facebook. Yeah, if you have any question now, please. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Uh, the best part of this article was that hamburger because I'm so hungry at this hour, Professor. <laughs> I was just joking right now, of course. You are hungry and tired, right? No, 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 tired because um, I I did not know when uh, the, the time runs, you know. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm not really hungry, but, uh, you know, I'm still happy because I have you all around us uh, this uh, hour. A few words about Professor Bakti Bekisakov. Um, uh, he teaches uh, at Kyrgyz uh, Turkish Manas University in uh, Bishkek, uh, Kyrgyzstan. He is uh, the author of several monographs and many articles in peer review uh, journals. And he took part in a variety of international projects and is a co-founder of online university in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. If you want to add something else, Professor, you are free to, to do it. And um, if there are uh, questions for Professor Isakov, please, uh, you are free to... Yes, yes, Elisa, of course. Thank you very much, Elena. Not question, but only to say that it is a very important topic because in our society, the moral of uh, science um, um, maybe is the most important things. For example, the good citation behavior, um, the the using of uh, the correct using of resources, and uh, also in uh, in this regard, uh, we with our leadership. Uh, pl planned to to do some uh, internal course for our academics in this uh, in this topic. Also, uh, the Web of Science Academy have uh, very good uh, seminars and courses on uh, reviewing on uh, behavior in uh, um, in science. So it is very very important topic. To it is not only to to collect some information and to to publish it, but to to publish real information with real uh, study in the real environment and uh, to be uh, correct to your colleagues because uh, we are not only scientists, we are lecturers and uh, we must teach the, the next generation, uh, the, the young people, how to, to behave. So to give a good example. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Elitza. Thank you, thank you, Elisa. Uh, if there are um, any other questions for Professor? If you if you allow me to put a question. Yes. So thank you very much for your presentation. I just want, uh, want, wanted to ask you, um, some of the index, the journals uh, perceive a payment, yes? So uh, when uh, we go through the accreditation of university programs, it is stipulated that the management of institutions should uh, either cover costs for publishing um, um, articles um, in these index journals, uh, for example, in Scopus journals, yes, or to, um, to premium uh, the researchers. Uh, what is the practice in your country? Um, thank you, Victoria. That's a really good question that uh, usually I got this kind of questions. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in my country, I usually write my articles in English, in Turkish, and in Russian. Uh, and I never paid any single penny for to publish my articles. But uh, yeah, I heard some. There are some journals that. Uh, do charging for the publishing, but uh, um, I have, I don't know how, but you know, there are a lot of, really, really a lot of 
um, journals uh, that you can send um, your article and um, you can find that uh, the, the Twitch uh, who published your article for free. Um, I never suggest uh, to apply those journals if they charge, I don't know, it's some kind of commercial. Um, uh, you, you may send your article if you have, uh, and I also may suggest you the Russian journals, um, the journals in Turkey, uh, yeah, I think there are plenty of, but we need, actually, we need to work on the uh, article very, very seriously. Um, in that way, it's, it's not so hard to publish. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Professor Isakov. If um, there are any other questions, please proceed. If they are not, um, <laughs> we uh, ask Professor uh, Wilfred, if uh, he is here with us, to proceed and um, to, to present uh, his paper. Professor Wilfred. Uh, so I'm still with you guys. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me see if I can upload the paper from here. Uh, um, next to the hand, there is a square with an arrow. Yeah, uh, I have seen it. Press, press, press uh, that uh, button. And after Which that, uh, you have uh, to choose the first option to, to share all your screen. Uh, uh, am I choosing my, my entire screen? Yes your entire screen okay. and after okay, that you have to push on the icon that appears on uh, your screen there is an icon with your uh, desktop push that icon and after that push the send button send to all or okay. something like this oh okay Yes, it's preparing. Yes, it's preparing. great job. And now you have to choose from uh, your desktop the presentation. Oh. But I think you haven't pushed that button to allow us to see your screen. But anyway, you can try it. Not oh, stop okay. presenting. Do, do, do not stop share. Not stop sharing. Okay. You are okay now. You you can um, uh, uh, let us in uh, your um, you know. I, I don't know how to right. to to say. You have to. Okay, to oh, should, should I stop uh, sharing your document? Yeah, let me open my yes, document. Yes, 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 from there, from there, yes. Yeah, let me open my document. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, right, good. Uh, webinar conference. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, I'm no, back no, no, now. no, 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 it was okay. It was okay. Now we cannot see it. I don't know. But you you have to, like, you have to you take the me? presentation from the, yes, yes. That's okay. Um, it's okay. Are you still seeing it now? Yes, yes, it's okay. We, we can see it. Okay. okay no, that from is the fine. beginning, you, you can, yes. Great, great, Professor. Thank you okay okay thank you very much but you are not seeing me uh I, no uh, yes we can see you but um uh, yes but why, why but you not cannot see, see us you cannot see us but we can see you oh okay fantastic okay yes. no, that is fine this is google yeah. meet oh okay you know, you know, naturally, we normally use Zoom in my institution. I know, we I use, know. 
Yeah, we use Zoom and uh, Microsoft Team, you know. So uh, yes, yes. I'm just, I'm just uh, trying to understand yours also. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, it's wonderful to be back to Romania. I know that I was with you guys uh, uh, during the last conference. And uh, in fact, uh, this other conference also, I think uh, Professor Lena just told me, well, Fred, prepare you are one of the keynote speakers. And uh, in spite of the fact that I have other academic uh, commitment in Namibia, uh, because I'm actually spending my sabbatical in Namibia, but I felt, no, I have to work and be part of you guys. So it's a pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the title of my presentation is actually Techno Globalization and Labor Sustainability in an Era of Fourth Industrial Revolution. And in fact, uh, I, I decided to work on this paper uh, within the time constraint uh, because uh, uh, I, I actually, uh, when I check the theme of the conference, I know that it has to do with uh, fourth industrial revolution or industrial 4.0, and of course, issues around technologies and big data. So I felt, okay, I should uh, prepare a quick and specific paper on uh, title related to your conference theme. Right. Now, in terms of uh, issues surrounding uh, uh, techno globalization, uh, like I have said, uh, uh, when we talk about uh, globalization, uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, putting techno into is, we must know that we are talking about uh, the triumph of capitalism. Can you see? The triumph of capitalism. Uh, some few years back, I was in Romania and I saw the big uh, buildings in Romania, which is actually uh, the legacy of the socialist uh, system in Romania. Uh, I think I made an inquiry, why all these uh, tall and long buildings? And they told me it was part of the socialist uh, uh, past. Uh, I think that was where Romania was under socialism. But of course, with the triumph of capitalism, uh, of course, many countries are opening up and embracing uh, uh, capitalism. And of course, when we talk ab uh, about capitalism, we know that it is based on the concept of competition, profit motive, private enterprises, which is of course self-interest. And of course, cap capitalism is actually based on scientific management. Can you see? They emphasize issues of science in the management of things. And of course, most of these Catholics, or uh, most of this uh, doctrine of capitalism, are the main things or the main catalysts that set capitalism in motion in terms of their expansion, exploration, and of course, exploitation. Can you see those key catalysts set the motion for capitalist expansion, exploration, and of course, exploitation. All right. And of course, uh, uh, we, we must keep in mind that one area, one notable area uh, where capitalism has naturally done exceptionally better than other economic system is within the realm of technological innovation. They exploit technological innovation. Of course, we know that the socialist idea was the first to put somebody in the moon. That is the Russian uh, experiment, but of course, uh, uh, capitalism in terms of exploring innovation and technology went far ahead of Russia. And in fact, that is why uh, from, from all indication, it seems that they are ahead in so many uh, technological uh, exploration and inventions. All right. Hence, capitalist globalization and technology go hand in hand. Can you see? Capitalist globalization and technology go hand in hand. They are inseparable, which is why at the dawn of globalization, there was a perception that globalization has spoiled capital, uh, globalization has spoiled technology, simply also the same way technology has spoiled globalization. And in fact, uh, people were saying that globalization wouldn't have become possible without technological innovation through the discovery of the internet. And of course, uh, uh, you can see how the world became a single global village 
out of this interconnected uh, interconnectedness of technology of course with that technology uh, certainly i don't think uh, uh, we will be having a very powerful uh, globalization so on that basis uh, we have authorities uh, who believe that uh, 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 globalization is based on technological determin uh, determinism, all right? Then, of course, uh, uh, if I will just share light a little bit of my research uh, objective and approach, uh, actually, uh, when we talk about some of the problem uh, related to the research, uh, the fact of the matter is that there is a growing concern that, if, uh, that in few years to come, Human labor will, as we know it, human labor may, as we know it, vanish from the production chain due to the incursion of high power technological innovation in the age of fourth industrial revolution. And of course, in terms of the objective, uh, the paper explored techno globalization and labor sustainability in an era of a fourth industrial revolution. And with regards to the uh, approach, owing to the constraint of time, like I told you, uh, it will not be uh, feasible for one to actually go into the field to gather some primary data. So the paper uh, was actually uh, uh, the paper was actually developed uh, through a kind of conceptual analysis. It's a conceptual paper that relied majorly on secondary data. And of course, it considered techno globalization from an emic perspective. The paper also entails thick theory building, uh, review of pertinent literature, and utilization of natural scientific approach in analyzing divergent perspectives. All right. Key doctrines of good capitalist globalization, we'll look at it uh, once, in a, uh, once more. Uh, the first doctrine there is doctrine of private uh, enterprises. Capitalism believed that individuals should be the owners of the mechanisms of production, that everything should be left for individuals, that individuals, while pursuing their own self-interest, better the interests of everyone. Can you see it? So on the basis of that, that is why we see now big corporations that are owned by individuals rather than government. Can you see? So they believe that uh, the government that governs less is the best government, unlike the socialist uh, system where uh, government uh, uh, governs more. So one of the doctrines of capitalist globalization was, of course, the doctrine of private enterprises. And of course, we can also see that for most of the private, uh, privatization uh, that took place at the dawn of uh, globalization. Uh, many organizations were privatizing. In fact, up to even Russia, that was one of the strength of socialist uh, activities. Many privatizations were taking place in Russia, even in China also, we witnessed so many issues related to uh, privatization. So it kind of a change uh, from the status quo. Then, of course, uh, another key doctrine of uh, capitalist globalization or global capitalism is the doctrine of competition. Can you see? Capitalism believes in competition. Can you see that people should compete between themselves? And in fact, when we compete, we better the laws for humankind. And of course, in terms of this competition, the competition will spread through a different arena of competition in terms of price, in terms of product, in terms of the quality of our goods. So competition, of course, in the global village has become like a hurricane. And of course, uh, the survivor within the village move ahead while, of course, uh, 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 the weak perish within that global village. It's almost akin to social Darwinist uh, principle of survivor of the fittest. So capitalism or global capitalism is, of course, based on uh, uh, the doctrine uh, of competition. And of course, most of this scientific exploitation, innovation, and technological prowess that we are seeing are all in the name of competition. The competition is a, a, a kind of effort by organizations to want to outwit or to want to, of course, uh, succeed more than their rivals. Can you see? So that is why we are seeing competition. And of course, the competition we are seeing now within the 
in the period of globalization or global capitalism is not just restricted to our national boundaries or borders, but it has become a kind of global competition because we are operating within a global village. So on the basis of that, we are seeing a, a kind of stiff competition, which is, of course, one of the doctrines of uh, uh, global capitalism. Then another one is the doctrine of profit motive. Capitalism is based on profit, can you see? All these inventions we are seeing is, is all aimed at any, any profit, can you see? Any profit at a reduced cost. And of course, the, 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 the drive to earn profit is also causing a lot of crisis within our societies in terms of most of the workers that have been retrenched, all in the name of earning profit, all in the name of bringing down the cost of production so that profit can, of course, increase. And if we take, for, for instance, most of the organizations that retrench, most of their workers, in fact, were, 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 were patronized by shareholders because their shares always jump up. So profit became a kind of motive. But of course, we need to also ask ourselves whether profit is all uh, 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 the reason why organization exists, uh, because basically uh, also organizations should also exist for the moral principles of creating job or creating a living for other individuals within society. So definitely those are also some of the dilemma, uh, dilemmas uh, that, uh, of course, uh, global capitalism has prompted up. And of course, we we'll come to the next one, which is, of course, the doctrine of scientific management. Right from the onset, capitalism has always emphasized scientific management of things. Of course, if you can reflect or remember uh, scientific Taylorism uh, 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 during the uh, Second Industrial Revolution, and of course, the famous work of uh, uh, person like Babbage and all the rest in terms of uh, using science in the field of management, all these are all capitalist-oriented doctrine that started from England and, of course, spread up to America and other parts of the world. So capitalism, one of the doctrines of global capitalism, of course, is scientific management, a scientific approach to doing things, which, of course, culminate in the introduction of the current high-power, sophisticated technological innovations. All right. We progress. So, in fact, to actually prove that capitalism is based on scientific uh, uh, innovation, we can actually see the statement of Queen, v uh, Queen Victoria of England almost in 17 something uh, when, he, when she visited an excursion uh, in England. He said, so, uh, June 7 to the exhibition went to the missionary part where we remain two hours and uh, which is excessively interesting and instructive and fill one with admiration of the greatness of minds, man's mind, which can carry out and devise some wonderful inventions, contributing to welfare and comfort of the whole world. We are capable of doing anything. Here indeed was the concrete evidence of what capitalism could do. Here we are displaying the means by which economic growth was being achieved. How production was expanding to increase the wealth of the nation. This was cited from Donaldson and Pauline uh, as far back as 1978, uh, 28. All right. Now, while we were talking about globalization, and of course, the incursion of uh, 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 capitalist globalization to society, including the socialist blocs. Then, in fact, uh, another person came, other authorities started coming with a warning of where capitalism is going to take us to. A very good person, or uh, one of the powerful authorities that gave their warning, which I consider as the soothsayer of the fourth industrial revolution, was, of course, uh, Jeremy Rifkin. As far back as 1995, Jeremy Rifkin painted a gloomy picture of the future of labor in his famous book, The End of War. And for one, that before the next century, mass labor in the marketplace may disappear in almost every advanced country across the globe. He further warned that the coming revolution will not only affect blue-collar workers, 
but white collar workers as well. All right. And of course, we we'll look at the earliest manifestation of Rifkin's uh, prediction. Around 1995, IBM eliminated 80,000 jobs due to the introduction of some high power technology. In the same year or in the same period, AT and T destroyed 80, 83,000 jobs. And of course, Nernes eliminated about 22,000 jobs. Why Kodak removed about 14,000 jobs? There seemed to be no end in sight in the introduction of new cohort of high-level automated technology into an extensive range of job circumstances. That is white collar, blue collar, and what other uh, kind of job. It was predicted that within a decade, not more than 12% of the labor force in USA will be working in the factory, right? Which will, which will be next decade. So the logics of techno globalization in the form of re-engineering and downsizing. In fact, the forward move towards introduction of sophisticated technology into the workplace brought about two powerful concepts within the uh, 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 global scenario or techno globalization arena, which is of course called the re-engineering and downsizing. And in fact, a very good re-engineering was a very good example, uh, that example is supposed to be there. A very good as, example of re-engineering was when IBM terminated the employment of 63,000 workers when the management decided to re-engineer the corporation in, the, in, the, in 1993. Another good example was when shares corporation uh, destroyed up to 50,000 jobs when they re-engineered. Also, Boeing eliminated 28,000 employees during their re-engineering. Digital equipment destroyed about 20,000 jobs during their 1994 re-engineering. Lockheed Martins retrenched about 15,000 job holders in 1995 as a result of their re-engineering. More than that, AT&T discarded 40,000 employees in the course of their re-engineering around January 1996. In other words, approximately 216,000 jobs were destroyed by many six corporations within a period of three years in the USA due to re-engineering. Of course, whatever name they may call it, all are based on the introduction of automation and new technological inventions into the workplace. And in fact, it is also playing out in South Africa. If you go to major banks, there are many bank branches have closed up. And I ask myself, what will happen to all the workers in most of these banks closing up today? You know, definitely most of those workers in the respective bank must have been pushed back to the labor market, which is quite painful. And many of them are family men in charge of family, taking care of family, both at schools, at universities, and of course, catering for other uh, responsibility. That is why I told you that capitalist profit motive does not mess anyone. Can you see? The, the, the interest is make profit, no matter what happened to human beings. And of course, if we make profit without caring for one another, definitely uh, a, 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 a gloomy picture of the future is imminent. All right. And of course, if according to Professor Slobert, uh, just to let you know, Professor Slobert was my supervisor during my PhD. He's now an emeritus professor uh, at uh, Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Uh, professor Slobert stated, he said, if retrenchment and re-engineering are viewed as processes with parallel results, the logical conclusion is that unemployment will dramatically increase during the next decades. The concept of the workerless world is receiving increasing attention in diverse application field. Indeed, the world return work is often considered to be the logical and result of the forces which have been set in motion and which are for all purposes not, not reversible in nature. Protesting voices have been raised, but conclusive evidence manned that the trickle down effect is indeed a trickle and not the required flaw, which is necessary to balance 
the forces at play in the equation. And of course, we move to the next one, which is where we are currently, which is the dawn of the fourth industrial revolution, where we are now presented with so many scary things and so many things changing at the speed of sound. In fact, while I am in Namibia relaxing on my uh, sabbatical, the dean of research in my institution visited uh, Namibia to present a paper uh, because he himself is a computer guru. And he was talking about internet of things before he was telling us about internet of things. Now he's talking about internet of everything. So a big confusion everywhere. Can you see? So he spoke about so many new things and we were saying, where are we heading to? Last year we were hearing something different. Now you seem to be exacerbating issues around this your drive of uh, fourth industrial revolution. And of course, uh, 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 they, 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 we heard about the fourth industrial revolution first from Suwa uh, at the uh, uh, economic forum uh, where he actually uh, stated, he said, we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work and relate to one another. In this case, scope and complexity the transformation will be unlike any humankind has experienced before. We do not yet know just how it will unfold, but one thing is clear, the response to it must be integrated and comprehensive, involving all stakeholders of the global polity, from the public and private sector to academia and civil society. That is according to uh, Shuwa in 2016. Uh, uh, professor, professor, uh, sorry uh, for interrupting you. It's very interesting what you're uh, uh, telling us right here. But you have uh, to, to, you know, uh, take into consideration those uh, ten minutes of presentation, please. Oh, okay, okay. Let me run. Let me round up now. Uh, I'm almost yes, there. A little bit <laughs> okay, faster. Me, thank you. Give me one minute to round up. Okay. So I uh, said, so is the high power new technological innovation in the current fault are, are leading to job destruction? Of course, the above question has polarized uh, uh, many experts. And of course, uh, Barack Obama lended his voice by saying the next wave of economic dislocation won't come from overseas. It will come from the relentless pace of automation that market that makes a lot of good middle class uh, job uh, obsolete. So the way forward and my conclusion, uh, uh, there, there, should, there, will be, there should be an urgent need to regulate technologies that destroy jobs uh, in terms of regulating it, uh, whichever way the government uh, will go about it in terms of trying to regulate it so that more people will not be on the street. And of course, there, there is a need for a global government policy and commitment towards job creation and of course, security of jobs. And of course, the third one is uh, there is a need to re-adopt the human relation approach of management in the global workplace, not just within nation, but uh, across uh, nation and internationally. And of course, the first one is global solidarity of workers is needed now. Of course, Kamas sounded, Kamas voice sounded louder today uh, that there should be a global solidarity of workers in order to also counteract the forces of uh, capitalism or the forces of the capitalists. And of course, organization and state welfare is now very, very paramount within the current dispensation. Thank you very much. Great, Professor, thank you. A great job, you've done a great job. You have to tell me, Thanks. you and Professor Bhaktivek, what do you do to be so happy and full of life at this hour? You have to tell me <laughs> once. <laughs> I, take my, I know. I take I my know. coffee. <laughs> I take my coffee. <laughs> Your coffee, yes, of course. Of to course. keep me alive. <laughs> Otherwise, oh. I will fall asleep by this hour. <laughs> uh, what hour is in your country, Professor? You say what? Uh, what hour is in your country right now? Yeah, it's almost the same time. I checked it uh, in Namibia. In the it's the okay. same time. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. And, but, but the other day we spoke when I was in South Africa, 
I thought there was a time different. I don't know what is happening, but uh, when I check my time, it says the same time with uh, Romania. So I said, okay. Oh, great, That's great. Romania. I didn't know that. That's yeah, great. Yeah. A few words about Thanks. Professor Upere. Um, professor Upere uh, is currently a professor in the Department of Industrial Psychology and uh, People Management at the University of Johannesburg. And he contributes with a strong theoretical approach in his research with most of his output centered on critiquing the impact of um, uh, capitalism in the post-Cold er War era, notably in the context of uh, emerging economies. His reviewers consider him to be uh, an established researcher in the field of people management and development, notably within the domain of globalization and in its impact on human resources management. He has authored three books, two book chapters, 37 conference uh, presentations, uh, and about uh, 230 journal articles in uh, VOS. Um, he was uh, the first National Researcher uh, Foundation a uh, rated researcher in the faculty of uh, business uh, at Cape Peninsula University of Technology and has received numerous um, research related awards in recognition of his research contribution uh, from uh, CPUT, UJ and Honor F and Iona College in the USA. His Google, Google Scholar citation is uh, 2.3 uh, uh, while his Google Scholar Index is uh, 25. He recently received a Life Achievement Award from Marquis Who's Who in the World Base in USA in recognition of contributions to, hi uh, to his field. And thank you once again, Professor. If uh, there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, questions for Professor uh, Wilfred, if anyone has a question. Well, no. I have a question, Professor Opere. Uh, if uh, you think that uh, the next step is towards some sort uh, of a platform capitalism in which uh, there will be no full-time jobs, but each activity will be somehow rerouted to some sort of uh, 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 part-time laborer, and uh, being competitive on, on such um, um, gig economy platforms will be somehow the future of uh, most of us, or perhaps all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that, definitely that is what it is going to be. Uh, in fact, gradually and gradually, most of the permanent jobs are being destroyed, one way or the other. And in fact, what we are seeing now is a situation of subcontractors. And in fact, uh, to a great extent, some universities have started adopting this approach or this pattern of work in their workplaces. For instance, in the uh, University of Namibia, I've seen so many lecturers that are working on contract basis and uh, the contract is renewable after five years, you know. So definitely those kind of uh, situation cannot actually guarantee job security for a good lecturer to concentrate on his academic work, because certainly uh, uh, you may spend the five years and after five years, they tell you your job is over. Then you move back again to the labor market. So that is actually where we are heading to. And it will definitely affect the global workers, you know, every human being that work. And in fact, it's unfortunate that majority of people work than those who are actually the capitalists, you know. So that is actually where the world is heading to. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rupert. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all uh, for uh, uh, all the presentations today. Uh, I have... Um, uh, a word uh, prepared here for closing ceremonies and um, dear ones thank you for staying with us until the end uh, this honors us and makes us even better uh, at uh, what we do and we hope that this day was uh, an interesting one uh, for you as well from which you left uh, with us uh, many new and useful things as possible 
Uh, this year's edition of the conference, as I said, uh, was uh, initiated with the idea of creating a hub of uh, interdisciplinary uh, knowledge and research from which we can build new partnerships and write projects and valuable scientific papers together. Don't forget that I'm here for you and your ideas and do not hesitate to contact me, as I told you. Uh, this year's scientific uh, papers of this edition of the Bar Conference will be published in uh, my journal, Ashra's uh, journal, based uh, on uh, um, your in individual submissions of your papers, if you want to, of course, on, uh, on our journal site. I will uh, be back to you with um, more information about this. And uh, regarding the ICESBA 2021 Procedia, this year it will be uh, in the form of a book of abstracts uh, published by our publisher, uh, um, Romania for Tomorrow Publishing House, our uh, academic publisher. Mm -hmm. And for this book of abstracts, uh, we need from you a short bio and a picture sent uh, to my email address or uh, on the conference address. And uh, this procedure probably will be uh, finished uh, in, um, I think, one month. And uh, after that, uh, we'll publish it on our conference site website. I remind you that uh, tomorrow will be the presentation of the scientific papers in sections per panels. Uh, logging started at 9.30 uh, East European time, our time, uh, for eventual verification uh, of the microphones as today, um, but the opening ceremonies will begin at 10 o'clock, our uh, time. Uh, we wish you uh, success uh, from now on, uh, on uh, all those uh, who will be with us, uh, you know, again tomorrow, and uh, will um, uh, honor us uh, with the presentations on panels also, and the links for panels are posted on our HSBA conference website and also were sent to you via uh, emails. Uh, remember that um, if you have problems logging tomorrow, I will not be here because I have some problems, but I sent on uh, the email. Um, the email address is uh, of the chairs for tomorrow if there are any problems for the participants. Uh, I wrote only those participants who who are uh, programmed for tomorrow. Uh, I will not uh, hold your attention anymore because this day has been a, a long one and I uh, suspect uh, an exhausting one for many of you. So um, uh, let's wish ourselves to be as many as today and maybe more closer, not only virtually in the future edition of, of this conference. Uh, we keep in touch and we wish you luck and fortune from uh, for your future projects. Don't forget us um, as your loyal partner and maybe next year uh, or in two years from now on, we will uh, make uh, an even larger event and also maybe more beautiful than this one. Uh, this was just the beginning for, for me and George. Um, we, we like to dream. Uh, thanks again uh, to all those involved in organizing this event, uh, because without you today, we uh, would have been poorer and more, <laughs> more lonely. Uh, but with you, we'll feel richer and more confident in the future. We wish you a wonderful day and a sunny weekend and uh, have um, winter holidays as you wish. Uh, have a wonderful day, my dear friends. And uh, if there is someone else uh, from uh, you who wants to address a few words now uh, he can speak free um i would like to thank you miss professor first of all you miss professor elena gurgu for um, for organizing this event i'm for not me. the only one i'm with george uh, but, uh, you were the one who collaborated directly with me and our institute and thank you very much for your